This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Soldiers Live. Written by Glenn Cook. And narrated by Mark Vitor. Chapter 60 Garhanis, Tobo, and the Varashk. The Howler certainly kept busy. He completed his first functional four passenger flying carpet two days after the soldiers marched westward. Garhanis seemed deserted though there were enough of us around to bloody a bunch of noses the morning the former tenant took a notion to steal his home back. Sleepy had a dozen carpets on order, from single-rider scouts to a monster she hoped would carry twenty soldiers. I do not know who she expected to fly them. Only Howler and Tobo, and possibly the Voroshk, had the power to manage the things— I insisted that we have a couple of modest-sized carpets first. Those should not take too long to make and would be the size most useful to us right away. And since I was in charge of the Left Behinds and the De Jagere strike, I got what I wanted. Well, I got the one carpet. Tobo had the flying post thing figured out, too. Both Shukrat and Arkana seemed eager to get along now. One or the other would allow Tobo to borrow her post when he wanted to run out to visit Sleepy, which he did by night so he would not be seen from the ground. I never felt comfortable when he did that. We had too many potentially unpleasant and unfriendly people back here in the manor, including a lot of hostages from the leading families of the region. Both Magadan and Gromoval were increasingly determined not to be won over, each for his own reasons. I told Magadan, I'd be tempted to send you two home just so I don't have to worry about what's going on behind my back. I was not worried, really. Tobo's supernatural friends saw everything. Magadan told me, I don't want to go home. Home no longer exists. I want to be free. Sure, Yuvarosh showed what you can do when you're free. I've spent my life killing people like you. That's people who believe it's their destiny to make slaves out of people like me. I'm in a war with another one of them right now. I'm not about to cut you loose and let you start making people's lives miserable, too. None of which was absolutely true, but it did sound good. And Magadan bought it. Some. The part that really was true. That I would kill him before I turned him loose on the world. That was the moment when he decided he might want to go home after all. From then on, he brought that possibility up each time we crossed paths. The hidden folk said he was sincere. He was trying to get the other kids to go along with swapping what knowledge they had for an escort back across the place of glittering stone. Lady did not believe it. She thought we should put him and Gromoval down because of the trouble they could cause. My sweetie has a very direct approach to problem-solving. Sometimes I do find what little conscience I retain a damnable handicap. Howler, though, did successfully work his way out of the top ten on my shit list. Tobo's appeal to Shivetya had resulted in word from the golem saying he did have the ability to intervene in Howler's screaming and shrinking problems. Shivetya did not have much of a reputation as a liar— so even Howler took him at his word, after which the smelly little wizard became extremely cooperative. Though we still had no cause to trust his long-run intentions, nor he any call to trust ours, either. Lady cornered Tobo. We have a dangerous situation here, and like a pet cobra it's going to bite us some day. We have to do something. The boy sounded puzzled. What are you talking about? Something about what? Those Varoshk. They aren't as strong or as bright as we first thought, but there are four of them and only one of you. But they're not going to... Pardon me for being an old cynic, I said. Magadan keeps telling me, in so many words, that he wants to be anywhere that isn't here with us, and there's at least the implication that he'll do whatever it takes if we don't help him go home. 
and Gromoval is going to be trouble eventually, because his personality requires it. If you go out to visit Sleepy, or just on a flying date, the rest of us are stuck here with no better hope than the Howler. And speaking of flying, Lady said, don't you ever go out with both of those girls again. Hush. You're only familiar with the women you've grown up around. I'm telling you right now that Arcana is exactly like Magadan, but she has one more weapon than he does, and she means to use it to cloud your mind. But Shukrat I'm not sure about. There's a chance Shukrat is exactly what she seems. I agreed. The kid was likable, and according to Tobo, the hidden folk agreed. They offered no reason not to trust her. Tobo was not used to arguing with anybody but his mother, even when he thought he was right. He did not want to think ill of Arcana, but would not fight us. Lady demanded, So how do we make sure of them? You have to think of something before we move against Dejagare. We'll be scattered, distracted, and extremely vulnerable then. And because you spend time with the girls, out amongst the rest of us, all four will know what's going on. They can plan accordingly. Again, Tobo did not get a word in before I said, I would be. Lady reminded him, You've never been a prisoner. Now there's a joke. I was born a prisoner. A prisoner of a prophecy by an old woman who died years before I was born. A prisoner of the expectations of all you people. Gods, I wish Hong Trey was wrong and I could have been a normal kid. There aren't any normal kids, Tobo, I told him. Just kids who fake it better than the rest of us do. And that name, Tobo, that was my baby name. Why does everybody still call me that? Why didn't we ever have a ceremony to give me a grown-up name? Nguyen Bao do that, and Tobo was years past the appropriate birthday. Lady told him, You'll have to take that up with Uncle Doge. Meantime, the other thing needs addressing right now. Blade is moving already. In three more days, Sleepy will curl back to the northeast, and it'll be too late to stop anything. I want to be sure that we don't get stabbed in the back just when things get exciting. An hour after we nagged him, Tobo asked Shukrat to go flying. He borrowed Arcana's log. Arcana was not pleased. When an hour later she told me Magadan had said he did not mind if she used his post to join Shukrat and Tobo, I told her, But I mind. If you need to talk to Tobo, do it when he gets back. Arkana was the brightest of the Varoshk. She recognized that things were tightening up. When Tobo did return, he stayed just long enough to round up Magadan. He took Magadan flying. It was the first time Magadan had been aloft since he had entered our keeping. He did not appear excited, which I would have expected. They returned within a half hour. Magadan's hand-me-downs, appropriated from Garhane's former occupants, were ragged. He looked like he had been in a fight, and the other guy had kicked his butt. A good long way. Tobo gave instructions for Magadan to be isolated then found Arcana and took her for a fly. The Ice Queen, I noted, had replaced her confiscated robes with native garb that served her to considerable visual advantage. Down, boy, Lady said. It's a good thing I didn't run into her before I met you, isn't it? That earned me a not entirely playful swat. Arcana came back looking rougher than Magadan had, and she was not smiling. Tobo had Arcana put in with Magadan. He collected Gromoval. Gromoval was not interested in going anywhere with Tobo. Tobo insisted. They were not gone long. Once they returned, Tobo had the Varashk returned to their quarters. He gathered their flying posts in the main hall. Lady and I joined him. I asked, What was that all about? I took them out and dueled with them, except for Shukrat. I stopped Lady before she explained, probably at great length, how unsmart doing that could have proven. Sometimes she could fuss as much as Sara. I said, I'm sure there was a reason. I wanted to find out just how much we really do have to fear from them. 
And? They're frauds. The only power they really have is what they draw from their post and their clothing. Without those, even Shukrat isn't as powerful as one eye was at the end. Gromoval is about Uncle Doge's equal. Lady, even as weak as you are right now, you could manage any of them but Shukrat. I snorted. I guess that would explain why Gromovol's pop was anxious to get the kids back. Were most of the Voroshk limited talents? Were most of them carried by a few strong members of the clan? I'd guess that's likely. The point, though, is that for right now, there's a better chance our Voroshk will attack us with knives than with sorcery. He looked at us, saw no obvious eagerness to embrace his theory. Don't you think that if they had any real power, they would have used it to try to escape? I realized that he was upset. He had believed he was making friends with the Voroshk. Our worries had led him to test that, and he had learned that his friends were not as close as he had hoped. You're telling us we don't have to kill them to be safe, Lady said. That, too. You have the unknown shadows at your command, and you didn't figure this out until today. Lady can find something to suspect in everything. I would suggest we retire and settle down somewhere where we do not have to worry all the time, but she would suspect me of ulterior motives. I've thought it for a long time, he admitted sullenly, but the hidden folk can't report things that they don't hear. The Varashk don't discuss their weaknesses, or much of anything else, actually. Because of their present situation, nobody likes anybody very much anymore. I said, I didn't want to kill them anyway. Maybe I'd like to thump Gromoval a little now and then, but... So that's settled. Heck, turn them loose if you want. Once they've had a dose of the real world, they'll come back. Meantime, let me get to work on these things. Lady asked, You finally found their secret. You can make more. I've learned how to change who they recognize as their master. None of the Varashk know how the posts are made. They're not even sure of the theory behind them. I know more than they do just because I've studied the things. I don't yet know how they pull their magical power, but I don't know how I do that either. Some day I will know, but it'll be a long, slow, dangerous process finding out. They're booby-trapped. I told him, Life is booby-trapped, kid. As we left the hallway, Lady was speculating on whether the original Varashk had invented their magics, or if they had just stolen them from an ingenious but unwary predecessor. I did not care, so long as no Varashk made my life more difficult than it already was. Chapter 61 The Taglian Territories Night Flyers in De Jagere. Three flying posts formed the Goose Flock formation. Tobo had the point, with Willow Swan riding pillion. Swan was in the throes of an apparently severe religious relapse, muttering a continuous polysyllabic one-word prayer. With his attitude toward heights, he would be bruising Tobo by hanging on so tight. His eyes would be closed so intently that he would have muscle cramps all the way back to his ankles. Lady and Shukrat flew the other posts. Lady had Aridatha Singh aboard behind her. Shukrat carried Uncle Doge. Mergen, Tai Day, and I shared the flying carpet with the Howler, whose shrieks were being contained inside a big glass bowl sort of thing Lady had put over his head. It worked well enough to save trouble with people who did not know we were coming. Mergen and Tai Day were along only because Sara had to be placated. She did not want her baby going into harm's way alone. People everywhere were irked because the boy's father and uncle had had to be flown back to Garhanis before the raid could be launched. But Sara had been stubborn and loud, and Sleepy had given in rather than lose a friend. Sara's recollections of and fears of De Jagere remained abiding and debilitating. I hoped Mergen and Tai Day handled it better, though at takeoff time Mergen had been sweaty, pallid, shaking, and appeared to be having trouble breathing, and Tai Day had seemed more self-engrossed than ever. 
I had spoken to each alone, and had tried telling each that I was counting on him to keep an eye on the other and carry him if the emotional strain became too much. I have found that assigning major external responsibilities like that can get many of my brothers through times of deep emotional stress. Howler kept the carpet in the pocket of the formation. We moved northward at a pace that created a cold wind strong enough to pull the tears out of my eyes. Mergen and I occupied the carpet's rear corners. I told him, I'd forgotten just how much I don't like this. Why didn't I send some of those eager young bucks from Sien? Because you're just like every other recent captain of the company. You've got to have your pointy nose right in the middle of things so you can make sure things get done your way. Up ahead, Tobo lifted the shutter on a red lantern. He winked the light several times. There was an answering signal from the ground, miles off our track and much farther forward than I expected. Blade and the cavalry had made good time, and were already in the ring of hills surrounding De Jagere. The moon would rise in an hour. It would provide the light they needed to filter through the hills and descend the inner slope. We passed over the rim and discovered the scattered lights of De Jagere. We slowed to a crawl. The flying posts gathered together. Aridatha tried to explain to Tobo where we needed to go. I told Mergen, You should have gone with Tobo. You know De Jagere better than anyone else. De Jagere twenty-five years ago, maybe. It's a whole new city since my day. Aridatha belongs with him. It's only been weeks since he was there. Few details could be distinguished by starlight, but as we moved closer, the walls and main buildings matched my recollections almost exactly. The logs formed up in a line astern, with Lady and Aridatha leading. Howler fell in behind. We resumed moving. Ten minutes later, we were on the ground. Five minutes after that, Aridatha hustled us into his brother's shop. Sugriva Singh seemed to be a shorter and older version of Aridatha. He had done well for himself. He had the whole downstairs of a building for his business and everything above for his family, none of whom were ever in evidence. Sugriva's past good fortune assured his deep displeasure at our invasion. All of a sudden he had ten villains in amongst the vegetables, and only his brother and the bountiful little blonde did not look willing to roast him for a prank. He had a great deal to lose here, and maybe more to lose if he did not cooperate. The Strangler cult was hated in the extreme in De Jagere. Just a whisper about his relationship to the living saint of the deceivers would destroy him and just about anyone who had ever spoken to him. Aridatha dispensed with introductions. Sugriva did not need to know his visitors. Chances were he recognized a few of us anyway. Aridatha told his brother, Our father is dead. He was murdered a few weeks ago, strangled. Sugriva was the elder by a decade. He remembered the Narayan Singh who had sold vegetables and doted on his children before the invasion of the Shadow Masters. He was stricken as Aridatha had not been stricken. And that should be no surprise, should it? Is that what you mean? Sugriva said through tears that might have been due as much to rage as to pain. He needed a few minutes to collect himself. To his credit, Sugriva Singh did not rail against the inevitable. He understood exactly how his arm was being twisted, and though events were not going to proceed quite like Aridatha had led him to expect during his previous visit, he chose to cooperate. He wanted to get it over as fast as he could. Then he would pray that the new administration would be as indifferent to him as he was to the one presently in place. Things were not exactly working out the way Aridatha had hoped they would, either. Sugriva said, You haven't chosen the best night to do this. The moon is going to expose anyone moving toward the city from outside. Tobo chuckled. You might be surprised. The night is our friend, Brother Sugriva. I rather expect you'll find that my father believed the same thing, young man. And his father's son? Sugriva had been unhappy, even angry when we turned up, 
but not really surprised. What kind of vegetable dealer was not surprised to be wakened in the night? Inside a city that closed its gates with fanatical devotion when the sun's lower limb touched the western hilltops. Could Aridatha's big brother be some sort of crook? Aridatha told his brother, The reason we're troubling you is that we don't know how the gatekeeping is managed. You told me before. I looked into it. There's a company of soldiers assigned to each gate. The West Gate is the most closely controlled because it sees more traffic than the other three put together. One of Dejagore's quirks was that most of today's roads to the city joined outside it, to the west, so there was not much traffic elsewhere. The North and South Gates were used only by people involved in agriculture and its produce. The East Gate looks like it should be the easiest to seize and control, Sugriva said. A true road did connect with the East Gate, but there was little out that way but a few distant villages. The guards are slackers at all levels. None of them are natives. None of them are old enough to remember the last time Jaikur was attacked. Sugriva had adopted the local accent and the local name for the city when he had assumed a Dejagarin name. The trouble with the East Gate was that Blade was west of Dejagore, but he was well ahead of schedule. There was time before sunrise, if he hustled. Tobo suggested, Lady, why don't you go tell Blade that it has to be the East Gate? Because I'm going to be getting dressed. Widowmaker and Life-Taker were coming to the party. They had been away for far too long. Half a minute later, Shukrat said, I guess it's time to find out if you can really trust me, Tobo. I jumped in before the boy could speak. I suppose so. Tell Blade not to waste time. We need as much of the night as we can get, and we won't stay unnoticed long once we start. Tell him we'll be waiting when he gets to the gate. A smile tickled Shukrat's freckled, almost pudgy face. She bounced up onto her toes and gave Tobo a peck on the cheek. Bold, bold behavior by any standard in this part of the world. They must do things differently among the Varoshk. She bounced away. Tobo was completely flustered. I grinned till Lady poked me in the ribs. Evidently I was enjoying the bouncing part a little too much. Mergen said, I suggest we get to work here, folks. I don't want to be inside these walls a minute longer than I have to. He was holding it together, but the strain was obvious. Tai Day was frazzled, too, and with even better reason. A lot of people very close to him had died here during the siege. No matter how tough a man pretends to be, such losses gnaw at his soul, unless he is not human at all. The man has a point, I said. Start getting ready. Lady and I had the most to do. We had a big show to put on. We retreated into a small, separate room, colder than the main shop. As we strove to turn ourselves into walking nightmares, I asked, Hun, have you really got that post-riding stuff figured out? It isn't that hard, except for staying on. Any idiot could do it. There are some little black rods and slidey things you move around. You go up or down, or faster or slower, or whatever, when you do. Why? It occurs to me that it might be better for us, and him both, if we got Aridatha back to Taglios. He's been gone a long time. Mogaba needs to have him back where he can show him off before news of tonight's business gets around. She did not stop donning the life-taker armor but did look at me in a way that I do not see often. It was like she was looking right through me, at all the secret places inside. It was frightening sometimes. All right, we'll have to move fast if I'm going to be aloft before daylight. Will the log make it that far? Not knowing how those things worked, I did not know what you might have to feed it, like a horse. The posts did seem to work on a different principle than Howler's flying carpets, which required a strong-willed, powerful sorcerer to drive them. They demanded his undivided attention every moment they were aloft. I'm sure it will. What do you want me to tell Mogaba? The long-time taunt 
my brother unforgiven, came to mind, along with all their days are numbered. But this was not the time. Chapter 62 De Jagere, The Occupation My original intention had been to make a huge show of our invasion. I do like a big ration of drama. Lightning, thunder, fireworks. But I waited until we had the gate open to let it start. Early on there were alarms from the south wall as a tide of darkness and whispers passed by, but no sentry saw a single horseman. They spied only vague shapes that stirred secret fears of things far darker and crueler than any conquering soldier. The city was restless and troubled, but remained unaware of our presence. It did sense approaching change. The thunder and lightning came after Blade's men started coming through the gate. Six hundred men in Sien's strange armor, under strict orders not to betray their humanity until the city was captured. Most De Jagarans were Guni. The Guni believed in demons who could take human shape to make war on men. And most of the people of the outlying Taglian territories had by now heard that the company was allied with ghosts and devils. Each soldier had a bamboo wand carrying a banner affixed to his back. The color of the banner declared the man's unit affiliation, while characters painted on the banner stated that unit's martial slogan. Widowmaker and Lifetaker rode at the head of the invading column. She carried a burning sword. Widowmaker carried One-Eye's spear, which was crawling with maggots of light. His shoulders bore a salt-and-pepper set of oversized ravens. And even so, much of the city slept on. Ugly worms of fire crawled over our hideous armor— Banner men marched ahead, flailing big flags supposed to be our personal ensigns. Witnesses brought out by the flash and boom and rattle of horseshoes remembered old stories and ran away weeping. Yet most of the city slept on. Doge, Mergen, Tai Dei, and Swan remained at the gate, holding the hostages we had taken there. Aridatha stayed out of sight at his brother's place. Howler, Tobo and Shukrat circled high above. Howler's glass bowl continued to contain his shrieks. We hoped he would remain a secret for a while. The real fireworks began when we reached the citadel, where the protector's still sleepy governor deluded himself into thinking he could refuse to surrender and make it stick. Fireballs flew. The citadel gate exploded. Holes appeared in its walls. People inside began to scream. Every dark place in the streets had something moving inside it. Hundreds of somethings, many of them vaguely familiar in those instants when anything could be clearly discerned. Those flooded in through the broken gate of the citadel. They weaseled through the holes in its walls. Life-taker and widow-maker followed moments later. The terrified inhabitants of the tower put up no fight at all, our sole injury was a broken arm suffered by a dimwit who tripped over his own big feet and rolled down a stair. Lady and I stood atop the citadel. The city below still was not fully aware that it had been conquered. I said, It hurt a lot less getting here tonight than it did last time. That was the night we made boo-boo, which was a real boo-boo, not funny. That was the night one eye made the enemy that stalked us for twenty years, too. We'll make new enemies this time. I have to go if I want to have any hope of getting Aridatha into Taglios unnoticed. I don't think you can tonight, not without flying so damned fast the wind rips the skin off your face. I'll see if Tobo can't help. It was difficult to kiss her goodbye. We still wore all the costume armor. Chapter 63 The Taglian Territories The Middle Army The Protector's reconnaissance troops had warned her that something unusual was taking shape. The warning confirmed her suspicions, 
Her non-human spies had been having almost no success keeping track of the enemy, which meant the enemy was taking pains to be less visible. Soulcatcher raised the state of alert and stepped up training. She redoubled her own personal preparations. When word of the disaster at De Jagere reached her, one lone rider managing to get through with the news, she had known for fourteen hours already that the company main force had left its westward track and had begun hustling up a line that would slice between her middle army and the newly orphaned force outside De Jagere. That would evaporate within days, she presumed. Many of those soldiers came out of the city itself, a disproportionate percentage of them officers, while the rest would now hear the call of the harvest much more loudly. What the hell had happened down there? The messenger had brought very few details, just word that the city had awakened to find itself occupied. The invaders had been swift and thorough. They seemed to have had outstanding intelligence. Heavy sorcery might have been involved. The next fight won't be so one-sided, she promised her officers. Next fight, they'll have to deal with me. Me like they haven't seen me in a long, long time. She was angry and awake and no longer handicapped by any shred of boredom. She was feeling more alive and filled with hatred and bitterness than she had for a generation. Within hours, her new mood had electrified those around her. Officers who failed to become equally electrified quickly suffered permanent replacement. Chapter 64 De Jagere The Orphaned Army After losing their base at De Jagere, the generals of the fading, confused army nearby ineptly tried to invest the city in a way that would not result in economic disaster. Then, six days after the fall, news came that the enemy main force was rushing straight toward them. There had been skirmishes with the cavalry occupying De Jagere. Those had not gone well for the locals. And now, ten times as many well-disciplined, perfectly armed, trained killers were about to fall on them. A third of the army went home under cover of darkness the night after the news arrived. Those who stayed endured almost continuous psychological torments by things they could never see. The murderous army from the south never materialized. That was never necessary. The De Jagaran soldiers in the Taglian force all deserted. The cavalrymen occupying De Jagere scattered the army's steadfast corps without outside help. Chapter 65 Taglios The Palace Mogaba's level of discomfort, he would not think the word fear, had risen substantially since Aridatha's return. The stakes kept rising, the risks kept expanding. Lady had been seen by palace servants. So far, those believed they had seen the protector, whose comings and goings were secretive and unpredictable but some day Soul Catcher might overhear some mention and know she could not have been two places at once. Nor would she believe the manifestation to have been one of the haunts now regularly seen in the maze of passageways for which the palace was famed. Mogaba told Gopal and Aridatha, I'm tempted to drop everything and run. Gopal asked, Yeah, where would you go? It might not be as personal but his doom was every bit as certain as Mogaba's was if the Black Company reconquered Taglios and restored the ruling family. Life would turn cruel for any Shadar who had belonged to the Greys. Exactly. Mogaba ran his palm over the top of his head. Keeping it shaved required less and less work. So I remind myself what honor demands. Aridatha said little. He had not talked much since his return. Mogaba understood. Singh had seen things he did not want to believe were true. He had learned things about the stakes that left him paralyzed with indecision. There appeared to be no road leading toward the light. Wherever he turned, he beheld another face of the darkness. 
it was important to Aridatha that he do what he perceived to be the right thing. Singh's visit with his brother had fueled him with a determination to offset some of the evil his father had done. Aridatha was guni by faith, but his character was much more suited to the Vedna religion. He thought this was the life where wrongs had to be made right. Mogaba said, The news from the south is uniformly disastrous. The black company is meeting very little resistance. They have superior sorcery, superior weaponry, superior troops, equipment, and leadership. Not to mention intelligence so good, we're wasting our time trying to keep anything secret. So it seems our fates actually depend on how fast those people can get here. The protector won't stop them. They'll pluck the strings of her ego, tickle her pride, and just when she thinks she's ready to make her kill, they'll hit her in the back of the head with a sledgehammer she'll never see coming. You have to be more than just powerful to deal with those people. You have to be more than clever and treacherous. You need to be psychic. Gopal asked, Then why don't we ride down there and take charge? He smirked. Not funny. Two reasons. First, she doesn't want me to. She still thinks we can get them into a pocket between us. I don't know how. And more importantly, if I got anywhere near her, there'd be no way I could hide my thoughts and no opportunity to put them into effect before she could protect herself. You too? You might be a little luckier. Gopal observed, The city is remarkably calm in spite of the news. Tidings of the fall of Dejagare were making the rounds, but hardly anyone seemed to feel that the protector was in any peril herself. There had been no disorders. Graffiti was becoming more common, though, Mostly the same old taunts, though Raja Dharma was becoming more common. Then there was a new one. You shall lie in the ashes ten thousand years, eating only wind. And one not seen for years had reappeared. T. Kim is coming. No one quite knew what that meant. Maybe not even its framers. Some people thought T. Kim might be a Nguyen Bao phrase in which case the name could mean something like walking murder. If it was not Nguyen Bao, it made even less sense, or no sense at all. Aridatha asked, If we do nothing to support her and she gets beaten, how do we defend ourselves? Mogaba said, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have a problem unless the protector wins. The company and the royals have no quarrel with you. You've done a good job running the city battalions. If you just sit on your hands, you'll probably end up inheriting my job. Aridatha shrugged. You must have talked about these things when she was here. Oh, yes. She said nobody would chase me very hard if I had sense enough to take off before they occupied the city. Gopal asked. They're that confident that they can discount your help. What about me? She's that confident, which is probably too confident. She didn't say anything about you. She didn't know who you were. She suggested that if you think you have reasons to fear the return of the royals, you should join me in looting as much treasures as you can before you run away. Shadar don't abandon their oaths of service. Aridatha, with little to fear from defeat, suggested, Let's just do our jobs, like we've always done, and see what opportunities fortune places in our hands. Sarcastically, Gopal responded, Of course, the Black Company and the Protector could end up destroying each other, like a couple of rams getting their horns locked. A consideration which left all three men thoughtful, with Mogaba in particular reflecting on how fate might write the joke that would end with that unexpected punchline. Chapter 66 The Taglian Territories Midway Between 
Oh, we looked good, ten thousand strong, all lined up as if for a parade. Every man wore his armor. Every man had his personal banner whipping in the breeze. Every battalion wore its own color of armor. Every weapon was perfectly honed and polished. Every horse was groomed and caparisoned as though for review. Every standard was in place and gloriously new. We were a general's wet dream, pretty and dangerous, too. The gang opposite us, though they outnumbered us three to one, looked like they would be no challenge. Men over there were still trying to find their assigned places in ranks. Good as it all looked, I had my doubts about the wisdom of offering battle. However confident our guys were, and however much confidence the men opposite us lacked. But Sleepy wanted to crush them fast, and Harry Soulcatcher back to Taglios, where, because she would be hard-pressed, she might not be wary enough to elude ambush by Mogaba and his henchmen. She was assuming too much would go our way. When things are going good is when you really have to watch your back. But I was not the captain. I could only advise then do my part in the show once a decision had been made. Tobo was more confident than Sleepy was. He believed the enemy only needed a nudge to crack. One vicious shock and they would collapse. He guaranteed it. Trumpets sounded the ready. Drums began to talk, counting the cadence for the advance. A thousand men would remain in reserve. Well, behind them were the recruits we had acquired— those surrounded the Radisha and her brother, nominally forming the Royal Lifeguard. They would be used only in desperation. The trumpets sounded the advance. The ranks stepped out, lines dressed, cadence perfect, weapons exactly on line. Positioned in front of the wings, Lifetaker and Widowmaker lit off in blinding flashes and began to advance themselves. But they halted before they entered missile range. From that closer vantage, I could see that Soulcatcher had formed her troops up in three successive forces, with a hundred yards of separation each between them. The front-line unit was the most numerous, but looked like the lowest quality. The second formation appeared much more solid. That was a device I understood, having used a variant myself. But you have to be confident that your real fighters will not catch the panic of the scrubs when they run away. There were things going on behind Soul Catcher's third line, but they were too far away to be made out clearly. Then the advancing soldiers made seeing much more difficult. Then the next stage of enchantments surrounded me, concealing me from enemy eyes, making it impossible for me to see anything either. Chapter 67 The Taglian Territories Inside the Middle Army this is going to be tricky, Soul Catcher reminded staff officers compelled to take her genius on trust. Her previous demonstration during the Kialune Wars had come before their time. The enemy trumpets sounded the ready. His drums began to rumble. Soul Catcher said, Once they sound the advance, they'll be too busy to spy on us. The advance sounded. I want the word spread on the second line that the collapse of the first line is part of my plan. Tell them it's a deliberate ruse. I don't want anybody running because the first line does. Tell them that anybody who does run is guaranteed worm food. Then tell the third line the same thing about the first and second lines. I want them to believe I'm luring the enemy in where I can use sorcery to destroy them. And I want the reserves backed off to the edge of the wood. Right away. But that means... Forget the camp. If we don't win this fight, the camp won't matter. I want the reserves spread out along the edge of the woods so they can collect up men who run away and get them organized. But before they do that, I want them in here to move my guests back to the north bank of the creek. Blank looks stared her way. Anger began to creep into her voice. Anger they knew to be the sort that soon saw corpses arriving on the cemetery ground outside camp. When Soulcatcher was angry enough, she would not let the goonie burn and thus purify the bodies of those she had slain. 
Form them at the edge of the woods, ready to kill any cowards. Then, in a calm, almost beatific voice, she added, If the soldiers fail to rally and throw back the enemy, their generals won't long survive defeat. Soulcatcher had very strong feelings about how this engagement should proceed. In fact, the wise general will make plans not to outlive his standard-bearer. His passing will be much less painful that way. She had been preparing for days, but she was compelled to fight with flawed weapons. The most rigid control had to be exercised. Get busy! She stepped past the officers, left the tent, climbed up a reviewing stand that would let her see the action. As she took her place there, the enemy, with the precision of a drill team, collided with her forward deployment. The slaughter was slighter than she had anticipated. The enemy seemed content to shatter opposing formations. They did not pursue. They halted, removed wounded, dressed their ranks, and repaired their equipment, and took their time doing it which pleased the protector. That meant more time for the beaten companies to collect themselves at the edge of the wood. Soulcatcher glanced back as men carried her prisoners' cages out of her tent. Goblin, his eyes regenerated already, offered her a little mocking salute. The girl looked straight at her and smiled. One more time and she would throw the brat to the soldiers for a few hours. That would take the sass out of her. The soldiers managing the removal seemed calm enough, despite the terrified fugitives beginning to enter the camp. Soulcatcher was irritated at herself for having overlooked the chance that the fugitives might not flee all the way to the woods. She should have had the palisade demolished. No matter, only a few would take refuge here. She gave orders to seal the gates. The enemy resumed his advance. The second line gave a better account of itself, but the outcome was identical. The troops broke without doing much real damage to the foe. This time none of the fleeing soldiers got into the camp. Once again the enemy stopped to handle his wounded and dress his lines and repair his armor. The cavalry screening the enemy flanks were having trouble holding back. Soulcatcher guessed that discipline would crack once the third Taglian line fell apart. Those idiots had better be ready back at the wood. Soulcatcher left her vantage as the enemy sounded the advance again. Very businesslike, this new captain, but how well does she think on her feet? Very businesslike, Soulcatcher's personal removal to the wood, where she growled new orders at her officers before she retired to the big tent she had had prepared as a pretended forest getaway and as a place where she could meet messengers from the allies who were trying to butcher her now. Goblin and the Daughter of Night had been deposited there. Both prisoners seemed amused by her arrival, as though they had shared some particularly hysterical joke entirely at her expense just a moment before she appeared. Soulcatcher paid them no attention. She was much more concerned about how troubled her sister would have grown because of the absence of sorcery on the battlefield, if no one became too suspicious for another fifteen minutes. Chapter 68 The Taglian Territories Fire on the Middle Ground Behind the brilliant fog of light masking Widowmaker, I climbed down off my horse then clambered onto the Varoshk flying post I would share with my former understudy, Mergen. The post had Magadan's name painted on it in his native script. Over on the left, Life Taker too was preparing to soar with that noted devotee of high flying, Willow Swan. All of the flying logs were ready to go up, each surrounded by an absurd wicker and bamboo framework carrying numerous makeshift attachments. Somewhere back where I could not see them, Tobo and Howler were getting ready to take up a flying carpet creaking under the weight of warlike unpleasantries. The screaming wizard was still muttering under his breath because he had been forced to reveal his flying secrets to Tobo. A huge volume of raw nastiness would be taken aloft, 
to be launched either when Soul Catcher betrayed her location or our attack began to bog down. The latter did not happen. The evaporation of the Taglian front line was a daydream come true. The second line lasted only a little while longer. The third line, evidently comprised of the best and most motivated of the Protector's troops, was more stubborn. Having spent too much time too close to Soul Catcher myself, I could imagine why the third force might have had a little extra motivation. Soul Catcher was not a thoughtful, forgiving commander. Give her her due, though. She would not expect love or forgiveness from anyone superior to her, either. In the world where she had come of age, that had been the norm. That world of the domination had demanded ruthlessness and cruelty. It had forgiven neither kindness nor compassion. The third line's stubbornness failed to withstand the precision and confidence of our men. Faint hearts began to slip away and run toward that distant tree line, where somebody appeared to be rallying survivors. The rout had only just begun when a dome of cardinal light popped into existence in an instant, straight ahead. It faded in seconds. I was making a clumsy effort to gain altitude when a second dome of light, this time carmine, appeared and faded to my left. There were a half dozen more flashes, each in the family of reds, before I felt confident that I was high enough and dared to divert attention from the post's controls long enough to see what Mergen had been babbling about throughout our climb. The sorcery in progress appeared to have turned the earth a uniform black. Upon that surface something kept painting red flowers that spread from a pinpoint in an eye's blink, almost black at the center but fading to flame yellow as the circle ended its expansion at perhaps twelve yards in diameter. From on high, nothing but the sudden red chrysanthemums, blooming randomly, were readily visible. The earth looked like some bleak game board upon which a garden of death flowers continued to bloom and gradually fade. Whatever was happening, it was passive, not coming to us. The sorcery had been in place already and was being tripped by our advancing soldiers, who were not getting off lightly. Soul Catcher did not make herself evident anywhere. Way off to my left, Lady and Willow vanished behind smoke as all the bamboo fireball launchers attached to their post sprayed the Taglian camp. Dozens of fires broke out down there, but the red circles kept blooming amongst our soldiers. I pushed my post forward half a mile. I told Mergen, Saturate the wood. She's in there somewhere. Where the hell are my crows? They're never around when I need them. They had disappeared during my climb to altitude. Maybe they did not like getting too far from the surface of the earth. There was no sign of the unknown shadows anywhere. But I did not expect to see signs. Tobo had sent most of the hidden folk away last night for their own safety. You notice strange things in times of stress. I remarked the absence of crows around the battlefield a rather bizarre lacking which I had not witnessed before, ever. But vultures had begun to circle above the wood. Mergen shouted something about the enemy taking heart from our misfortune. I said, Put the fireballs along the tree line, then, which was really my task since I had to point the Varosh post where I wanted the fireballs to go. Child Sukrat, better schooled in the use of the post, swept in from the east, low, laying her fire down upon the Taglian line. She wasted hardly a fireball. Our ground advance halted. Sleepy did not withdraw, but neither was she willing to face any more killing sorcery. I would not see how bad that had been until I was back on the ground, which was soon enough, because once we exhausted our fireball supply, there was nothing more Mergen and I could do from above. I had no trouble imagining Soul Catcher over there in those woods, laughing her leathers off at how she had hurt us. The Taglians launched one uncoordinated, inept counterattack, which turned disastrous when they began to run away again. Soul Catcher's sorceries did not distinguish between friend and foe, only between directions of travel. 
We grounded well to the rear. I remounted my horse and went forward. Soul Catcher's sorcery had been terrible. The site where each flower of light had bloomed remained defined as a red so dark it verged on black. The black itself was fading from around the circles, trampled grass gradually becoming visible like winter wheat sprouting. But weirder crops appeared within the circles. Men, sunken into the earth, some only ankle-deep, some up to their hips and more, frozen in the advance, still in their lines, all suits of armor no longer tenanted by even a ghost of life. Somebody had tried opening several suits. Inside there was nothing but charred flesh and bone. A quick calculation suggested we might have lost four or five hundred men to this horror, which had taken place almost faster than it can be told. There's something wrong here, I said. Soul Catcher has stopped. What? Mergen asked. He was probing a deadly circle. He discovered that it was cool now, and the visible surface was no thicker than a fingernail. What's that? Later, when we collected the dead, we learned that they had not sunk into the earth. The apparently sunken portion was not there when we dug out around them. Possibly they had melted. Soul Catcher stopped playing with us. She had to be controlling those circles somehow. Otherwise, they would have killed her own soldiers the first time they retreated. But that isn't working anymore. What's changed? What's happened? Suddenly, the vultures above the wood all spiraled down rapidly, as though planning to attack something. I said, Let's see what Sleepy is up to. Sleepy was sending scouts to explore the limits of the danger. So far, no death flower had bloomed on our far flanks. The vultures stopped their descent just above the treetops, but continued to look more like raptors than carrion birds. One suffered an impulse to descend a little farther. A golden-brown, urine-colored strand darted up like a gigantic toad's tongue. A splatter of light surrounded the bird. It seemed to become a black cutout of a vulture. The cutout shattered into a hundred fragments. Those fluttered down like falling leaves. The remaining vultures chose to take their business elsewhere. Nobody but me seemed to notice what was happening. Where were my damned ravens? I could send them to see what was happening while keeping my own sweet ass high and dry. What was the point of taking on a mythic character if I did not get to do mythic kinds of things? Moments later, Tobo and Howler were above the woods, dropping prosaic firebombs on the Taglian forces. Lady joined us before sleepy scouts had found out if we could safely slide around the ends of the killing zone. She had a map she presented to the captain. One glimpse told me my sweetie had not wasted her time aloft. She had charted the deadly circles, and a pattern was apparent. The positions of those not yet tripped were evident— Unless Soul Catcher had been aware of our airborne capacity, then the death circles would be there solely to herd us into something far more gruesome and cruel. Sleepy summoned her battalion commanders immediately. Chapter 69 Midway Between The Unanticipated Soul Catcher's soldiers fought stubbornly for a while along the edge of the wood, but had been too badly mauled already to last long under determined attack by our professional bloodletters. Most of the Taglians had no desire to see their wives and children lose their husbands and fathers. Sleepy gave orders to let anyone who abandoned his weapons go. Any Taglian economy inherited by the Prabrindra Dra would be better off if it was not crippled by a great slaughter of the Empire's young men. It was only now recovering from the horrible losses suffered during the Shadow Master and Kialune Wars. It wasn't anywhere near as eloquent a victory as I'd hoped, but I'll take it, Sleepy said. Despite our casualties, this war may have been won today. That earned her a lot of bewildered or disbelieving looks. Soul Catcher was still out there, in a really foul temper now. 
more unpleasant surprises could be expected. But if we keep after her, she'll be distracted when she reaches Taglios. Mogaba's plans were a long shot. I said so. And whatever sweet nothings his conscience whispered to him a couple months back, he'll be a lot more worried about saving Mogaba's skin once he has old enemies pounding on his door for real. Sleepy started to say something about Aridatha Singh, but thought better of it. A carmine flash appeared on the killing ground. Using Lady's chart, Tobo had triggered a booby trap by bombarding it from the howler's flying carpet. Sleepy told Run Must Sing, After Tobo's done, I want you to march some prisoners back and forth through there. I don't want any of those things left active. Some kid might wander in there and get himself killed, like the countryside was swarming with stupid children. I said, I'd be more pleased if we could grab a few of those things for our own use. If Mogaba had something like that, he might stand a chance of killing Soul Catcher. Lady ruined the fun. She'd smell it out. She created those things. They'll be safeguards so they can't be thrown back at her. A whole lot of shouting started in the woods. Tobo and Shukrat darted that way in case the soldiers needed help. Moments later, Howler's carpet streaked back our way. Tobo did not bother to dismount. He just announced, They found the daughter of night. She's in a cage. Soulcatcher ran off and left her. Lady and I exchanged looks. That seemed completely unlikely, unless the girl was bait in a truly deadly trap, which might be. Soulcatcher had sown the field of death that had consumed our soldiers without the unknown shadows noticing her doing it. Chapter 70 Midway Between The Capture the cage was inside a halfway collapsed tent. Several fireballs had ripped through the fabric but had failed to set it afire. I told everyone, be extremely careful here. If there was ever a time when Soul Catcher would try to spring something on us, this would be it. Sleepy had her henchmen push curious soldiers back. We were already closer to the tent than Lady liked though that had as much to do with who we expected to meet here as it had to do with concern about sorceress deadfalls. Nobody had yet been able to sense anything active in that line. Lady told Tobo, Go over everything three more times, then check it again. Howler, you go over it too. Of no one in particular, she asked, Where's Goblin? When she got no answer, she turned on the men who had found the tent, all of whom were in perfect health, despite having taken time to scrounge souvenirs before they reported their find. Where's the little man? The one who got away at Nija? Shrugs. They might not know what she was talking about, but one brave soul did say, There's another cage under there. It's tipped over and broken. Maybe he got away. Lady and I exchanged glances. Why would Goblin leave without the girl? He would not. Tobo called out. There's no danger here. Howler tried to concur, but his voice gurgled off into a scream. I said, Something definitely ain't right. Tobo, send your unseen pals out to scout around. We especially need to know where Goblin and Soulcatcher are. As soon as we can. We have to keep after them. Sleepy nodded, irritated agreement. Lady and I approached the tent, warily. Booby traps come in many forms. As we had been warned, one broken cage was empty. The other lay on its side, door downward. One fine-looking woman lay sort of splattered all over inside, wearing not a stitch. Lady stunned me by starting to rush forward, saying something about her poor baby. I caught her arm. Easy. The body looked to me like it had been posed. It would excite Soul Catcher's sense of humor for decades if she could get us to jump to our deaths over a child who had no more feeling for us than she did for the horses, cattle, and whatnot that passed through her life. Lady paused but would not remain patient long. 
What? That isn't boo-boo, I don't think. But that naked flesh could not be an illusion, could it? Goblin used to do that sort of thing, but Tobo said nothing magical was going on. I squatted, groaning as my knees creaked, reached through the bars and pulled dark hair away from the woman's neck, which it had concealed. I pulled Lady down beside me. Her knees popped as badly as mine had. Look there. I do pretty good work, don't I? You can hardly see the scars. I exaggerated. The scarring was ugly, but not all that ugly for somebody who had had her head sewn back on. Check the foot. Which foot got hurt? The right one, wasn't it? I uncovered the woman's right foot. The injury done by Goblin's booby trap and Soul Catcher's own crude self-repairs were immediately obvious. I hate her even more than I used to, Lady said. Except for that heel and her scars, she's still looking just as sleek as she did on her nineteenth birthday. What's wrong with her? I said, I can't tell from here, but I'm not getting any closer till I know it's safe. Where did Tobo and Howler go? Get them back here. This remained a potentially explosive situation, even if no sorcery was active. Soul Catcher would be in a foul temper when she regained consciousness. Lady mused. The child must have a low opinion of our intelligence if she thought this would fool us. I wondered. Maybe we just showed up before the trap could be fully prepared. When Tobo returned, he told us, Cat Sith just spotted Soul Catcher at the north edge of the woods. She has Goblin on a leash. She's rallied some soldiers and has them building earthworks. He became increasingly distracted as he stared at my sister-in-law. Now, was that not an interesting set of developments? Sleepy blurted, The Daughter of Night is pretending that she's the protector. Tobo almost reeled back when he realized that he was lusting after a woman five hundred years his senior. Lady, always an advocate for swift and decisive action when she had been in command, insisted, We need to press her, whoever's in charge. Every second she gets to pull things together will mean more casualties and difficulties for us later. Sleepy did not disagree. It was hard to argue with the truth, she went off to restore order and resume the advance. It was weird that the Taglians, already broken twice and neither well-trained nor motivated, would be rallying. But Tobo insisted that they were doing so, and he was not subject to fantasies of that sort. It seemed unlikely that the Taglians would be well-armed. Most of the Taglian soldiers had thrown down their weapons the first time they fled. Lady gripped my hand for a moment. Think we'll ever really get to see her. You begin to wonder if she's any closer or any more real than Cadavar, don't you? Willow Swan came bounding up. Is it true? Have we caught Soul Catcher again? News spreads fast, I said. Yes, that's her, I'm pretty sure. You're welcome to join me while I examine her, to make sure... He had gotten closer to her than I ever had as her one-time physician and surgeon. He would have a better chance of spotting physical evidence that this was one of Soul Catcher's elaborate tricks, if he remembered anything at all after five years away. I did not believe this was a trick. There was something badly wrong with my honey's little sister. I felt that before I got my close-up look. Swan examined and grumbled, he had no happy recollections of the way Soul Catcher had used him way back when, but he was not driven by any particular hatred of her, either. Sleepy said, You keep what this woman did to you firmly in mind, Willow Swan. I don't want to see it happen again, and if I do get a whiff, you can count on getting kneecapped before you score. Swan wanted to rage and protest that there was no damned way that witch was going to get inside his head again. But he did not. He was only flesh, and he recognized that that flesh was incapable of rational thought around any female who shared Soul Catcher's family blood. His record spoke for itself. 
Then why don't we just kill her? He asked. Wounded pride burned through his cool. Right here, right now, while we've got the best chance we'll ever get. End it all forever. We won't because we don't know what Goblin and Boo Boo did to her. I snapped when Lady seemed strangely reluctant to disappoint a fellow whose passion had fixed upon her originally. She would not be developing a sense of compassion at this late date, would she? Or of family? She and her sister were one another's oldest surviving enemies. Soulcatcher won't help us more than she absolutely has to, but she will help for a while. Lady nodded. Her sister was insane, but her insanity was pragmatic. Sister Soulcatcher showed no signs of recovering. I did not say so, but my outburst was part whistling past the graveyard. I was increasingly certain that there was something gravely wrong with Soulcatcher. I feared she might be dying. This was the thing that had claimed Sedvod, and nobody else saw it. The others were all too excited by the prospect of having her at our mercy. Chapter 71 Midway Between Unpleasant Truth Getting Soulcatcher awake and aware enough to understand and begin suffering because of her circumstances preoccupied Lady and Swan for some time. Mergen and Tai Day, Sara and Uncle Doge joined them. In time, they meant to strong-arm Soulcatcher into assisting us, but first they wanted to fatten up on a feast of gloating. Soulcatcher did not cooperate. She remained steadfastly unaware exactly the way Sedvod had done. The racket of skirmishing rose and fell in the distance, never becoming intense. Our guys did not sound much more ambitious than were our enemies. I did not blame them for a disinclination to get killed when the battle's outcome had been determined already. Riverwalker jogged into sight. The captain's compliments, and could you all come up and help her? She has a situation... She'd like some advice. I'll be damned, I said, just when you think you've seen everything. What kind of situation? Mergen asked. He was not distracted by Soul Catcher. He understood that when the word situation was used this way, it meant that his son was about to be asked to jump into something particularly hot. We're having trouble coming to grips with what's left of the enemy. I suggested... Why not just leave them the hell alone now? They're on the run. Riverwalker ignored me. At about a hundred yards, the soldiers start losing interest. The few who do manage to go on and get within fifty yards say they find themselves thinking how awful they are for interfering with her and that they really ought to be helping her fulfill her holy destiny. Her not being defined, but they assume they're thinking about the protector because the protector is the devil they know, and the devil they thought they were supposed to be chasing. Lady waved me closer. She murmured, I'll handle this end. Take the carpet and posts up and bombard the Taglian command from outside spell range. We're almost out of fireballs again. So drop rocks, or burning brush, or anything else that will make her concentrate on staying out of the way. Every time she moves, a few more of her troops will drift outside the spell, whereupon they'll suddenly get smart and run away. Her confident prescription suggested that this was an effect she knew of old. I told everyone, First thing we do is load up on arrows. We'll just drop them from higher than she can reach. From five hundred feet up, they ought to be good and deadly. My gut knotted. I was talking about bombarding my own flesh and blood. But part of me was certain that the girl would avoid personal damage, and part believed that a confrontation had been inherent in the situation from the moment Narayan Singh had snatched our baby from Lady's arms. It did work. The girl, wearing her aunt's costume, darted around, followed by Goblin. The last few fireballs and firebombs got spent, their infallible lack of accuracy refreshed my cynical view of our chances of catching a break. The pair tried to fight back. 
Whenever a flyer descended below a certain level, a string of urine-colored lights flung upward. But I kept them too busy skipping out of harm's way to concentrate on their marksmanship. I could not tell which was the source of the deadly light. I noted that the girl seemed unaware that the guy overhead in the ugly suit was her doting papa. Our soldiers grasped the situation quickly and seized those opportunities offered by the shifting perimeter around the Taglian forces. The Daughter of Night was no soldier, but she was quick and decisive and did have a source of advice in a man who had spent more than a century soldiering. Goblin told her to attack, to get what use she could out of the troops she held in thrall. She did attack, straight toward Sleepy, ignoring the missiles falling around her. Our people had no choice but to run from her while trying to weaken her from extreme rage. Anybody who got too close underwent a sudden change of heart and took up arms on behalf of the deceiver Messiah without understanding what was happening. Because she was indifferent to how many of her helpers perished, Boo Boo was able to chase around everywhere, breaking up everything before it got organized, gaining a recruit for each two or three men she lost, making it emotionally ever more difficult for our archers to hurl missiles at soldiers who had been comrades not that long before. The girl even came near recapturing Soul Catcher. Then Tobo screwed up. He assumed that his strength, combined with that of the Howler, would be enough to overpower an untrained girl if they came at her suddenly from an unexpected direction. And maybe he was right. But he forgot that her companion was not the goblin he had grown up around. This goblin was infected with wicked godhood. That urine-colored light caught the flying carpet a glancing blow just before the Howler and Tobo cut loose with the best they had. A chunk of carpet turned into fluttering black scraps. Howler and Tobo and the rest of the carpet hurtled ahead, safe from spells, but not from a brutal beating by the branches of the trees into which they plunged. The Howler got off a couple of heartfelt shrieks. The urine-colored bar of light did the magical equivalent of jostling the mystical elbows of the young sorcerer and the ancient one alike. Their spells did a lot of damage to Boo Boo's defenders. They even managed to stun their intended targets. But because the spellcasters were bouncing around in the branches in the woods instead of reporting in, the rest of us never got a chance to take advantage. Chapter 72 Midway Between The Rescuers We had a standoff of sorts. We could not get at Goblin and the Daughter of Night when they were most vulnerable. Their thugs did not know that we had lost our most potent weapons, at least for a time. My ravens, who had returned conveniently only when it was time for them to become Tobo's mouthpieces, informed me that Howler and Tobo had survived, but were hurt. They were hidden in the woods, a few dozen yards from where the Daughter of Night and Goblin, barely recovered enough to keep breathing, were hunkered down. I tried to let Sleepy know quietly, but Sara was too alert. In moments she worked herself into a state that even Mergen could not soften. "'You've got to do something!' she shrieked. "'The Daughter of Night will hear you,' Mergen growled. You've got to get him out of there. Be quiet. I agreed. Somebody had to do something. That somebody might be me. But the only useful help I had was my two raven assistants. They alternately reported Tobo unconscious or quietly delirious. They could not get reliable orders from him. They refused to let me use them to transmit orders to the other unknown shadows— those were gathering in numbers such that it was impossible not to catch glimpses of them when you turned or moved suddenly. We can't get close to him, Mergen told Sara. He shook her. She was not listening. If she listened, she would have to hear uncomfortable truths. Shukrat stepped forward. She told us, I can bring him out. Sara shut up. Even Sleepy stopped pulling the remains of our army back together and offered her attention for a moment. I'll need my own clothing back, Shukrat told us. Her accent was slight. 
The enchantment won't touch me if I'm protected by my own clothing. Her use of Taglian had become conversational. Sara's hysteria faded immediately. I will never understand that woman. I would have bet on it getting worse. The rest of us exchanged glances. We could not survive without Tobo. Not in this world. Not with our enemies. We had to get him out of there before the Daughter of Night discovered the opportunity that fortune had thrown down at her feet. Shukrat said, You've got to trust me sometime. This might be a good time to take a chance. Maybe she was not as dumb as she put on. Tobo trusted her. I looked over her head to where Sleepy had resumed expostulating angrily with Iqbal Singh and an officer in badly dented Sien-style armor. She had heard. She waved a hand and nodded to indicate that the decision was up to me. I knew the Varoshk kids better than she did. All right, I told Shukrat, but I go with you. How? I'll put on Gromovols. She was more amused than alarmed, though she was troubled. She was very worried about Tobo. Because I have this obsessional thing about loyalties and brotherhood and keeping faith with the past, I sometimes have trouble believing that other people respond as flexibly to their situation as they do. I could not have made my peace with such a dramatic shift in circumstances as easily as Shukrat had. I said, That won't work, eh? No, the clothing is created specially for each of us, individually. She had only that slight accent, no greater than my own, but she did not yet possess a large vocabulary. Her speech was simpler than it might have been. Though it can be adjusted by a tailor of sufficient skill, the skill takes twenty years to learn, though. All right, where's that stuff stashed? In Tobo's wagon. The kid had so much junk he needed his own wagon and teamsters to haul it around. The wagon contained things as diverse as marbles and miracles. He had been indulged all his life and would not leave anything behind. Let's go. I hoped he had not left any protective spells where they would keep us from getting at the tools we needed to save his scruffy young butt. Chapter 73 Midway Between The Rescue Fully attired in her family uniform, Shukrat seemed a lot more formidable than the cute little freckle face who hung around with Tobo. Her apparel seemed to be alive, seemed excited to have rejoined her. The black cloth kept stirring around her, restlessly. She resembled an unknown shadow who had chosen to let itself be seen. Her blue eyes sparkled. I suspected she might be having fun. I told her, Tobo's dad and I will come along as far as we can, although she did not seem to need reassurance. She did understand that having Mergen along meant Tai Day would be there too and Tai Day did not trust her at all. Our sometimes odd personal entanglements did not interest Shukrat, not that she would ever talk about them with an old fart like me. Shukrat forgot that she was wearing that same outfit the day she fell into our hands, when she was not alone. She forgot that she was not invincible. Sorcerers never lack for self-confidence, especially young sorcerers. Those whose self-confidence is justified live to become old sorcerers. A platoon of elite fighters would creep along behind us, far enough back not to irritate Shukrat's pride, but close enough to salvage her cute little behind if her confidence was not completely justified. For Tobo's sake, I would try to make sure she became an older sorceress by at least one more day. Mergen scrounged up fireball projectors for himself and Tai Day. Uncle Doge scrounged up himself and Ashwand and invited himself into the game. He might be older than dirt, but he was still spryer than me. He and his disciples stole through the battered wood in silence so total I wondered if my hearing was going. My old bones were less cooperative, so I ended up as rear guard. Today, my whole body insisted on reminding me that I had been critically wounded not all that long ago, although it did that almost every day. I wore my Widowmaker armor, though the Sien reproduction was quieter than the metal original that Soulcatcher made, 
I still seemed to be all clang and clatter. I took one eye spear along, against Lady's advice. Shukrat's flying post trailed behind her. My ravens rode it, one offering directions, the other poised to carry news or unexpected holiday greetings to the rear. It would be a holiday somewhere in the world, and fate offered me a glimpse of Goblin in the distance, evidently passed out, much as he had done after proffering the holiday excuse for being drunk half a lifetime ago. I hefted the black spear. I glimpsed the girl, too. She was moving, but doing it like a drunk on the brink of passing out. I recalled another time, long ago, when a brother named Raven and I ambushed a sorceress called Whisper on Soul Catcher's behalf. Circles of Fortune. The madwoman had been our employer at the time. Now she worked for us, or would be given the opportunity to work for us if I could keep her alive. That might be a tough assignment. Seeing the girl and my old friend hurt, I wished I had a weapon I could use to end this here, now. One eye's spear seemed to turn in my hand. I pointed out the view to Mergen and Taide. I breathed on the way out, after we have Tobo and Howler. I indicated their bamboo poles. Mergen worked to keep a blank face. Taide did not have to work. Tai Day did not come equipped with facial expressions, so far as I could tell. Uncle Doge nodded. Uncle Doge was old friends with unpleasant necessity. I told Mergen, I'll do it if you can't. Sometimes you have to build a wall around your heart. A few steps onward we encountered the emotional phenomenon the soldiers had reported. But with the girl stunned, it did not overcome reason. I just had to concentrate on not giving myself up to love for the daughter of night. I did wonder how much worse it had been when she was in control of all her faculties. We reached Tobo without incident. Howler lay not ten feet away, miraculously silent. The gods do play amazing games. I examined Tobo before I let anyone move him. His pulse was strong and regular, but he was covered with cuts and abrasions and had suffered a lot of broken bones. He was not going to be much use to anybody for a long time. Shukrat whispered, He would have been fine if he had been wearing this, she indicated her apparel. That seemed spell-proof, too. As promised, she was suffering none of the effects of the Daughter of Night's emanations. It was a struggle for the rest of us and getting more difficult as Boo-Boo regained her senses. We got Tobo aboard a crude litter that we slung underneath the flying post. Howler we hoisted onto the log itself. We tied him into place. He was not badly hurt, just persistently unconscious. His rags had served him better than any armor. He needed to find himself an ally and do some rag-picking. He needed a new outfit desperately. What he was wearing no longer came up to the standard of rags. I told Tai Day and Mergen to collect as many scraps of flying carpet as they could without alerting the Taglians to our presence, no telling what could be learned from them. We did not need Goblin and Boo Boo getting any brilliant notions about improving their mobility. Howler chose that moment to wake up, stretch, and greet the world with a good scream. I clamped an armored hand over the little bastard's mouth, but I moved a beat too late. Boo-Boo's men started scrambling around. Goblin woke up and glared around, but in apparent confusion. Somebody eager to hurl himself into the gap between Peril and the Daughter of Night smashed into the girl violently enough to knock her off her feet and leave her groggier than she was already. The Love Me spell weakened significantly. Half a dozen Taglian soldiers materialized. The first two stopped instantly when they got a look at me and Shukrat. Those behind them piled into them. Doge leaped forward like a man a third his age. Ash Wand glittered in a dance of death. More soldiers appeared. Lots more. Mergen and Taide emptied the bamboo fireball projectors they carried, then drew swords and joined Doge in weaving a tapestry of steel. Shukrat told me, Go, now, just push the right, Geistede. It will go ahead of you. 
In a straight line only, I discovered instantly, unless a couple of people pushed and pulled it real hard to get it going in a straight line in some other direction. I did not have anyone to help me right away. Tobo's male relatives were busy turning the Taglian army into bite-sized bits of crow food. Shukrat was playing hard to hit with a band of Taglian archers. When their arrows reached her, she seemed to lose definition momentarily. Her cloak swirled around her, almost cloud-like. Nothing touched her. A cloud of a thousand glittering little obsidian flakes boiled off Shukrat. Despite a breeze blowing into our faces, the cloud headed for the Taglians. In moments, enemy soldiers were swearing, slapping themselves, forgetting to be bellicose toward me. Most excellent. I had seen One-Eye and Goblin pull similar stunts frequently over the years, usually with bees or hornets. One time, one of them stirred up an army of ants to attack the other. Much of their creativity for much of their lives had gone into inventing new ways to harass one another. I missed the little shits, aggravation and all. It was not a good time to be a Taglian devotee of the deceiver Messiah, willing or otherwise. Tobo's family was making the blood fly. That damned goblin exploded like a starving vampire popping out of his grave. He landed amongst his own soldiers. Three or four went down. Doge, Taide, and Mergen all got thrown around like they weighed nothing. Their swords seemed incapable of doing any harm. The fiercest blows sounded like they were slamming into a waterlogged tree trunk and did about as much damage as they would have done to a huge old water-soaked log. I recalled One Eye's last hours, and was in motion already when I did, the black spear extended way out in my right hand, head starting to glow. The goblin thing whipped to one side fast enough to avoid getting skewered. It did suffer a cut that would have been enough to require stitches if it had been the true goblin. Its flesh felt tougher than an old smoke-cured ham. The goblin face betrayed complete astonishment, then horrible pain. The spear flashed and smoked in my hand. Goblin shrieked. For an instant I saw the real goblin looking out of tormented eyes. I fought for my balance and tried to get him with a truer thrust. I did not get him at all. He flung out of there in complete terror of my weapon, his wound looked like it had gone gangrenous already. All this took only moments. The troops I had asked to tag along behind wasted no time rushing up to help. Still down, Boo Boo was not radiating enough love me to disrupt their ability to fight. They started grabbing the rest of us and dragging us out of there. I can walk, I snarled, though I had almost no strength left. I got hold of the flying post and started walking it. The soldiers carried Doge and Taide. Mergen looped an arm over the shoulder of another fighter who had managed to get himself injured already. This did not look good for the Key family. More of our men rushed up. I leaned into the log. I tried not to worry. Behind me the skirmish got rowdy. More men came up on both sides. Fortunes shifted as the girl found strength or weakened. Evidently using the Love Me enchantment sucked the strength out of her flesh. I hate this kind of fight, I told Sleepy when she came over to see how the survivors were doing. She kept her back to the ranks of the dead. Howler was up and around already. I had a whole team working on Tobo. Mergen was going to make it. He just needed time. But time had run out for Doge and Taide. Soldiers live. I kept doing what I could for Soulcatcher, too, mostly when my wife was not watching. You can lose a lot of men without accomplishing a thing. I meant that as a subtle suggestion. They've realized they can't win. They've started moving north, before we can finish surrounding them. I heard nothing in her voice expressing disappointment. How bad is Tobo? Not as bad as his uncle and Doge. Croker. Sorry. We're out of business, maybe for a long time. If Tobo has a bone that isn't broken, I can't find it. I exaggerated only a little. The kid had a broken leg, a broken toe, a broken arm, 
two places, a concussion and a whole rack of crushed or broken ribs. Unless you're willing to face Mogaba without him. Outnumbered by the best troops we'll face, commanded by the only intelligent commander we're likely to meet. Meaning a general she had fought during the Kialune Wars, but never had beaten. She eyed Soulcatcher. Counting on Howler to give us his best? I think not. Then we'd better fall back to Dejagore and get comfortable, or move up to Goja. Goja, she decided instantly. We want control of that river crossing and that barrier. Mogaba isn't likely to come out right away. He'll want to know exactly what's going on before he commits himself to any course. Hell, he might not come out at all if we update him on what's going on with the Daughter of Night. She agreed. If we let him know, he might find a chance to do something beneficial to all of us. See that he gets the appropriate information. How was I supposed to do that? I did not ask. I knelt beside Soulcatcher. Her breathing was ragged. She seemed to be getting weaker. I did ask, How's Sara? She'll be all right. She's lived with this idea for a lot of years. She knows nobody gets out of here alive, even if they don't have one of those silver badges. I'll let you know what she decides about funeral arrangements. I grunted. She left me with a final caution. Just don't let her boy die. Things would get unpleasant. Chapter 74 Midway Between Escape Artists Sometime during the excitement, the Varoshk kids decided to run away. But before they ran, they had to argue about how to manage it and who should be in charge after they succeeded. And then they kept bickering until they wasted most of the time when the rest of us were diverted, first by Soul Catcher and then by Boo Boo. Nothing got decided completely. After sundown, they surprised their guards using feeble disorientation spells. Gromoval killed several soldiers, mostly because Magadan cautioned him not to. As soon as they were loose, Gromoval started looking for his flying post. Arcana and Magadan believed it was more important to find their clothing. Without that, they were almost powerless. They wrote Gromoval off. They knew the Black Company well enough already to want to distance themselves from the doom taking shape in his future. Arcana told Magadan, We'll have to take one of those keys to their shadow gate, too. Otherwise, we'll never get out of this world. If we get the chance, yes. But the main thing we need to do is get away from these madmen. Even after several months, Magadan still did not understand what was happening in this world. It was too alien. Nothing made any sense. His own world had known no real war since his forebears had come to power. Two hundred yards away, Gromoval did something stupid and betrayed himself as he tried to steal a flying post. An alarm sounded. In minutes, rage flooded the camp. The murdered guards had been found. Arcana swore. That idiot. We'd better surrender to somebody important right now. If we keep on running, the soldiers who catch us won't listen to any explanations. Shukrat? Shukrat's gone native. Shukrat's decided there's no way she'll ever get home, so she might as well do the best she can for herself over here. It's probably because of her mother. What? Her mother. Shukrat's been totally weird ever since the first father put her mother aside for that woman Saltireva. Besides, she's infatuated with Tobo. He is gorgeous, isn't he? Magadan. Well, yes. Exotic, anyway. I hear his mother was one of the great beauties of this world when she was younger. But his father grew up eating nothing but ugly soup. All the while they talked, Magadan kept drifting away from the excitement. He had no destination in mind, but no intention of giving himself up. There would be no chance like this ever again. Arcana said... Shukrat could be right. What? Suppose she hasn't really gone native. Suppose she's just winning their trust. Maybe someday she'll just stroll off with one of their keys and leave this world. Damn. Shukrat won't do it, but we could adopt that strategy. It had not taken Shukrat long to get her post and clothing back. 
She was becoming an important part of the Black Company, already. Why didn't we think of that? Magadan grumbled. Arkana said, Because we're almost as stupid as Gromoval is, as blind to anything that isn't the way it was at home. Shukrat isn't bright, but she does see that this isn't home and never will be. I'm turning back. You do what you want. When the shouting stops, I want them to find me right where they left me. I refused to run away. It was all that idiot Gromoval's fault. But, darling Ice Princess, don't you know you never do anything alone? The Varoshk never fully grasped the fact that the unknown shadows are with all of us always. If Tobo wanted, he could catalog every breath they took. The hidden folk tap emotion. They learn to understand what is being said far faster than even language naturals like myself. The Varosh could no longer speak secrets. Sometimes misfortune likes to get into the game. Magadan told Arkana, You go ahead. Be friendly. Flirt. Do what Shukrat did. When you get your key, come find me. I'll walk you home. Come back with me. I can't. They'll blame me for what Gromoval did. The devil named appeared suddenly, running straight toward them, the light of campfires exaggerating the terror distorting his face. Gromoval had expected to fling open the door to freedom, but had found it to be the door to hell, and no one on the other side cared who he was. Before it could all be sorted out and the troops calmed down, Magadan had been killed. Gromoval had been wounded badly, and Arkana had been raped several times. She brought a broken leg and several cracked ribs into my care as well. In time, I heard all the true details from my ravens, who seemed more inclined to be communicative while Tobo was out of action. Soldiers whose friends have been murdered are not kindly people. In a company without lady and a female captain, no discipline would have been assessed at all. As it was, the discipline was light and directed mainly at those who had assaulted Arcana sexually. That could not be overlooked. Chapter 75 Taglios The Palace Mogaba was not yet aware of the disaster that had befallen the army of the middle when he found the two women in his quarters. Lady he recognized, the young blonde he did not. She would, he presumed, be a sorceress too. Fear cramped his stomach, his heartbeat doubled, but he betrayed nothing outwardly. He had had to mask his emotions in the presence of madmen and a mad woman for decades. The mad men were gone. With luck, the mad woman would follow, and he would persist. He bowed slightly. Lady, to what do I owe the unexpected honor? To disasters, of course. The great general glanced at the younger woman. She was completely exotic, like no woman he had ever seen. Though white and blonde, she did not resemble Willow Swan otherwise. There was an alien feel to her. She must be from wherever the Black Company had hidden the last several years. He said, I'm sure you didn't come this far just to stand around looking cryptic. The Daughter of Night and the thing inside what used to be Goblin somehow overwhelmed the Protector. The girl put on Soulcatcher's leathers. She's pretending to be her. She squandered ninety-five percent of your middle army. She's headed this way. We aren't in any condition to chase her. My husband thought you should know. He wants me to remind you that the Daughter of Night exists only to bring on the Year of the Skulls. I want you to know that Kina is real. Doubt any of the other gods you want, but not this one. She's out there. We've seen her. And if she gets loose, none of our other squabbles will mean a thing. Mogaba did not need to be reminded that the Year of the Skulls would be an atrocity far huger than any of Soulcatcher's random cruelties. Catcher was mere chaos. Kina was destruction. We have a plan for handling the Protector. It should work as well against someone pretending to be the Protector. Possibly better. He did not ask what had become of Soulcatcher. He was content to hope that phase of his life was complete. 
The girl doesn't have Soul Catcher's finely honed powers, but she does have plenty of raw talent. She somehow surrounded herself with an aura that makes anyone within a hundred feet want to love her and do anything to please her. This has manifested itself before, in smaller ways, so I fear we can expect it to grow as she comes to understand it and exercise it. That isn't good. That's not good at all. That'll make sniping difficult, any way around it. From the blonde's slight start, Mogaba judged ladies, not that we know of yet, to be less than honest. But in her place he would have reserved something, too. And what they had, obviously, was not reliable, otherwise they would have used it themselves. The great general said, Thank you for the warning. We'll make use of it. Was there anything more? Down deep he nurtured the tiniest hope that there could be a reconciliation, a hope he knew was unrealistic, but everyone nurtured impossible dreams. Even the gods were pursuing the impossible. Mogaba stated the facts as they had been reported to him. He made that point clear. We aren't their friends. They just want someone else to assume part of the cost of eliminating the enemies they have to go through in order to get at us. Gopal Singh asked, What about the truth of the report? Are they just trying to trick us into attacking the Protector? If they could get us to make the attempt and we were to fall at a time when they were close behind the Protector, they'd reach the gates just when Taglios was falling into chaos. Aridatha groaned. We went to them, Gopal. Remember me chasing halfway to the other end of the world to tell them we were going to try to get rid of the Protector. Remember me helping them take over De Jagore as a sign of good faith. Circumstances have changed, Mogaba interjected. Gopal, I've given this a lot of thought. I think it's true. The Protector is out of the game. Possibly only momentarily. Hell, probably. She's made unlikely comebacks before. What hurts my feelings, of course, is that those people don't consider us much worth worrying about in terms of the greater struggle. Aridatha grumbled, which might not be that unreasonable when you think about it dispassionately. Gopal asked, And you're equally sure that the Middle Army has been destroyed? Even military insiders had not yet fully digested the news about the losses of De Jagere and the southern army that had clung to its skirts. A lot of people were still waiting to hear how De Jagere responded to its change of masters. The nature of that response would have repercussions throughout the Taglian Empire. Would the return of the royals be celebrated or resented? The De Jagaran response was likely to set the fashion for all the cities and towns that came under the company sway. I'm sure of it, Mogaba told Gopal. But I'm less sure of the condition of the invaders afterward. I got the distinct impression that their defeat of the Middle Army was neither cheap nor easy. Aridatha said, We've got to have better intelligence. Mogaba took a moment to stifle his sarcasm before confessing, I'm open to ideas, any ideas. No inspiration sprouted immediately. Aridatha said, We could always do something mythic, like damning ourselves by bringing in an ally worse than our enemies, one that will devour us after it finishes doing what we brought it in to do, Mogaba and Gopal recognized the effort, but did not get Aridatha's joke. It's an allusion, or a parable, or something, Aridatha explained. Like all stories about Kina, the Lords of Light created her, or brought her in for the Demon Plane War, and probably would have been better off if the Rakshasas had won, ultimately. Mogaba did have a sense of humor. He had just not brought it along tonight. I guess you had to be there. Anyway, there's nobody we could bring in. We're on our own, so suggestions are in demand. Practical suggestions will be particularly welcome. There was something in the nature of a jest, so perhaps he had brought part of his sense of humor. 
Gopal said, All we can do is send out more spies and set up more remount stations so the spies can get their observations to us faster. And we have only one courier battalion. Magaba sat quietly for half a minute. Then he asked, How is our support among the priests and the bourgeoisie? They've had time to think about the royals coming back. They plan to desert us. We're the devil as far as they know, Gopal replied. The protector has been their benefactor, and only a few of the slickest talkers can hope to benefit if we get thrown out. We worked hard to eliminate the Radisha's friends once we could no longer hide the fact that the princess was gone, not just hiding out, feeling sorry for herself. The great general proposed, Let's try the same strategy. Make believe we haven't lost the protector. Aridatha, you seem to be distracted. I keep thinking about the girl, the daughter of night. And? I saw her once, five years ago. There's something about her makes you want to throw her down on her back and makes you want to worship her at the same time. Makes you feel like you should do anything you can to please her. It's scary when you step back far enough to realize what happened. She's all grown up that way, Mogaba explained what Lady had told of events to the south. That girl got hundreds of men killed. We'll have to assassinate her remotely somehow. See if some mechanical engine can be contrived. I have a question, Gopal said. Go? What's that thing you're fiddling with? You've been playing with it ever since you got here. Oh, some kind of snail shell. They're all over the palace. Nobody knows where they come from. Nobody's ever actually seen one crawling around. They're sort of relaxing when you roll them around in your fingers. Both Sings eyed the great general as though thinking his behavior was distinctly odd. Gopal said, Regarding the daughter of night, we might consider poison. There are some talented poisoners in Chor Bagan, the thieves' market. The years had changed Mogaba. He did not immediately reject the suggestion as unworthy of men of honor. Chapter 76 The Taglian Territories Another Origin Story I suggested... How about a standoff weapon we can launch from outside her influence? Hell, if we take the logs and carpets up high enough, we can just keep dropping rocks till we get her. There was some optimism. We did not have even one carpet since Boo Boo knocked Howler and Tobo down. What we did have was bits and pieces of half a dozen carpets that Howler had been working on when nothing else took up his time. Lady glared at me so intensely, I began to wonder how soon I would start melting. Killing Boo Boo was not yet on her list of options. Her emotions were engaged much more deeply than mine, though the problem of the girl was a torment to me, too. My entanglement was more with the idea of the child than with the specific daughter. Lady wanted to fool herself into believing there might be some way that Boo Boo could be redeemed. You're wasting time, the Prabrindra Dra said. The collapse of Soulcatcher's middle army had brought him to life. Suddenly he believed his restoration was just a matter of marching to Taglios and yelling, I'm back. He had leaped into the embrace of self-delusion. There was a lot of that going around. Mergen joined the conference as the prince began to bicker with Sleepy about her plans, a situation guaranteed not to persist for long. Sleepy would let him know who was running the show. Mergen announced, I just finished reading a really long message from Baladitya, who is well and loving every minute of his new life, thank you very much, Sleepy, which he did not fail to point out several times. I asked, What are you doing getting mail from that old goofball? He wasn't writing to me. He doesn't know me. The message was intended for Tobo. Sleepy, who was thoroughly cranky because nothing was going the way she wanted, grumped. I'm sure you're going to share every exciting detail with us, too, even though what we all need is some sleep. 
Since you insist, Mergen grinned. He had no particular job assignment while he was recuperating, so he could do just about anything he pleased. His letter mostly concerned the prisoners Shivetya is holding up there, the first father and Gromoval's dad, who Shivetya took in originally just to protect them from the shadows, of which there are hardly any left anymore. Them and the Varoshk have almost wiped each other out. Sorry, he patted Shukrat's shoulder. Nobody missed that gesture. Mergen approved of Tobo's girlfriend, if that was what she was. I wondered what he was doing, bringing Shukrat to a staff meeting. Sara, of course, bristled like a hedgehog. There were no eligible Nguyen Bao girls anywhere within two hundred miles, and she had married a foreigner, Mergen, for love herself, against the will of most of her family. But what did that have to do with today? Sara could restrain herself most of the time these days, in public, if Mergen was around to calm her and remind her that Tobo was not a four-year-old anymore. But she was under tremendous additional strain now, with all her family dead or wounded. She had not yet pulled herself together well enough to make decisions about funeral arrangements for her brother and Uncle Doge. He restrained her now with just a gentle touch. You got a point to make, Sleepy said. Or can I get back to work figuring out how to get us through this on terms that suit our needs? Swan muttered something about the little bit needing a good dose of man to relax her. Sleepy snarled. Swan grumbled. Did I volunteer? I don't think so. Not recently. So don't fuck with me. Hurriedly, Mergen told us. Guys, Shivetya came up with another Kina origin cycle. He got this one from the Varoshk. Evidently, they don't mind talking history if they're bored. In this version, Kina's husband put her to sleep, when she kept acting up after she won the Demon Plane War for the gods by sucking the blood out of all the demons. This version of the goddess has ten arms instead of four. Her husband, known as Shevel in the world of the Varoshk, has four arms and is a lot like the Kina we know. Sometimes he's called the Destroyer, too, but sometimes he can be cajoled or seduced into going easy. Kina can't. His audience rustled. In some stories, Kadi, one of the gentler guni forms of Kina, had had a husband, Bima, who also counted the Destroyer among his many names. All guni gods have bunches of names. They get a little hard for an outsider to keep straight, because when they change their names, they also change their attributes. It gets particularly confusing when you have two aspects of the same god getting into an ass-kicking contest with each other. And this Chevy has what to do with Kina's origins, Sleepy demanded. Oh, he's the one who did all the mean things to her, like chopping her up and scattering the pieces all over. But she also kills him and brings him back to life. Mergen, I'm considering sending you back to the Taglians for some more rework. All right. Chevy has more than one wife, but there used to be only one. That was Kamundamari, who has several other names, naturally. Kamundamari was very dark-skinned. The other gods mocked her and called her Blackie. Interesting. Both Kadi and Kina can mean black in some Taglian usages, though Siam is the common and conventional word. Mergen continued, When Chevy himself started taunting her, she flew into a huge rage, tore her skin off, and turned into Gauri, the milky one. The shed skin became Kalakasiki, which filled itself up on blood sucked from demons, then became Kathi, the black one. Kina is a skinwalker, Sovereign cried, startling everyone. Skinwalkers were a demonic terror little known outside Sovereign's homeland. Skinwalkers killed a man, sucked out his flesh and bones, put on his skin, and stole his life. The details are pretty gruesome. Skinwalker folklore strikes me as a way for ignorant people to explain radical and bizarre changes in personality. Shifts, I believe, are due to poorly understood diseases, 
or maybe just due to getting old. Mergen was startled by Sovereign's outburst, which seemed excessive to me, too. Not a skinwalker in the way you mean, Mergen said. Was there something in Sovereign's background? The concept of a monster able to steal someone else's identity that way is particularly grotesque. I have seen a lot of strange and ugly things. Tobo's hidden folk are only the latest on a long list. But skinwalkers are one horror that just seems too terrible to be true. Like the gods themselves of late, there have been no manifestations before reliable witnesses. We were talking ancient legends tonight. Sovereign had referenced one of the most obscure. I said, Believe me, Sovereign, if there were any real skinwalkers down your way, you can bet the Shadow Masters would have rooted them out and used them up. What a weapon, eh? I guess, Sovereign admitted, reluctantly. That's wonderful, Sleepy grumped. Ghost story time is over, boys. Now we let Mergen finish. He is going to finish, isn't he? Because I want to get back to what this meeting is supposed to be all about. She swung a deadly finger. Don't you even think about puking up another wisecrack, Willow. Swan grimaced. He had live ammunition and no ready target. Then he grinned. A time would come. I said, Mergen? There isn't much more. Baladitya says most of the high points of the mythology agree. There's more of a death goddess to her nature over there. She's always referenced as living in a cemetery. She does that here, doesn't she? I asked. When Sleepy and Lady and you, especially, talk about your nightmares, that place you go with all the bones, that could be a goonie style cemetery. The Guni burned their dead to purify them before their souls line up for reassignment in the next life. But the fires are never hot enough to consume the major bones. If a burning ground is near a major river, the leftovers are generally deposited there. But a lot of places are not near a major river, and some are not near a source of firewood, and some families never save up enough to buy wood that is available. Bones pile up. These places are not often seen by anyone but the priests who attend them, the men in yellow who revere Majayama, but watch over their shoulders because Kina and her pack of pet demons supposedly lived beneath the bone piles. Even though Kina is known to be chained up under the glittering plain until the year of the skulls. I said, I've got a lot of time to think these days. One of the things I've been pondering is why there are so many different stories about Kina, and I think I figured it out. My ego got a boost. Even Sleepy seemed interested, despite herself. My wife, perhaps less enthralled, suggested, Do go on, in a tone implying that she knew there would be no stopping me anyway. In those days, the company, Croker, sorry, just seeing if you were listening, what clued me was the fact that there isn't any uniform Guni doctrine. There isn't much of a hierarchy among Guni priests either, except locally. There's no central arbiter of what constitutes acceptable or unacceptable dogma. Kina isn't alone in being the subject of a hundred conflicting myths. The whole pantheon is, pick any god you want. When you travel from village to village, you'll find him wearing different names, different myths, getting mixed up with other gods, and on and on and on. We see the confusion because we're travelers, but up until the Shadow Master Wars, almost nobody in these parts ever went anywhere. Generation after generation, century after century, people were born, lived, and died in the same few square miles. You only had a few gem traders and the strangler bands moving around. Ideas didn't travel with them, so every myth gradually mutates according to local experience and prejudice. Now first the Shadow Masters, and then we land in the middle of all this. We. A glance around showed me just three other people who had not grown up in this end of the world. For a moment I felt ancient and out of place, and found myself recalling an old piece of poetry that said something to the effect— Soldiers live, 
and wonder why. Meaning, why am I the one, of all those who marched with the company when I was young, who is still alive and kicking? I do not deserve it any more than any of those men, maybe less than some. You always feel a little guilty when you think about it, and a little glad it was somebody else, not you. That's it. We're travelers. That's why it all seems alien and contradictory. Wherever we are, most of us are outsiders, even when we do belong to the majority religion. A glance around showed me that hardly any of my audience were goony either. Well, that's my piece. All right, then, Sleepy said. Back to practical problems. How do we deal with the Daughter of Night and the Goblin thing? That's practically the same thing as a skinwalker, Sovereign said. Kina put him on like a suit of clothes. Sovereign had skinwalkers on the brain tonight. The Daughter of Night, Sleepy snapped. I want to hear about the Daughter of Night, not about Kina, not about skinwalkers, not about old Varoshk sorcerers, not about old librarians, and not about anything else. And lady, if you really don't want the girl killed, then come up with an idea for disarming her that's better than any idea for taking her out. Because you're the only one here letting emotion get in the way. Chapter 77 Above Goja Seeking the One Safe Place Goblin and the girl both rode, though their mounts remained skittish and frightened, and goblins had to be kept in blinders so that it would not see its rider. Neither animal was allowed to look back. Goblin himself wore a rag to protect his damaged but nearly healing eyes. The handful of soldiers who joined their flight from the middle ground fell away rapidly. Driven by the Love Me spell, they gave it everything they had— but eventually every man drifted outside the spell's influence, then vanished immediately. Only the two touched by Kina crossed the bridge at Goja. They reached the north bank as dawn began to paint the eastern sky. It was still only the morning after the destruction of the Taglian Middle Army. They had killed several post horses, but even so had not arrived ahead of rumors of the disaster to Taglian arms. Our enemies have been here before us, the goblin thing said. He wanted to be called Kadidas, slave of Kadi. The girl simply refused to address him by that appellation. These people have been warned and threatened, but they will raise no hand against you because of who they think you are. Not because of who she was. The Daughter of Night played protector with a blend of arrogance and small-mindedness, nothing like her aunts, but the garrison commanders found her sufficiently convincing, and she ached every second because it was clear that these unbelievers would never yield themselves to the service of the Dark Mother. She knew that they would have tried to destroy her had they known she was not her aunt. This world deserved the Year of Skulls. The aura the girl radiated got her through her brief confrontations. I'm exhausted, she whined to Goblin. I'm not used to riding. We can't stop here. I can't go on. You will go on, until you are safe. The Kadidas's voice left no doubt who it believed to be in charge. There is a holy place not many leagues further. We'll go there. The Grove of Doom... There was no enthusiasm in the girl's response. I don't want to go there. I don't like that place. We will be stronger there. It'll be the first place they'll look for us, if they don't already have soldiers there waiting. She knew that was unlikely. Those people were not yet prepared to tell their soldiers that the woman inside the black leather was not the protector anymore. But they did have the capacity to move their game pieces from afar. They seemed able to thwart the goddess whenever they liked. She said, They already know what we're going to do, because we just talked about it. We're going to the grove. I will be much stronger there. No argument would be allowed. The daughter of night was no less devoted to her spiritual mother today, but she did not like this creature who bore a fragment of Kina inside him. 
She found it difficult to articulate even to herself, but she missed Narayan. She missed him because he had loved her, and she, in her self-centered way, had loved him enough in return that now her life was one ongoing trail of loneliness and desolation. Leading where? This new hand of the goddess seemed incapable of any emotion but anger, and he refused flatly to indulge her in any way, or even to acknowledge her humanity. She was a tool. That she was a living thing with wants and emotions all her own was just an annoyance, a nuisance, an inconvenience. There was an ever stronger implication that she should learn to abandon her distractive qualities. Or else. Goblin said, We need a place where we can be safe and our power is strong because there is much we need to do before we commence the actual rite of resurrection, by which the Daughter of Night understood him to mean bringing on the Year of the Skulls. She became attentive despite her inclination to be rebellious. It sounded like the Kadidas was going to impart some real information at last. Hitherto the possessed little man had done nothing more than present his bona fides, then tell her what to do. They had been together only a few days, but throughout them he had been completely unforthcoming. She asked, How can we possibly bring on the Year of the Skulls? Our cult has been exterminated. I doubt that there are a hundred devout believers left in the entire world. There will be hands enough to undertake the holy task. Narayan Singh did well in his last years, but before we bring them together, we must recover the books of the dead. The Daughter of Night had to pass on the cruel truth that had been used to torment her all the while she had been a captive of the Black Company. The books of the dead no longer exist. The woman who commands our cruelest enemies burned them personally. Not even a scrap survived. The monster that dwells in the place of glittering stone that prevents my mother from rising had the ashes scattered throughout all the realms that touch upon the demon plane. That's true, the Kadidas grinned evilly. But books are knowledge. The knowledge contained within the books of the dead is not lost. The knowledge also resides within the goddess herself and whatsoever there was within her that needed to be brought forth into this world, she placed within me before she sent me forth. You know the books of the dead by heart. I do, which is why we must find our one safe place. The scriptures are no good locked up inside me. They must be out in written form to assume their full power. They must be there so that the cantor priests can sing from them continuously during the time of resurrection. Come, we must travel faster. The Daughter of Night hurried her pace, her exhaustion pushed back briefly by the stunning implications of what she had just heard. The holy books were not lost. She was ashamed that she had suffered even a slight wavering of faith. Chapter 78 Midway between. Bad news. People began to scurry as though in near panic. I knew the signs. News had come in, and it was not good. I suspected the cavalry force sent to probe the defenses at Goja had suffered some major misfortune. I headed for Sleepy's tent without being summoned. By the time I ducked inside, I had overheard a half dozen rumors already— not a one of them reassuring. Generating rumors is one thing even the most inept armed force does exceedingly well. Sleepy was heads together with Sovereign and Runmust, River Walker, and several brigade commanders from Sien. Toba was there, but was goofy with painkillers. Howler and Shukrat were not present. Tobo looked a little peeved. My guess was he had brought the bad news, but could not keep himself together well enough to contribute anything beyond his report. I had given up on him. If he wanted to cruise around on a post trying to do things while he was all busted up and in casts, I was not going to nag him any more. He had a half-crazy mom to handle that. Sleepy glanced my way, for a second revealed extreme irritation. 
That turned to resignation as other former captains let themselves in behind me. Even Willow Swan invited himself to sit in. Sleepy did face a unique challenge. No other captain in the company's history has had such a cabal of ex-captains looking over his shoulder. Even though none of us intrude or even offer much unsolicited advice, Sleepy's particular insecurities leave her feeling like she is being judged whenever she had to captain in front of us. And of course, she is, though like proper old ladies, we do it only behind her back. Since everybody but the cooks and grooms is here, I suppose I should get on. No, Tobo is here. He can tell it better than I. She deferred to the kid as soon as her gaze fell upon him. I glared at her. She had no business putting him through. Tobo's eyes focused. He shut them, took a cleansing breath, started talking. The hidden folk have been tracking Goblin and Boo Boo the best they can, though it's hard even when we know what route they have to take. He was something less than intimidating, strapped into position aboard a Varoshk flying log, so covered with casts and splints that he was able to use only one hand. They travel inside a fog of, for want of a better description, divine darkness and confusion. By knowing their route, though, I was able to have the black hounds seed the way with snail shells. I got lucky. One of the hidden folk eavesdropped on an argument between Goblin and the girl. His words came in a soft, swift gush that forced his audience to stay quiet and lean forward. Tobo paused. For effect, I would have suspected in normal circumstances. The kid liked his drama. The boy made the grim announcement. The thing inside Goblin knows the books of the dead by heart. Once the Daughter of Night transcribes them, they plan to start the rites associated with initiating the Year of the Skulls. Fox in the hen house. Oh, my, oh. It took Sleepy several minutes to get everyone settled down. In the interim, Tobo grabbed the opportunity to relax. When a measure of calm returned, he said, That's not as bad as it sounds. Remember, there are only two people involved. Should we kill either one, the resurrection fails. And for the rest of our century and beyond... And as anyone who ever worked on the annals will tell you at great length, it takes a long time to write a book, even if you're just copying. I saw the books of the dead before Sleepy destroyed them. They were huge, and the Daughter of Night will have to transcribe them error-free. So we don't exactly face an immediate crisis, even though this is trouble that we never anticipated. I jumped in. If you got one of your critters close enough to find out all that, then you probably know right where they are. We can set up some kind of ambush. Lady and Howler were supposed to have been ransacking the cobwebby cellars of their minds in an effort to recall some ancient device whereby Goblin and the girl might be distracted, disoriented, distressed, and destroyed. Or just disarmed, in the case of my missus. Realist and pragmatist though she was, she nevertheless nurtured a blind bit of self-delusion wherein she would turn Boo-Boo around, though she would never admit that, of course. Tobo said, All right, master strategist, architect of the destruction of the Shadow Master evil, tell me how you ambush somebody you fall in love with before they get inside crossbow range. Kid has a point, lady said, eyeing me expectantly. Your snail shell lurker didn't fall in love with her, did it? It just hunkered down there and eavesdropped till it decided to come running to you with its gossip. And? So the unknown shadows aren't affected by the Daughter of Night. Is the opposite true? They couldn't do her much physical harm. Skriker, Black Shook, that big old jumping duck thing. You're shitting me. No, really. Well, they really wouldn't have to anyway, would they? They just need to haunt her, keep interfering with her sleep, driving her crazy, jogging her elbow whenever she tries to write, really be guilty of all the annoyances they're blamed for back in Sien. They could piss in her inkwell, they could hide her pens, 
They could spill stuff on whatever she's trying to write. They could make food go bad and milk turn sour. They could keep her husband from performing on her wedding night, Sleepy snapped. You're roaming a little far into the future, Croker, and possibly targeting the wrong victim. The goblin thing is the one who has the books of the dead locked up inside his gourd. He might be able to manage without the Daughter of Night. I'm pretty sure she can't manage without him. Points worth considering. Both are just ephemeral tools, Sara announced in a hollow, oracular voice. Both can be replaced, in time, so long as Kina herself persists, the threat from the glittering plain lives on. That took all the cheer right out of the gathering. Everybody stared at Tobo's mother, the injured boy himself included. There was a creepy feeling to her, like something had taken control of her, to speak using her mouth. Mergen said later Sara had looked and sounded exactly like her grandmother, Hong Tre, when she issued her prophecies decades ago. She scared the shit out of Mergen and Tobo both. They used all the energy they could muster to insist that Sleepy's concern about Goblin and the Daughter of Night was not yet critical. Chapter 79 The Taglian Territories In Motion Sleepy reaffirmed her determination to move north. We limped along, accommodating the injured. We encountered no direct resistance at Goja, though forces loyal to the Protector had damaged the main span of the Great Bridge over the main. It took our engineers more than a week to restore the bridge. Throughout that week, the Prabrindra Dra and his sister preached to the people and soldiers of Goja. They managed to win the hearts and allegiance of the majority. The prince was quite good with people when we let him run around loose. He preached his own restoration with an evangelical passion. He won particular favor amongst old folks, nostalgic for the quiet changelessness that had characterized the world of their youth, before the coming of the Shadow Masters and the Black Company. Except for a small memorial pasture where the fighting had been bloodiest, the battlefield on the north bank, where the company had won a signal victory in what seemed like another lifetime, was completely built over, Back then, there had been a hamlet and watchtower on the south bank, beside a ford that could be crossed only half the year. Now Goja threatened to become a city. The bridge, begun at my suggestion ages ago, was a strategic gem, both militarily and commercially. There were strong forts and big markets on both banks now. The girl and the goblin thing should have done more to keep us from crossing over. We made camp twelve miles north of the bridge, in rough, bare country still not claimed by peasants. I doubt that it was good for much but pasture, which meant it was a wasteland amongst vegetarians. But had the ground been better, I doubt many farmers would have immigrated. It was too near the high holy place of the deceivers, the Grove of Doom. We left the prince and his sister at Goja, along with many native recruits, Sleepy thought it was time the royals got a taste of independence. She was confident that they would not conspire against the company again. They had been included in our councils often enough to know that Tobo's hidden folk would always be close by. Ten hours after we set camp, in the middle of the night, Sleepy changed her mind. She wanted to move a little closer to Taglios, to get between the city and the Grove of Doom. I was awake when River Walker brought the news, writing by lamplight and keeping an eye on our injured. Some of them had not weathered the journey well. I was concerned about Soul Catcher in particular. The change in plan did not irritate me as deeply as it did Lady. She had to be dragged out of a deep sleep. The way she snarled and threatened great evils left me wondering if she had not begun having nightmares again. River Walker murmured, whispered, I'm getting me a head start. Run, River, run. You'll need every yard you can get. Lady gave me a look that made me wonder if I should not yell at him to wait up. 
We established the new camp near a dense stand of trees, which, I learned, surrounded and masked a sprawling Shadowlander cemetery that hailed from the first Shadowmaster invasion of the Taglian territories. From before the company's arrival. Almost no one knew about that. I had not, though I had campaigned in the region. Of the entire host, only Sovereign showed any interest. He thought he might have a relative or two tucked away there. He would have plenty of opportunity to visit tombs and graves. Sleepy planned to stay put, recruiting and training and harrying the edge of the Grove of Doom while Tobo and our other casualties recuperated. The trouble with the cemetery was time had vandalized most of the Shadowlander's slapdash grave markers. The Goblin Thing and the Daughter of Night settled down, too, and they really did nothing but sit— they did not begin transcribing the books of the dead because they had no supplies. They did not consult with deceivers making pilgrimages into the Holy Grove. Those men we left alone, every future step to be dogged by unknown shadows so we could follow their routines once they returned to their home environments. There were not many stranglers left alive. This way we could find out who those few were. Handy as it is, being able to see whatever you want takes a lot of getting used to. The Grove of Doom was always a cruel and wicked place, filled with ancient darkness. The hidden folk hated it, but they endured going in for Tobo's sake. Their devotion to the boy gets scary when I think about it too much. Gromovol and Arcana were mending at a pace equaling Tobo's, which was amazing, but not magical. Gromovol's arrogance remained undiminished by misfortune. Arcana was understandably withdrawn. Soulcatcher worried me increasingly. Not only did she show no improvement, she seemed to be growing weaker. She was headed right down the grim trail Sedvad had blazed. There was a lot of sentiment favoring letting her slide, and for possibly easing Gromovol along the same dark path while he was sleeping. The jury remained out on Arcana, even though the hidden folk had exculpated her in all ways but calculation and manipulation. There were random moments, widely separated, when I felt sorry for the girl. I remembered the loneliness. I was the only one who would talk to her, excepting Gromovol. She turned her back on him every time he tried to do so. During our reluctant chats, I tried to learn more about her homeworld, and especially Katovar. But she did not have much to say. She knew nothing. She had a full measure of youth's indifference to the past. Shukrat shunned Arkana completely. Shukrat was almost pathetically eager to fit in. Shukrat really wanted to belong. I have a strong feeling she did not belong before she joined us and maybe Arcana had, which might illuminate Shukrat's spite toward her now. Chapter 80 The Taglian Territories In Camp Life is never like a canal flowing gently through a straightforward and predictable channel. It is more like a mountain brook, zigging and zagging, tearing things up, sometimes going almost dormant before taking an unexpected and turbulent turn. I was setting out some similar proposition to Lady and Shukrat while examining Tobo to see if he dared put any weight on the broken leg. He thought he was feeling better and was getting extremely restless, which is usually a sign that the patient is indeed getting better, but is not nearly as far advanced as he wants to believe. We were in my VIP hospital. Soulcatcher and Arcana were present as well. Shukrat was putting on a show, fussing over Tobo while making it clear that Arcana no longer existed. Lady was on her knees beside her sister's pallet, hands flat on her thighs, motionless. She had stayed that way for almost an hour. For a while I thought she was meditating, or she had gone into some sort of trance. Now I was starting to worry. The women looked more like mother and daughter than sisters. Poor lady. Against the years, all men campaign in vain. And of late, 
time has been particularly unkind to my love. Now that we were settled and had little to do but wait for people to mend, Lady spent time with Soul Catcher every day. She could not explain it herself. She finally came around, looked back, asked the question that tormented her. She's dying, isn't she? I think so, I admitted, and I don't know why. It looks like the same thing that got the Voroshk kid, so I don't know how to turn it around. Howler doesn't know how either though the screaming sorcerer never had been renowned for his skills as a healer. Goblin must have done something to her, but it isn't sorcery, I added. Not that anybody recognizes, and it isn't any of the diseases I see in the field. In most armies, more soldiers die of dysentery than fall to enemy arms. I am proud that that has never been true in my army. Lady nodded. She resumed staring at her sister. I wonder what it is. Something Goblin did. We'd have to wake her up to find out, wouldn't we? After a heartbeat. The little bastard was right there when Sedvod took sick, too, wasn't he? I'm afraid so. I passed Tobo to Shukrat. Take it easy on him, girl, or we'll need to get you two a separate tent. Tobo blushed. Shukrat grinned. I turned to Arcana. You think you're ready to take up your dancing career again? Is nothing ever serious with you? She caught me by surprise. Frivolity was not a crime often attached to my name. Absolutely. None of us are going to get out of this alive, so we might as well grab a laugh while we can. So one eye used to claim. Cranky this morning, I leaned forward and whispered, I would be too. Broken bones are no fun. I know. I've had a few. But try to smile. You're through the worst of it. She put on her best scowl. The worst of it was still inside her head. She might never recover emotionally. She had not been brought up in a place and station where it was even conceivable that such horrors could overtake her. Look at it this way, child. No matter how bad you think it is right now, it can always get worse. I've been in the soldier racket a long time, and I promise you, that's a natural law. How could my life be worse than this? Think about it. You could be back home, where you'd be dead, and you would have gone through hell getting that way. Or you could be a prisoner instead of my guest, which means that every day could be like your one bad day. There are plenty of guys out there who think we let you off too easy, which reminds me of another natural law. Once you're outside the circle of people who agree that you're special, you're just another human body, and that's hardly ever a good situation for a woman. You're actually better off here, where we have women running stuff, than you would be almost anywhere else. Arcana retreated inside herself, evidently thinking that I was threatening her. I was not. I was just thinking out loud. Maundering. Old men do that. I told her, You need to take it out on somebody. Put Gromoval's name at the head of your list. Lady said, She's the only connection I have left with ninety percent of my life. The only connection with my family. The stream takes its wild turns. You do anything that saves her. The first thing she'll do when she gets on her feet is try to cut you off at the knees and make you dance on the stumps. Tobo started to say something. I poked him. We had discussed this several times. His opinion was bloody-minded. I know, I know. But every time I turn around, it seems like someone else is gone, and we're getting to be more and more alien. I understand. I've felt completely dislocated in time since one eye died. There's almost nothing left of my past. The nearest thing was come lately Mergen. Lady and I had chosen the way, and now we were refugees from our own place and time. Though why should I be surprised at this late date? That was what the company always was, the gathering of the landless, the hopeless, the fugitive, and the outcast. I sighed. Was I about to start creating another past as an emotional crutch? I knelt beside Lady. I don't think she'll last more than another week. 
I'm having trouble getting food down her, and more keeping it there. But I've thought of something we can do to stall death, and maybe even get a sound diagnosis. Lady turned a gaze on me so intense I shuddered, recalling ancient times when I was a captive in the Lady's Tower at Charm and about to face the Eye of Truth. I'm listening. I noted that even now she would not touch her sister. There was a strong, selfish underpinning to her emotions. She wanted to save this mad devil's sister entirely for her own sake. We can take her to Shivetya. We know he can cure Howler. He says he can, telling us what we want to hear. What Howler wanted to hear. I had no emotion invested in the runt's well-being. I thought the world would be improved by his extermination. Lady's tone did not support her words. A spark of hope had been struck. I said, Let's have Howler get another carpet put together. Then we'll slip away to the glittering plain, get him fixed up, and find out what Shivetya can do for Soul Catcher. Even if he can't do anything, we can stash her in the ice cavern till we have time to research what's wrong with her. That ought to be a real challenge for Tobo. That was the course I preferred. I figured that once we installed Soul Catcher in the Cave of the Ancients, Lady would lose interest eventually. The effect on the world at large would be the same as if we had killed her right away. While Lady could sustain her tether to her roots via the pretense that she would jump in and resurrect her sister one day soon. Lady said, I like that idea. I'll see how soon Howler can get a carpet put together. All right. I peeled back one of Soul Catcher's eyelids. I saw nothing promising. I got the feeling that her essence might be absent, out, wandering, lost. Paybacks, Mergen might say, if that was true. As soon as she left, Tobo said, You're up to something besides what you told her, aren't you? Me? I shrugged. I have some ideas. Some of them I might have to clear with the captain. Shukrat then said something that ruined her dumb blonde image for me. You know the reason that Soulcatcher followed you all down here from the north is the same reason that Lady wants to save her now. I'll bet that if she really wanted to badly enough, she could have killed you all just about any time she wanted. I stared. I looked at Tobo. I stared some more. Shukrat reddened. She murmured, Neither one of them ever learned how to say, I love you. I understood. It was the same thing Goblin and One-Eye had had going for all those years, at a somewhat less lethal level, when they were sober. It was the sort of thing I see all the time amongst my brethren, who cannot, or believe that they dare not, express their real feelings. I added, only those two don't even know they need to say it. Chapter 81 The Shadowlander Military Cemetery Laying to Rest Willow Swan stuck his head into the tent. Croker, Mergen, anybody who's interested, Sara's ready to do her thing with Ty Day and Uncle Doge. About damned time, I thought, but did not say. There were moments lately when I wanted to have the whole damned Nguyen Bao community lined up and spanked. They had dragged the two corpses a hundred fifty miles while they argued bitterly about what to do with them. I did manage to keep my mouth shut, but kept wanting to scream, They don't care any more. Do something. They smell. Bad. Not the sort of thing you do with grieving relatives, of course. Not unless you feel like you have developed a shortage of enemies. The Nguyen Bao had prepared a pair of gats in a prominent place near the center of the Shadowlander military cemetery. Though only a few swamp folk remained with us, those survivors were gathered in cliques, according to the funeral option they believed best honored the dead. Who would believe a funeral could become savagely political? But people can find reasons to squabble about almost anything. Ty Day's send-off was less controversial, of course. He had not believed in much of anything but his own honor himself. A ritualistic passage through the purifying flame for a warrior who would not bend, 
troubled only a couple of conservative old-timers who thought the ceremonies too foreign. Uncle Doge was the great bone of contention. With Doge, the burning group were in dispute with the exposure group, who wanted to lay the corpse out on a high platform and leave it till its bones were clean. This was supposed to be the proper send-off for a high priest of the Path of the Sword, though no one could say how, why, or when that idea had arisen. None of the men from Sien, some of whom had grown up in Sien's martial arts monasteries, had heard of any such practice there. The people of Sien bury their dead. Doge's cronies insisted that his predecessors had been exposed exactly the way they wanted to do him now. As we filed past the ghats, each tossing on an herb packet and a folded piece of paper carrying a prayer the fire would send along with the dead, Sovereign suggested, They might have acquired the custom when they first passed through my country. Some of the peoples back home, back then, did expose corpses that they were especially afraid would be seized by skinwalkers. Skinwalkers again. One of those monsters no one has ever seen, like vampires and werewolves. With all the real monsters loose in the world, seen and suffered often enough, why did so many people trouble themselves about things no reliable witness ever saw? Wouldn't fire work just as well? Burning wasn't acceptable. It isn't even in modern times, even though so many northerners have come across the Danda Presh. I grunted. It must have to do with religion, and religion seldom makes sense to me. The common people, the poor, anyone that wouldn't attract a skinwalker gets a normal burial, just like here. He indicated the graves around us. People who might attract a skinwalker will be exposed, so there won't be a good suit of skin to steal. He gestured. The above-ground tombs, they must contain priests and captains who were being stored temporarily until they could be properly exposed. Their army must have been hard-pressed. They never got back to deal with it. Actually, I could see several fallen collections of poles with bits of rag and bone beneath that might have been exposure platforms a long time ago. Looks like your skinwalkers never got here to take advantage either. That earned me a scowl. I was not quite sure why Sovereign was Sleepy's favorite and probable designated successor, but I never understood why Mergen picked Sleepy either. Yet he had chosen well. She had brought the company through the Kialune Wars and the era of the captivity, and there had been a lot of raised eyebrows when I had chosen Mergen to become analyst, and Mergen had managed despite never having been quite certain of his sanity. Sleepy saw something. Sovereign did not agree. Sovereign insisted that he was going to leave us, but I noted that he had passed up several wonderful opportunities to do so already. As was her right, being Taide's closest surviving relative, Sara asked Mergen to join her and Tobo in placing the torches into Taide's pyre. Fitting, I thought, although the old men grumbled. Mergen and Taide had been as close as brothers for a long, long time. Sara asked no one but Tobo to help bring the fire to Doge. Even I saluted the dead swordmaster, though in life I never trusted him. Lady leaned against me from my left. I suppose you'll have to admit that he was trustworthy now. Mind reading. I don't have to admit any such thing. He just kicked off before he could screw us over. No fool like an old fool. I stopped arguing. She would win every debate by dint of outliving me. I changed the subject. You still feel like you're getting stronger. For an age now she had been able to steal almost no supernatural power from Kina. But long ago she had been able to parasitize enough to come close to being soul catcher's equal. She believed Goblin's attack on the goddess was why there was so little power left to steal. It seemed reasonable to me that Goblin returning as Kina's tool would mean fresh power available, but it had not worked that way, not until Goblin and the girl had entered the Grove of Doom. It's coming, little by little. 
She sounded like she did not want to wait. I can do a few parlor tricks now. The way she thought, that might mean she was limited to destroying small villages with a single wink. I need to get closer to see what helps. I did not follow up. I could feel her excitement. She hid it well, but if I got her going, she would drive me nuts talking about stuff that was entirely beyond me. I could do that, too, either going on with my theories about diseases or about the company's history. Definitely a match made in heaven. I told her, Soon as we're done paying our respects, how about you see Howler? Find out if my idea gets him moving on the carpets any faster. If you give him what he wants now, he won't have any incentive to stay with us. Where's he going to run to? He'll find somewhere. He always has. And somehow that always ended up in our way. Then I expect we'll push him hard to get us a couple, three carpets, and you can hang around playing apprentice while he does, Sister Shukrat. Yech! No way! He's creepy! He stinks! And he has more hands than some of those four-armed guni gods! He's little, Tobo called from the chair we had brought along so he could rest between ceremonial stints. Spank him! That's probably what he wants! Get somebody to carry me around and I'll go with you, Tobo told Shukrat. I make the howler nervous. Croker, what'll we call him if Shivetya cures his screaming? Stinky might work, or the stinker for formal. The flames of the funeral pyres leapt higher. Tobo ignored me now. I let it drop, too. Time to say goodbye, old man. They never took the oath, but Taide and Doge were brothers in their hearts. Their stories were warp and woof of the company tapestry. Chapter 82 With the Company Going South Sleepy always saw idleness as a vacuum in need of filling. No way was she going to put up with ten thousand men sitting around maybe spending an hour or two each day training, when they were feeling particularly ambitious. Just miles away stood a perfectly ugly wood, desperately in need of clear-cutting. You put a whole lot of people to work on a place like that, starting from the outside and working inward, making sure you get even the tiniest twigs and shoots. You can get some great bonfires burning, the evening of the second day, the soldiers had one entire horizon hidden behind ramparts of smoke. Sleepy was daring Goblin and the girl to come show us what they had. I had doubts about the wisdom of that. Sleepy was not impressed enough with the fact that Goblin had a slice of Kina stuffed inside him, and Kina's badass reputation was well deserved. But I was not the boss. I could advise, but I could not make anyone listen. My worries just earned me one of Sleepy's enigmatic smiles. You ready to go for a fly? Lady asked. Howler's got a carpet ready. You in a hurry? You told me Silith's only got a week. That was three days ago. I did, didn't I? How big is that carpet? Big enough? I mean it, hun. It's got to have room for six people. She stared. After several seconds, she said, I don't think I'm even going to ask, except maybe who. You and Soulcatcher, Howler, Gromoval, Arcana if she wants to go. Still playing games, love. No game. Progress. We lost the most promising one of those kids when Magadan got killed. That was a bad career move on his part. Gromoval is as useless as teats on a bull. I'd just as soon kill him. But if we give him back to those two old Varoshk demons Shivetya's got tied up down there, we might score a point or two. She frowned. Thought you were the master manipulator of the greatest empire. She pointed a finger. An invisible darning needle began to sew my lips together. She was getting the power back. I'll just explain then, shall I? There's the man I married. Bullshit, but I was not going to argue. We got the top two Varashk locked up out there on the plain. 
They've got no home any more, far as we know, as far as Shvetya is letting anybody know. They have no future, nowhere to go. An apparent act of kindness might add a couple of heavyweights to our ranks just when it would be handy to have them. You're evil. I try. Let me go blow in Arcana's ear. You do and you'll wake up in the morning wondering how long before you get your first hot flash. Well, well, maybe that explains some recent crankiness. Hers. Mine was caused by the iron-strapped, rock-headed obtuseness of the people who insisted on tangling my feet. That was a whole different hunk of monkey meat. I went to blow in Arcana's ear, verbally. I'm not going to give Gromoval a choice, I told Arcana. This is a chance for me to maybe make peace with his old man, which is the only good that can ever come of the idiot. If I keep him here, he'll eventually do something stupider than anything he's done already. I've told you before, I've been in this racket a long time. When you come up with a liability as big as Gromoval, you look for a way to use him, or you kill him. I've been getting soft in my twilight years. Her skeptical expression told me how well I had sold that fairy tale. You, you're special. You get choices. You can go back if you want. You can tag along for the visit and stay with us when we're done. Or you can hang around here and not go at all. Oh, I'll go. I can't not. I'll decide what else I need to do after we get there. We went aloft by night, under the light of a full moon, with Lady, Soul Catcher, Gromoval, and Arcana aboard Howler's new carpet. Tobo, Shukrat, Mergen, and I witched along on flying posts. Despite Sleepy's objections and Tobo's aches and pains, Tobo insisted on coming along because Shukrat was coming. So Mergen rode with me because Sara refused to fly. The youngsters larked about us fearlessly, engaged in some dragonfly mating ritual. Mergen and I dropped out briefly at De Jagere. Sleepy insisted we check up on Blade and his occupation force. Drifting down toward De Jagere's citadel, I asked, you think Sara's been having visions or something? Huh? Mergen's thoughts had been wandering. This frantic mother stuff. I swear she keeps getting worse. I thought you might have noticed her having psychic seizures or something. She don't talk about it if she does. What do you think? I think that if she hasn't, she's definitely afraid that she might start. Yeah? When we were young, she worried about turning into her mother. Sometimes she's damned crabby. She's no Gota the Troll, though. Her body doesn't hurt her enough, so now she's terrified she's going to turn into Hong Tre, her grandmother. And? And maybe she will. She started to look like the old woman did. Whenever she starts cranking about it, I remind her how calm and accepting Hong Tre always was, like a solid rock in a wild river. Doesn't work, does it? Not for a second. Well, somebody must have smelled us coming. We had not yet settled to the top of the Citadel Tower, but Blade and his chief lieutenants were there to meet us. Blade called up. We were expecting Tobo, the way the shadows were all spooked up. You got lucky. The kids hurt, so you get the old farts instead. Captain wants us to check up on you. So you give us a couple of good drinks, we'll tell her you're doing a kick-ass job. No need to even think about you guys. I think we can handle that. Chapter 83 Taglios Decision The sharpest-eyed spy can be misdirected or deluded if you know he is watching. Having been of the company once, and having been victimized by the company more than once, the great general understood its policy of deception. His understanding had served him well during the Kialune Wars, where the trickery had gotten the best of him rarely. He and Aridatha Singh were observing large-scale close-order drills from the wall of a fortress that bestrode a hill just south of Taglios. 
The soldiers had begun to show some interest in improving their skills lately. The approach of a powerful enemy was a mighty motivator. The great general asked. They all went. I've had the report from two independent sources within the last hour. They went out right after moonrise. A flying carpet and three flying poles. They headed south. They passed close enough to Haban's tree for him to identify the Howler, Lady, Croker, Mergen, the Boy Wizard, and three of those White Wizard children I saw when I visited. They aren't worried about us. There'd be more of those. I'm sure the rumor is true. I've had it confirmed too many times. They're dead. The Great General refused to take anything at face value where those people were concerned. Where would they go? Maybe something's happened at De Jagere, or farther south. Farther south would have to be beyond the Danda Presh. Support for the Protector had evaporated outside those territories still directly under the great general's control, near as his agents could determine, though there had been no outbreaks of enthusiasm for the return of the royals. The mood of the Empire was indifferent, except amongst those who could profit one way or another. Same as it always was, Mogaba reflected. Mogaba played with a snail shell as he talked. Doing so seemed almost a tick any more. But he startled Aridatha by popping his arm back suddenly, snapping the shell out as hard as he could throw. Time for a full-scale field exercise. Let's find out how good their intelligence is with Wonder Boy away. Aridatha asked a few brisk questions. These days he commanded the division that would form the left wing of Mogaba's army. It was backboned by his own city battalions. The great general said, Make all your preparations exactly as you would if we were going down there to fight. Issue appropriate rations, but prepare in a relaxed manner. We just want to see how ready we are, so we know where we need to do more work. Don't encourage questions, and from now on I want to see our spies personally when they bring in news. Aridatha went away, wondering what Mogaba really had in mind. The great general sent for the rest of his staff and commanders. He spent a particularly long time, in bright midday sun, conferring with his cavalry captains. Chapter 84 Beside the Cemetery Confusion Willow Swan stuck his head into Sleepy's cabin, which had been built for her from the better logs harvested from the Grove of Doom. Another contact with Mogaba's cavalry, three miles west of the rock road. This happened periodically. It was one way the great general kept track of his enemies, the probes became more numerous when Mogaba wanted to provoke a response. Sleepy grunted, untroubled. I'm a little concerned, Swan told her. This time they're pushing harder. Since we don't have any good way to get anything out of the hidden folk who didn't run after Tobo, we don't have any idea what Mogaba is doing. We're as blind as he is. Is his main force maneuvering behind his cavalry screen? I get that impression. Then he's trying to harass us into another panic. Twice already, Taglian forces had come south and demonstrated until Sleepy responded, whereupon they had retreated rapidly. Mogaba was trying to get his virgins some confidence-building experience under the stress of near battle. No doubt he would push them a little closer this time. Run one brigade up behind the pickets and have them make a lot of noise. Keep another brigade in camp. Everyone else can see to their normal business. I think we're due for a reaction from the Daughter of Night pretty soon. Her campaign against the Deceiver Messiah and the Goblin Thing was much like the Great Generals against her. Swan reminded her, We have official Deceiver titles for those two now. A fact one of the hidden folk had discovered in Far Asharan, of all places, just before Tobo's departure. Asharan was a small city to the southwest, unlikely to have any impact on any events unless through its band of deceivers. Kadidas, Kadidasa. 
slave of Kadi, or Kina. Is that one or both of them? Those are the male and female forms, one for each. Willow, that girl won't be called a slave by anybody. She has the same blood as her mother and aunt. Daughter of night suits her just fine. Swan shrugged, departed. Tobo had said that there was no love lost between the girl and the Kadidas, that in fact they tended to bicker, that further the girl had begun to appear almost disillusioned. The great general's cavalry continued to harass Sleepy's scouts and pickets. Skirmishes popped up everywhere. Commercial traffic dwindled on the rock road. Sizable troops of horse probed the brigade deployed to screen the company force. They were mostly Vedna. Vedna had a tradition of being excellent horsemen. These horsemen showed well against Sien's professional infantry. Sleepy brought the other brigade out of camp and handed the backup roll off to the native recruits. I'm getting worried, Swan told Sleepy. It must be escalating. You were just concerned before. Exactly my point. Why is Mogaba working so hard to make us think he's working up to a straightforward attack? Why is he trying to force a response? Because he wants to see what we'll do, unless he's trying to distract us from something else. Any chance he could have made a deal with the deceivers? Narayan Singh's son is one of his cronies. That struck a spark. Aridatha Singh is no deceiver, nor is he a deceiver stooge. All right, don't get excited. Moments later, though, it became clear that it was time for everybody to get excited about something fast. The unexpected and deadly happened. Mogaba's cavalry faded away. They were replaced by the infantry of Mogaba's Second Territorial Division, as numerous as Sleepy's whole army. The Taglians drove straight into the defending force, hurling them back, while the cavalry began to leak around the ends of the friendly line. Sleepy had messengers flying around and horns blaring before it became entirely clear that this time Mogabo was not just teasing. She snapped at Swan. We have to keep them from getting inside the camp, whatever that costs. I'll handle that, Swan replied, though he was no official member of the hierarchy. I'll use the recruits. You grab anyone else you can find. He sprinted away. If Mogaba captured the camp, he would gain control of the treasure that had come down off the glittering plain. That might win his war for him right here, right now. Swan began sorting the confusion in the camp as soon as he located the Sien sergeants in charge of training. He announced that the enemy had launched a reconnaissance in force. Some elements might try to reach the camp. Once he had the recruits assembled facing toward the enemy, Swan sent trusted men to move the treasure into hiding inside the old Shadowlander military cemetery. And well he did, too. Mogaba's attack was much more vigorous than expected. When it reached the camp, the recruits did not long withstand it. They allowed elements of Mogaba's force to get into the camp itself. All did not go well for the great general, though. Soon after his own division caught the attention of his enemies, a second was supposed to rush forward east of the rock road to catch the disorganized troops rushing back from the Grove of Doom to help Sleepy. The commander of that force, not sure if he was being led into a clever trap himself, vacillated until his attack had no chance of attaining success. Shortly, he would find himself free to pursue new career opportunities. Many lesser officers would join him. On the extreme left, Aridatha Singh launched his attack exactly on schedule. Its initial goal was to occupy the Grove of Doom. Then it was supposed to carry on southward and westward and cut the enemy's line of withdrawal. But before Aridatha's force was well into the maneuver, he received a dispatch from Mogaba directing him to pull back. The enemy had collected himself. A counterattack was expected shortly. Mogaba feared that if Sleepy discovered Aridatha, she would cut him off and exterminate his division. Aridatha was a novice on the battlefield. Chapter 85 
The Grove of Doom. A Big Surprise. The Daughter of Night was ready to scream with the boredom and psychic oppression of life in the Grove of Doom. Life with Narayan had not been perfect, but she had understood it. Life with the Kadidas was intolerable. The possessed little man was insufferable. Every day, all day, there were lessons, almost always about things she already knew, unless it was philosophical stuff about how she ought to give herself up completely to the will of Kina, about how she should strive to rid herself of even the most stubborn tatters of personality and become nothing but a vessel for Kina, not the daughter of night any more, but the Kadidasa. The Kadidas droned his arguments at her while she sat with arms around shins, chin on her knees, on the steps of the Deceiver Temple. Visiting Deceiver pilgrims came and went, cleaning the temple. She paid no attention. She was recalling more than one other time when she had been right here with Papa Narayan. Looking back, those days seemed almost a normal family life now. She began to replay thoughts from times past immediately became restless and wondered why. She had not thought of men in that way since she had heard about Narayan's death. Someone came down from the temple, passed by her. He set himself to fling a pail of dirty water. There was a solid thump. The bucket man made a startled little squeak and toppled backward. He fell on the steps beside the girl, looking up at his messiah from amazed eyes. She watched the light fade from them. An arrow stood out of his chest. It had struck him through the heart. The girl did not notice the colorful markings on the shaft, which identified not only the archer's unit, but the bowman as well. She started to look around. Thumps and cries surrounded her. Arrows hissed close and thumped behind her as they found her new companion. She started to dig inside to release the love-me effect. A blunt arrow struck her squarely in the breastbone. A second struck her lower. She pitched forward, trying to puke up her ankle bones. The first few arrows seemed not to inconvenience the Kadidas at all, but they kept coming and coming, and then there were Taglian soldiers all over. A high officer shouted, Cut off the heads! We'll take them with us! Leave the bodies in the boneyard for the ravens. Another officer strode toward the daughter of night. The other Taglians all deferred to him. The girl's first response was to notice that he was incredibly handsome. Then she recalled having seen him before, years ago, when she had been a captive of the Black Company. He had been brought to see Narayan. My brother Aridatha, she gasped out. It seems my fate is to spend life as a prisoner. She continued to clutch her stomach. A huge Shadar soldier stood over her, ready to club her at the first hint of anything untoward. The Taglian officer was startled, but only for a moment. He grasped the part about being her brother. You're the daughter of night. It's my job to make sure you don't fulfill your destiny. He eyed the thing lying beside her, motionless now, but not dead, in the conventional sense. He had met Goblin that night, too. That is the Kadidas now, she said, not the wizard. It's not dead, and you can't kill it. It has the goddess in it. The Taglian made swift gestures. Soldiers bound the Goblin thing, then stuffed it into a hemp sack after yanking the arrows out of its flesh. I wouldn't count on that. Kina is in him. Suppose I chop him into little pieces, Boo-Boo, then have my men burn the pieces at places separated by a hundred miles. I didn't know my father, and I certainly don't honor what he was, but even so, that creature murdered him. What did you call me? Eh? You mean Boo-Boo? Yes, that. Why did you do that? She forced herself to look away from what was happening to the martyred deceivers as she forced her mind away from the accusation leveled against the Kadidas. Your mother and father and everyone in the black company who cares about you calls you Boo-Boo. 
because it isn't as unwieldy as the Daughter of Night. Come on, get up. I have to keep these men moving. No tricks, either. If you misbehave, you'll get hurt. These men are very scared of you. A twinge of surprise ran through the girl. They were concerned enough about her to have a pet name for her. Narayan had not dared go that far, though she knew that he had been devoted to her. Despite Aridatha's warning, she tried to turn on the love-me effect. It would not come. She could not tell if that was because she was so rattled or because of the Kadidas. The goblin thing had shown the ability to interfere with her before, usually when she was not conforming to the standards it set. For an instant she hoped her captors would shred the Kadidas and roast the scraps in a hundred scattered trash pits. Then she forced her personal feelings aside. This was no time. This was the time to concentrate on making sure she and the Kadidas survived until they found their opportunity to begin their great work. That that chance would come she did not doubt. Kina would find a way. Kina always did. Kina was the darkness, and the darkness always came. The girl remained completely docile and cooperative. She could not help noticing how restless she became each time the handsome general came near her. But he was too busy to notice her. He had received orders changing his mission. Chapter 86 Beside the Cemetery more confusion. There's another division out there, east of the Rock Road somewhere, Swan told Sleepy and her staff. My impression is that it was supposed to push past and get behind us, but it suddenly turned back north. Without us taking prisoners or getting help from the hidden folk, we'll never know why. The unknown shadows became a hot topic. There were a few still around, but they would not be bullied into helping. Tobo had not told them to help. Tempers did not improve during the discussion. Everyone was tired, cranky, and impatient. Sleepy, in particular. With no solid evidence whatsoever, she was beginning to believe that Mogaba had gotten the best of her yet again, and the thing was not over yet. The great general had not yet broken contact entirely. He seemed willing to continue skirmishing indefinitely. Swan told everyone, I think we did well. The casualty ratio ran in our favor, certainly. Sleepy snapped. But strategically, Mogaba must be celebrating. He's pleased with what he accomplished. She had no way of knowing any such thing, of course. She knew only that she was not pleased. Mogaba had surprised her again. She overlooked the fact that she had managed to drive off a much superior force once the fighting started, that Mogaba might have been too subtle and clever for his own good. Willow Swan did not overlook that. He said, Mogaba may be back, once he understands that he did surprise us and could have rolled over us if he just charged in without all the maneuvering. Heads bobbed. One brigadier noted that were he in charge on the other side— he would attack again, even if he thought his enemies expected him. He would do it just to see what would happen, and to build in the minds of the attacked a belief that they had to stay alert. Keeping ready to repel an attack would grind a force down after several days. Sara wandered in, late and uninterested in the discussion. To no one in particular, she said, It started to rain. Because this was important news that might have a serious impact on operations, Swan stepped out for a look. The sky was overcast, the smell of rain was in the air, but it was not raining now and did not look likely to start until well after nightfall, which was only a short while away. Swan went back inside, shaking his head. That Sara might have been speaking figuratively or metaphorically became evident a short while later, when a patrol brought in news that the Grove of Doom had been cleansed of deceivers. Even of the Daughter of Night and the Goblin Thing, Sleepy demanded. We didn't find their bodies, Captain, and there were plenty of bodies there, all with their heads missing. Maybe those two managed to escape. 
Maybe. I wish Tobo would get the hell back here. I really hate this being blind. You're totally spoiled, Swan told her. And loving every minute of it. So lean. More work for your recon people. Find out what happened, and find out if we can run anybody down, keeping in mind that it would please Mogaba no end to lead us into a lethal trap. It shall be done, my captain. Swan sneered at Tso Lin's flowery response. The man hailed from a province where styles of speech were as important as what was being said. He was another of those fiercely competent professional officers who had wanted to shed the feudal chains of Sien in hopes of making his fortune. Swan wondered if the men from the land of unknown shadows might not begin concentrating more on staying alive than on winning a war. Their future fortunes were in company hands already, hidden in that cemetery. Chapter 87 Glittering Stone Fortress with No Name Oh, so alert, the observing eyes, when Lady and I opened the shadow gate. I tossed in several unnecessary steps, just for drama and confusion. Then we were moving again, flickering southward along the shielded road toward Shivetya's great wintry fastness. The entire plain seemed a chill, gray, wintry place, lacking all glitter. The standing stones seemed old and tired, and not much interested in making any effort to proclaim the glories of the past. I did not spot any new ones. Not once did the wind grow warmer than the heart of a lone shark. We saw patches of ice and snow. Tobo suggested the plane was getting its weather from somewhere where the season was less comfortable than our own. You think, I said, with the cat of our gate busted completely. There was no sense of menace to the plane today. Could the shadows have become that few? Shukrat said, Only it would be the heart of summertime at home now. I grunted. I adjusted my flying log to make more speed. The kids had no trouble keeping up. I heard Lady curse in the distance as Howler's carpet fell behind. Howler could not hurry because his conveyance nearly filled the protected area. He had to be cautious. As we neared Shivetya's fortress, Tobo shouted, It's safe to go up now! He and Shukrat shot toward the sun, or where the sun would have stood had the weather not been vile. Don't you dare! Mergen barked. Too late, buddy. Hang on. I was rising already, though not with the daring do of some immortal teenager. When Mergen squawked, I said, You don't like the ride, get off and walk. In moments, we had a god's eye view of the glittering plain. It was not a view I had seen before, nor was it one I had heard described. From a half mile up, the plain resembled the floor inside the main chamber of the fortress. That did not surprise me but the plane's boundaries did. Each of the sixteen sectors centered on a shadow gate. Each had its own weather, season, and time of day, which became obscured and confused approaching the midway points between shadow gates. It's like looking at the rest of the universe from inside a crystal ball, Mergen said. How come you never mentioned that it looks like this? Because I never saw it like this. Maybe from the ghost realm you can't see this. From up there, color came to the plain. Never before had I seen so much color in the place of glittering stone. Tobo and Shokrat shot past us, headed down, whooping with glee. I said, fun time is over. Howler's carpet had come into view, creeping along the line of the road down from our own world's shadow gate. We entered the fortress through a hole in its roof. That seemed the only damage that never repaired itself. Maybe the guardian demon found a hole more useful than a dry floor. Certainly he had no cares about weather. Although it was daytime outside, our agent on the scene, ancient Baladitya, was napping. These days he probably spent more time snoozing than he spent awake. By the time Mergan and I sat down, 
Shukrat was involved in a bitter argument with Nashun the researcher and the first father. She and the Varoshk sorcerers used their native tongue, of course, but exact words were of no consequence. At heart, the squabble was as old as humanity itself, fug-headed antiques locking horns with omniscient youth. Smells in here, Mergen observed. It flat-out stank. Evidently the Varoshk were waiting for the serving staff to clean up after them. Guess Shivetya doesn't have a sense of smell. If I was him, I'd stop feeding them till they learn to take care of their chores. Baladitya, I noted, kept up his share of the housework, despite tendencies toward absent-mindedness and single-mindedness. The racket raised by Shukrat and her relatives finally disrupted the copyist's snores. Baladitya was a hairy old scarecrow, desperately in need of a change of clothing. His ragged apparel was all that he had ever worn in my experience. He was almost as bad as the howler, although less densely wrapped. A close encounter with scissors, comb, and a tub of warm water would not have been amiss, either. Tangled wisps of fine white hair floated all around his head and face. I thought bits might begin floating away, like seeds from a dandelion. The inside of the fortress was completely creepy. I never relaxed there. It rubbed me the same way Uncle Doge always had. Wrong. Suspiciously wrong. In a quiet, unobtrusive way. A way that left me incapable of relaxing. Baladitya zeroed in on Mergen, wanting to know all about how Sleepy was doing, about how his old friend Master Santaraxita was doing, about how Tobo was. He had the analyst bug. Also, though he had chosen life out here for the intellectual adventure, he did miss people. I suspect the Varashk were not excellent company. They probably whined constantly in a language he did not understand, making no effort to communicate other than by yelling louder and slower. I glanced upward, wondering when the others would get around to showing up. Then I strolled away a few steps to the outer fringe of the dome of sourceless light that illuminated Baladitya's work area. I stared at the vast, indistinct bulk of the demon Shivetya. The darkness around the devil was deeper than I recalled it, deeper than others had recorded it. The great wooden throne was equally ill-defined. The humanoid bulk nailed to the throne by means of silver daggers seemed less substantial than I remembered. I wondered if the golem became more ethereal as he gave of himself to sustain his guests. Visitors have to eat. Shivetya sustains his guests and allies by exuding large, mushroom-like growths of manna. I recall the taste as slightly sweet and mildly spicy in that way that leaves you trying to figure out exactly what the spice might be. Just a few bites provide immense energy and boost your confidence dramatically. But nobody gets fat eating the stuff. In fact, it is a little repulsive, and you do not touch it until you are hungry or hurting. Obviously, Shivetya himself was not going to remain a chubby forever, either. I realized that big red eyes had opened. Shivetya was regarding me with more interest than I was regarding him. The golem did not speak aloud. We believed that it could not. When it chose to communicate, it did so by speaking directly inside your brain. Some found the experience no problem. I had not endured it myself to my recollection, so cannot describe it. If Shivetya invaded my dreams during the half-generation I lay enchanted in the caverns below, I had no recollection of that, either. I have no memories whatsoever of that time. Mergen and Lady do remember, some. They will not discuss it. They prefer to let what made it into the annals speak for itself. It must not have been pleasant. The shadows left Shivetya looking like he had a dog or jackal's head which sparked a momentary recollection of childhood idols. I guess he was a sort of lord of the underworld. He just did not do much recruiting. One huge eye closed, then reopened. 
the demon of glittering stones showing off his sense of humor, knowing that wink would obsess me for days. Hands took hold of my arm. I glanced down. My sweetheart had arrived, and in this dim light she looked much younger and happier. I whispered, You guys finally made it. Howler is turning into a timid little old man. He's got the idea that he might have a future. Let's stroll off that direction about half a mile and get lost for half an hour. Well, I'm certainly tempted, but I'm wondering what's gotten into you. I pinched her behind. She squeaked and swatted my arm. I said, whoops. Both of Shivetya's eyes were turned our way now. Lady said, that sort of takes the edge off the moment, doesn't it? It did. So did several pairs of eyes watching from where the rest of the crowd were gathered. The youngsters in particular were appalled. Oh well, life's a bitch. Chapter 88 Fortress with no name Recruiting Excitement The squabbling amongst the Varoshk went on and on, seldom subsiding for long. I suspect there were several occasions when those two old men wanted to punish the rest of us, but were held in check by Shivetya. Tobo paid them no mind. He remained busy communing with Baladitya or the Golem. The latter seemed to be contributing to the boy's already excessive arsenal of power. Whenever it became too much for them, Arkana or Shukrat would retreat to wherever I happened to be, usually ending up seated on the floor, facing away from the family. They're afraid of you, Arkana explained. They think you're the real terror and Tobo is all for show. They think you destroyed our world. I didn't destroy anything. Curious, her accent was not nearly as pronounced out here when she wanted some protection. I know that. You know it. Even they probably know. But they don't want it to be their fault. Inside, they're almost as bad as Gromoval and Sedvod. For a couple of hundred years now, to be Voroshk has meant to be perfect in every way, without fault. So how come all the arguing... Because Shukrat wants to stay with you. Because Sedvod died without proper rights. Because they don't want to believe that Gromoval did so many really stupid things, including getting Magadan killed. That'll really cause terrible family political trouble when the news gets back home. Magadan's father is the first father's brother, and they really hate each other. Evidently, the surviving Varashk preferred to pretend that their family still ruled in a land not wasted by murderous shadows. And why are they yelling at you? Arkana sighed. She tucked her head down in between her knees, where I could not get a good look at her expression. I guess because I really kind of said I don't think I want to go home either. Arkana really used the word really a real lot. Despite what happened, they don't know that part yet. They don't need to know about it. They won't hear about it from me, but Gromoval might. Even Gromoval isn't stupid enough to talk about it. There's no way he can talk his way out of that being his fault. By the rules of our own people, if that came out, even his own father would desert him. Wearing a somewhat dazed expression, Shukrat retreated our way. Arkana moved over a few feet, but otherwise did not acknowledge her existence. Neither did Shokrat deign to see Arkana. Shokrat settled on the stone floor, arms around her legs and chin upon her knees. There were tear streaks on her cheeks. Well, I said, do I need to go over there and spank somebody for being rude to my little girls? Shokrat laughed weakly. You'd have to hit the other end about ten thousand times, with a blacksmith's hammer. Just to get their attention, Arkana said. Poised as they were now, the family resemblance was clear. Only when they were up and moving under the direction of their divergent characters did they seem so different. The girls had a point. Even the destruction of their world had not been enough to shake those two old boulders loose from their dry riverbed of fixed thought. I asked, 
Arcana, are you pulled together now? Want to come translate for me? I could use the tongue of Juniper, of course, but this would give her a chance to feel like she was useful. She thought about that for a moment. She exchanged glances with Shukrat. Both girls looked at me. I promised I'll only bully them a little. The older Varashk were keeping their fangs sharp by gnawing on Gromoval. If the kid had not fucked up so badly, I might have felt sorry for him. He did not have the option of returning to our world. He would have to take whatever those two chose to hand out. You've been a little hard on my girls, I told the first father. Time to knock it off. Either one of you bothered to go back and see how things turned out at home. No response, other than ugly looks. So you don't really want to know how things stand. An epiphany. Arcana, sweetie, they ran away. Coming after you kids was their excuse, and when they used it up, they couldn't go back. I'll bet you Shivetya hasn't been forcing them to stay here at all. I recalled that once there had been three of them. Somebody must have gone, and maybe did not live to bring back news. Those old men were cowards. It fit. For the first time in generations, the Varoshk faced something the family could not overwhelm as easily as stamping a mouse. And the only way some of them could deal with that was to run away. These two would not want to go back now, in case there were survivors. I said, I'll be right back. I trotted over to Tobo, interrupted, gave him the short version. How long are you going to be? Do I have time to take a run through the Katovar gate with those old men, so we can find out what the shadows really did do over there? The boy's eyes went blank. When I was about ready to slap him to get his attention back, he refocused, told me, Shivetya says that would be a huge health risk. Shivetya says you're right about the Voroshk. They did run away. Shivetya says more courageous members of the clan are still active back there. A lot of shadows are active there, too. Shivetya says the gate is growing closed, with almost every surviving shadow on that side of it. Shivetya says, leave it alone. Shivetya says, go ahead with your scheme. Shivetya says, not to worry about Katovar. You can't reach it. Trying will only get you killed, and it will still be there when everything else is done. Was that Tobo speaking, or was the demon using his lips? Shivetya, I fear, contains an awful lot of stinky brown stuff for a guy who never eats. You think it's unreasonable, him being a little selfish about the order things get done, considering the scale of his contributions? Humbug, I stamped back to Arcana. I wondered how anybody was supposed to murder a goddess, and survive it so the goddess's jailer could be hustled down the dark path right behind her. Sweetheart, tell those old farts that I want them to fly out to your homeworld with me that I want to see what's happened there, and that I really do want to see what's left of Katovar. Arcana took several little sideways steps that moved her around in front of me, putting her back to Nashun and the First Father. You really mean that? Softly, because that half-wit Gromoval seemed to have become interested in what was being said, I responded, As far as they need to know, I do. The old men did not do much faking of any reason for avoiding a trip home for a fact-finding tour. They did make it clear that they would not go. What do you plan to do with your lives? I asked. Shivetya won't let you loaf around here forever. They suspected they were about to be sucked into something, and they were right, of course. I added, The company always has room for a few good men, or bad men, as the case might be, I was not so sure about chicken shit and mediocre men, though having a couple extra sorcerers sounded worthwhile enough to make the try. Trouble was, if I did seduce these two, how would I keep them under control? That sounded like something Lady ought to ponder. It was the sort of question she had dealt with regularly before I stumbled into her life. 
I could hear the clockwork kerchunking inside Varoshk craniums. Their thoughts were obvious. Tell Croker anything. Tell Croker what he wanted to hear. Get off this cruel and frightful plain. Run away. Find a place where they have not heard of the Varoshk, where they have no major wizards of their own. Set up shop there and slap together a whole new empire, just as the Shadow Masters had done before them. Tell them I'll come back after they've had a day or two to think it over. As she retreated with me, Arcana told me, If they agree to join you, they'll give you more trouble than Gromoval did. Really? I chose a tone that was supposed to let her know I might not be as dumb as I looked. How do you suppose we could keep them from doing that? She did have some ideas. Do what you did to us? Make them strip naked. Take their right gestiden and their chef sepulchen. Make them stay on the ground where they're vulnerable. But promise them they'll get everything back after they show you that you can trust them. Then you stretch it out. I'm going to adopt you. You'd make a wonderful daughter. Hey, evil-minded future daughter number two. You heard, Arcana. What do you think? Grudgingly, Shukrat admitted. I think she's right. Excellent. Let's go ask your wicked future mother's opinion. We found Lady reading what Baladitya was spending his final years recording, which was, more or less, Shivetya's biography. Darling, I've decided we need to adopt these two marvelous children. They're turning out every bit as black-hearted as we ever wanted our boo-boo to be. Lady awarded me a suspicious look, decided I was fooling around, but meant what I said, more or less. Tell me about it. I said, go to it, girls. Chapter 89 Beside the Cemetery more confusion. Expecting the great general to remain offensive-minded was not enough, Sleepy knew. She had to outguess him. This one time she could not let Mogaba slide around her. She took a twinned approach to planning, setting up two distinct staffs. The first consisted of Iqbal and Run Must Sing, River Walker, Sara, Willow Swan, and others who had been with her since the Kialune Wars. She even summoned Blade up from Jaikur, because Blade actually knew Mogaba personally, and at one time had been fairly close to him. The second general staff consisted entirely of officers from Sien. These men knew Mogaba only as a bugaboo, and they had no knowledge of the surrounding territory beyond what they could learn from maps and scouting on their own. Sleepy hoped to find something useful in the gap between diverging visions. She kept her cavalry busy, scouting, chasing Mogaba's scouts, skirmishing with enemy patrols, trying to locate the bulk of the great general's forces. Mogaba was doing the same. Both sides relied heavily on questioning civilians passing through. Traffic on the rock road had slackened, but had not stopped entirely. Each staff proposed several likely enemy campaigns. Sleepy had their opposite numbers play out a counter-campaign, and in the end, after two almost sleepless days, she felt no more illuminated than she had at the beginning. So she chose to go with intuition. That had served her best during previous dances with the great general, anyway. Chapter 90 By the Cemetery Still more confusion. The great general told his commanders, I'm growing concerned that all this maneuvering helps them more than it does us. It's obvious that they're without mystical support, but every hour we maneuver is an hour nearer the time when they get those advantages back. Aridatha Singh asked, Aren't we still at a disadvantage in a direct confrontation? Soldier for soldier, possibly. But we have three times as many soldiers, and they're still trying to cover a line running all the way from the Grove of Doom to this stand near their camp. That's too much to hold with ten thousand men. No questions came. 
no suggestions arose. The great general seldom solicited advice. When Mogaba gathered his captains, he planned to issue instructions. Their job would be to see that those were executed. I'm returning to the original plan. I'll drive straight forward, in the middle, with the second territorial. I'll engage and hold. Singh, you advance along your previous route with your same mission. Once you're behind them, form your divisions in battle array and advance up the rock road. If the rest of us have done our jobs, you'll only have to sweep up fugitives. Mogaba rested a hand upon the shoulder of a young officer named Narenda Nath Saraswati, scion of an old aristocratic family, of the third generation of that family to serve under arms since the opening skirmishes of the Shadowmaster Wars. Two days earlier, Saraswati had been a regimental chief of staff with an aggressive attitude. The great general, having been disappointed by the timid performance of his remaining division, Saraswati's aggressive nature was about to earn him a chance to shine. Mogaba said, Narenda, as soon as I have the enemy engaged, I want you to take your whole force forward on a narrow front, along the edge of this wood. That division having been shifted to the right since the previous engagement. Overrun their camp. That shouldn't be difficult. They appear to be holding it with raw recruits. Once you clear the camp, reform and advance so as to strike the enemy left wing, rear, and reserve. Don't begin your initial attack until I do have the enemy solidly engaged. One more thing. I want you both to leave your main standards with me. If the enemy sees those, maybe they'll think I'm concentrating everything in one place. He paused. There were no questions. All this had been planned out before. The necessity now was renewed vigor. I'll go in at mid-morning behind scouts and skirmishers. Make sure your men are well provisioned. I'll personally strangle any officer who fails to see to the welfare of his soldiers. The great general's attitude was well known, if not universally applauded by his officers. Corruption was so deeply ingrained in Taglian culture that even after more than a generation of cultural collision and occasional bloody change, there were still those who failed to understand that theft from the men you commanded was not an acceptable way to supplement your income. Whatever their differences, the Black Company, the Protector, the Great General, all the Northerners who gained power, strained to increase the efficiency of their regime by rooting out graft and corruption. More than anything else, that made the outsiders incredibly alien. Aridatha, wait! I've had a thought. If things go well, it's likely Saraswati will break the enemy before you can get into position behind them. I was thinking of leaving during the night and going into hiding inside the Grove of Doom. Good idea. What I'm thinking then is you should come out in a long line so you can catch most of the fugitives running southward. I'm especially interested in catching the kind of people who go underground and five years later turn up with a whole damned new army. I'll do my best, Mogaba growled. That was a promise he hated. It sounded like an excuse being put into place beforehand, though Aridatha was never the sort to excuse his own shortcomings. He was more the sort who found good reasons why others failed. Chapter 91 By the Cemetery Even More Confusion Today's the day, Sleepy told her captains. I can feel it. She went on to excoriate Croker, Tobo, and that bunch for taking so long. Then she began telling people what she wanted done. She started getting arguments right away. She snapped, Mogaba is going to split his force again. For that, he's going to pay. If you want to argue with me, I'll accept your resignations now. There are officers who'll do what they're told and keep their mouths shut. A few hours later, the great general appeared almost exactly where she expected him. 
He was spread out over a lot of ground and had a lot of banners flying. For a time, she feared she might have guessed wrong, and Mogaba was just going to come straight ahead and roll right over her. But he did not attack as vigorously as he should have if that was the case. Sleepy did not press in her turn. Not right away. She did not want to make it obvious that she had not concentrated her forces either. She engaged in skirmishing and harassing tactics, but stepped back whenever Mogaba responded in any strength. He came forward both because he had to stay in contact and because Sleepy was pulling back toward the second jaw of his trap. He seemed willing to be led that way. When the division on the far right rushed from concealment behind a low ridge, it lost all cohesion. The troops had to cover most of a mile. Their commander was more interested in striking before his foes could respond than he was in presenting a pretty picture advancing. The men in colored armor who came out of the hidden cemetery marched in perfect order. Some carried recently manufactured fireball projects. They began slaughtering the rabble before most of the Taglians were aware that fortune had dealt them one from the bottom of the deck. They lasted as long as they did, only because there were so many of them. Chapter 92 By the Cemetery Confusion Piled Higher They've begun to stiffen on their right, one of Mogaba's companions announced. But they're falling back on the other wing. There's something wrong, Mogaba declared. There should be more of them. Why don't we rush them? Do sound a general advance, but at the slow cadence. The first confused message arrived just minutes later. Narenda Nath Saraswati's division was on the run. Saraswati himself was dead. Most of the division officers had been captured or killed. Before he could make sense of it, Mogaba heard the horns on his right and saw the different colored blocks, every soldier with his own banner on his back, advancing. A flurry of cavalrymen swept stragglers and fugitives and foolish resistance out of the infantry's path. The great general needed only a moment to understand that Sleepy was about to kidney-punch the second territorial with her best. Full attack, he ordered. Fastest cadence. If he got the soldiers moving forward before they recognized their peril, he could use his numbers to overcome. The little witch finally caught me. But there was still Aridatha moving in behind, it remained to be seen who would have whom in the end. Mogaba drove straight toward the enemy camp. If he could get inside its palisade. Chapter 93 Beyond the Grove of Doom Confusion Grows Aridatha learned of the developing disaster from Vedna horsemen who had been forced to flee in his direction around the eastern end of the battlefield, because enemy skirmishers had blocked the way north already. Aridatha was able to intuit the truth from the complete confusion of the reports. He ordered his division to form for battle. Backboned by his own city battalions, the force was well drilled, if not veteran. Within two hours, Singh had the enemy in sight, the invaders and their traitor native allies were involved in a huge, bloody melee, with all of the Taglian troops Mogaba had been able to hold together or who had not been able to run away. Evidently the invaders had not remained sufficiently concerned about Singh's division. Aridatha's advent was close to a complete surprise. As for its effectiveness, his soldiers had no experience dealing with the terror, and they all knew that their brothers in the other divisions had lost their battle already and were busily doing their dying. The exhausted armies disentangled as the day waned. The soldiers on both sides had endured so much horror that gradually they just stopped trying to interfere with an enemy who seemed willing to go away without causing trouble. But who won? On that day, arguments could have been made both ways. Final determination would be in the hands of those historians who examined the effect the battle had on Taglian society and culture. It could be a watershed, 
or it could be nothing important, depending on what followed and how the population responded. Chapter 94 Beside the Cemetery Sorrows Gathering Not even Sleepy had the physical or mental energy left to do anything useful. She slumped against the saddle of a dead horse, let the twilight and exhaustion wash over her. She felt no exhilaration, even though she had broken the backbone of the last Taglian army, and had, for the first time, been the one who held the field when the fighting ended. Mogaba, if he lived, was the one slinking away this time. A big contributor to her mood was the fact that this accomplishment, such as it was, was as much Sovereign's responsibility as her own. Sovereign alone had not abandoned all thought of the Third Taglian Division. He had been able to move his brigade in response, feebly, when the rest of the enemy appeared. But for Sovereign's cool head, the great general would be here, holding the field yet again, though the numbers of dead and dying likely would be much the same. Sovereign settled beside her. He said nothing for a long time. Neither did she. For the first time in decades she wanted to hold someone, wanted to be held by someone, but she did not act upon that want. Finally, Sovereign spoke. Willow Swan is dead. I saw his body a while ago. Sleepy grunted. I have a feeling there'll be a lot of old friends to mourn once we collect the dead. I saw Iqbal and Riverwalker go down. No, not Iqbal. Who'll take care of Suruvija? Singh's wife was not all that bright. The company, Sovereign, until she chooses to leave and run must if he had survived. It was his obligation under Shadar religious law. She's one of our own. We take care of our own. Do we have anyone capable of handling picket duty? Sovereign responded with an interrogatory grunt. That's the great general over there, Iron Man Mogaba. If he's still even a little bit healthy and can pull together some kind of night attack, he'll be back maybe even if he has to do it all by himself. Sovereign took several deep, thoughtful breaths. We have quite a few recruits who didn't do much but hide in the cemetery. I've already shamed some of them into picking up the battlefield. It won't matter if they run away, as long as they run toward us. Um, Willow, he never did, never found his dream. I always pictured him as your basic everyman, just drifting wherever the tides of life took him, showing a flash sometimes, but never really getting up and grabbing the reins. He might have been a hopeless romantic, too. According to the annals, he had a case on Lady once, and a case on the Protector, where he was much more lucky but lived to regret it. He even had it for you for a while, I think. We were friends just good friends. Sovereign did not argue, but there was a quaver in Sleepy's voice that made him wonder if, possibly only once or twice, there had not been something to lend substance to rumor. It was none of his business. I should have avoided this mess until Tobo and the others got back. Sovereign observed, Mogaba wouldn't have let you, so don't beat yourself up. He would have chased you hard, trying to take advantage of the fact that they were gone. Sleepy knew that was true, but truth did not alter her emotional state. A lot of people were dead. Many of them had been comrades of long standing. It was her mission to preserve them, not to waste them. She had failed. And the full, grim scope of the tragedy remained to be revealed. Chapter 95 Fortress with no name. Down below. She looks so peaceful, Lady intoned. We stood over her sister in the cavern of the ancients. Soul Catcher now filled the identical spot that Lady had occupied during the captivity. I needed a moment to realize that she was being sarcastic, repeating the inanities you hear at funerals. 
She was sure Soul Catcher was partially aware of what was happening, and she could not interact with her sister in any more intimate way. I said, We've done what we came to do. We need to think about getting back to the company, though I remained tempted to hazard a recon run through the Katovar gate before it healed completely. And I had a notion to take a gander at the dark thing that had been toying with our lives and destinies since before we ever heard any of her names. Yes, Lady said, there's no telling what mischief Bubu and the Kadidas and Mogaba have gotten into without Tobo and Howler there to babysit. I said, if Mogaba realizes that Sleepy's got no wizards, he'll be all over her like a snake on shit. That was colorful, if nonsensical. I noted that she did not include herself with Tobo and Howler. Yet I suspected strongly that she was capable of sucking Kina's power like a queen vampire nowadays. Sometimes I wondered what that augured for the day it came time to pay up to Shivetya. She really hated turning into something old and dumpy and gray that looked way too much like the mother she barely remembered. I just remembered a company sergeant from before your time, a man named Elmo. He had an unusual turn of phrase. You are getting old. I spend my whole life living in the past, darling. Let's saddle up. We had come down the long stair to the cavern aboard Varoshk flying posts. What a marvelous way to deal with stairways when you are no longer twenty years old. Lady started to pat her sister on the shoulder, an ordinary little action. Don't, I barked, with enough urgency to cause a couple of small ice stalactites to fall somewhere back in the depths of the cave. Oh, I wasn't thinking. There were frost-encrusted old men all along the sides of the cave. No one knew who they were, except possibly Baladitya. Most of them were still alive. They were like soul-catcher, exiles from some unsympathetic power. But a few, including way too many company brothers from the time of the captivity, were dead meat, and all it had taken to kill them was a thoughtless, gentle, or friendly touch. Lady pushed past me. I surveyed the local population. As ever, it seemed the open eyes all stared right at me. I met Soul Catcher's dull gaze. For no reason I understood, I winked. We were old conspirators. We went way back. I knew her before I knew her sister, in olden times of terror. It may have been a trick of the light or of my imagination, but it seemed there was a flicker of response. When we returned up top, we found the others involved in the initial stages of getting ready to leave. Howler was exulting loudly to all and sundry in his new ability to remain silent. He seemed almost grateful. Being an old cynic myself, I have strong notions about the true value of human gratitude. It is a currency whose worth plunges by the hour. Though thoroughly confused, the two old Varoshk sorcerers were collecting themselves for the journey too— which meant that they had surrendered to Tobo's blandishments while Lady and I were down below. They had surrendered their flying posts and special clothing rather than be forced to return to their own world. They must have gotten some really unpleasant news. You understand what this means? I asked Tobo. Huh? The kid was relaxing by flirting with Shukrat, I got the impression that those two might have started sneaking off into dark corners. They had developed that goofy way of looking at each other, and they could not stay away from one another. That would not instill sorrow with great joy. It means we have to stash Gromoval downstairs, too, or kill him, which wouldn't be politic, because there's no way I'm going to give him the opportunity to give us any more grief by letting him come back with us. I'll talk to Nashun and the First Father. He turned to Shukrat. Come on, honey. Ha. Huh. Honey. A procession of flying posts went down to the cave of the ancients. Oh, that was so much easier than clambering up and down. 
The elderly Varoshk, in borrowed rags, rode behind Tobo and Shukrat. Gromovol rode behind Arkana. I figured she owed him one. Her caste did not cause her any problems flying. She would be out of that soon. Gromovol whined and begged until he became an embarrassment to everyone. I could claim I had no mercy, but that would not be true. Had I been appropriately merciless, pieces of Gromovol would have gotten distributed over half a world, after I made a few cutting remarks about his character and bad behavior. I felt like one of the Varoshk now. I looked like one of the Varoshk. So did my beloved. The deal with the old men compelled them to refit their wondrous black costumes for us. Those would make marvelous compliments to our widow-maker and life-taker armor. Tobo and Shukrat, too, boasted the black and undefined look, Tobo having helped himself to Gromovol's outfit. It took only minutes to inter Gromovol, not far from the frozen corpses of several men who had been my friends. His final pleas still echoed when I told Lady, I'm going down to the bottom of this hole. I want to look at that old bitch who's been fucking up our lives for the last fifty years. Are you crazy? Tobo yelled. I wouldn't go down there. I'm nervous just being this close. Then go back upstairs. Shokrat, answer a couple of technical questions for me before you leave, please. The black barrier that had frustrated Blade so was back in place. It put a terrible pressure on my mind, but the flying post did not notice it at all. The post kept moving. The Varoshk costume I wore stirred slightly, enclosing me more securely within its protection. Although I know the names now, I refuse to call post and costume by their proper, clunkily cumbersome Varoshk titles. I passed through the barrier. Lady made a funny little sound as she came through behind me, like she did when we made love. The scene was pretty much the way it had been described by others. What seemed to be a vast, open cavern without evident bounds, illuminated by no evident light source, and that extremely feeble. All that could be seen was a huge, ugly sprawl of flesh, the color of polished eggplant. It did not move, even to breathe. Kina looked like Shivetya's homely big sister. Kina looked like the embodiment of all the dark attributes I had heard assigned her, under all her many names, since first I became aware of her existence. Kina looked like many dark things. My memories of the next few minutes are completely unreliable. Almost immediately, the great hairless head turned our way. Kina's mouth was open, exposing ugly, dark fangs. She seemed to have a snake or lizard tongue. I do not recall that having been reported before in any of the conflicting myths, though her tongue was supposed to be long, the better to lap up demon blood. The eyes of the goddess began to open. The immensity of her will smashed at me like a tidal wave breaking. The lights went out. For me. Looks like you were lucky this time, Tobo told me. Your post got you out of there. I wanted to tell him luck had nothing to do with it. I planned it that way. I set it up with the help of his girlfriend. But I barely had enough energy to keep breathing. I did manage to gasp. Lady? Had to check on my honey. Better off than you are. Sleeping right now. Said to tell you to just rest. Here's some Shivetya mana. It'll give you a kick in the ass if you can keep it down. I managed to roll my head until I could see the demon. Shivetya was looking back at me. A white crow was strutting around on his shoulder. Not my white raven. The demon revealed a few teeth in what he might have thought was a smile. Bizarre. I did not recall him ever having moved before. He must have seen the inside of my head must know I thought I had a notion about how to get to Kina. I hoped the goddess could not look inside my head, too. Some day, down the road, if I could get all the pieces to fall into place. 
the white crow sneered. I believe they can do that, those birds. Tobo understood that something was happening, but did not catch on. I think my new daughters understood better than he did. Chapter 96 The Shadow Gate Bad News Bad News I was outside the Shadow Gate gossiping with Panda Man and Spook, who were telling me that keeping an eye on the gate was the best duty they had ever endured. The work was easy and the locals were friendly, if the damned ugly spooks from the plain did not keep nagging you. Tobo and Shokrat came through. Almost immediately, Tobo let out a cry of despair. He shouted, There's been a battle! A moment later, he shot into the air, headed north, black cloth streaming behind him. An instant later still, Shukrat shot off in his wake, gaining slowly. Panting, Lady asked, Does that mean we should be worried? That would be my guess. The little shit must have gotten something from the hidden folk. And it was bad enough to set him off like that. She looked as troubled as I felt. No good could come of any battle fought while we were away. She asked, Aren't you going to rush off and see what happened too? Don't see the point. I jerked a thumb in the direction of the carpet, which was creaking and sagging under the weight of people we dared not trust. There isn't anything I could do anyway. Look at that. A ripple, a distortion in the fabric of reality, seemed to be running over the face of the earth, chasing after Tobo and Shukrat. The hidden folk following their hero. Why were they here? Waiting around for Tobo. But they should have been with Sleepy. They don't do us any good hanging around the Shadow Gate when... Oh, they don't care if they do us any good. Exactly. What they care about is Tobo. Anything they do that benefits the rest of us, they do just to please him. Which is why two-thirds of the time I don't have the two ravens that are supposed to be my permanent shoulder ornaments and messengers and far-seeing eyes. They keep forgetting to stick with me. They wander off to find the kid. Bet you they turn up before we catch up with Sleepy, though. Sounds like a sucker bet to me. After crossing the Dandapresh, I steered a course mimicking that Sleepy had followed, heading north. When Lady asked why I was not heading straight north as fast as we dared push the carpet, I told her, because I thought I saw something I shouldn't have on the way down. I have to check on it. I'm hoping it was my imagination. But my brief conversation with the guards at the Shadow Gate suggested that the nightmare might be real. She was curious, but did not ask. At the speeds we could make airborne, a bit of circuitous flight would not delay us much. I found what I was seeking on the path Sleepy had taken from Garhonis, at almost exactly the point where she had doubled back to get behind De Jagore. By then my confederates were extremely crabby. There, I told Lady, catching just a glimpse of something moving fast inside a stand of scrubby oaks. There what? She had not seen. The Neff. The Neff? The Neff are in the Varoshk world, trapped there. Not according to Spook and Panda Man. They say the Neff come around every night. All right, but how would they get through the Shadow Gate? I don't know. I was flying in a circle now, giving up altitude. Once down to treetop level, I cruised back and forth. I spotted nothing. Nor did I find a sign when I descended lower still and began to glide between the tree trunks. I never found a thing, not even a hint of a thing. People began to yell down at me. All right, they had a point. There were things we needed to do way north of where we were now. Chapter 97 Beside the Cemetery Among the Dead it had been over for more than a day, but the surgeons remained hard at work. Men still lay in long rows awaiting attention, moaning, screaming, some delirious, and some dead. A burial detail walked the rows, picking up those who had gone. 
Too many of those had died alone amidst the hundreds, without comfort. The glory of war. The ultimate fear. Mine, anyway. I checked quickly to make sure that everyone was conforming to my decrees concerning cleanliness and sepsis. A few of the wounded would stand a better chance if the surgeons and their helpers cleaved to the rules. Even when they were exhausted, as they were now, and the temptation to cut corners became overwhelming. Beyond our wounded lay those from Mogaba's army. They were likely to get no treatment at all, except what they could manage for themselves. I was sure that our medical supplies were as strained as our medical staff was. It looked like this was a much bigger fight than I had expected, or at least a more desperate encounter with more casualties than expected in a short time. Run Must Sing on crutches took me in to see Sleepy. She appeared disoriented. I knew that look of old, having been there myself. She was on the edge of collapse. She had not done more than catnap since the fighting started. You can't do it all yourself, Captain. You'll be a lot more effective if you just trust the rest of us to get things done and get yourself some rest. If Mogaba comes back now, you won't be able to think fast enough or straight enough to do anybody any good. She eyed me irritably, but was too exhausted to squabble. I take it you didn't come here past the dead. I came through the hospital area. She knew that I would have to do that. After we talked, I would probably go back to offer what little help an old man with a bum hand and a bad eye could. Then you don't know yet that there isn't anybody left for me to trust while I take a nap. Swan is dead, Croker. Blade is dead. Iqbal Singh is dead. Riverwalker is dead. Ad Fam Hukli, Li Wan, both the Chun brothers, and your old engineers, Cletus and Loftus. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for advancement. Name a name. Almost everybody is dead or injured. Hell, even Sara may be dead. We haven't been able to find her. We're back, I said. That ought to take a load off her shoulders. Successfully, I might add. What about Sovereign? Sovereign made it through. Sovereign saved the day. Sovereign and I have agreed to take turns resting as soon as we're sure Mogaba isn't coming back. Right now we're taking turns holding everything together. Based on what I had seen and heard already, the great general would not return any time soon, unless he came on his own. His soldiers had had enough. Mogaba would have been back already had he had any troops he could use. Caution and procrastination were not sins you could pin on the great general. I heard Tobo's voice outside, overhead, he was addressing the folk of the Hidden Realm. Before long, we would know all we wanted to know about Mogaba's current situation. In moments, thousands of wraith-like things would be involved in the search for Sara, and everyone else still missing. The kid was taking charge. Sleepy mumbled, I shouldn't have engaged him till Tobo came back. Unwittingly, I repeated comments she had heard from Sovereign already. Mogaba wouldn't have given you a choice. He doesn't have our intelligence resources, but he does make use of the tools he has. That was our failing, not remembering that. We should have given at least the appearance of having left a sorcerer in camp. Sleepy nodded. Water down the creek, which I'll thank you to remind me whenever I begin to feel sorry for myself and start picking the thing's bones to indict myself for doing things differently. You're a strange bird, little girl. What? Sorry, one eye's been on my mind lately. I did not explain. As long as I kept my genius sealed up inside my head, there was a fair chance Kina would not find out anything she would make me regret. I asked, What about Goblin and the girl? If there was fighting in the grove, we don't know yet. I assume Tobo will inform us. I assume everything is going to be just peachy now that Tobo is back. She was striving for sarcasm, but it was not working. 
she did not have strength enough to speak in anything but a monotone. Lady and Mergen will be here in a few minutes. Let them manage the little shit while you get your rest. I went for an excursion amongst the unburied dead to make goodbyes. They were laid out in rows, awaiting disposal. The weather was cold and damp, so putrefaction was not far advanced, but there was stench enough of blood and open bowels. Flies were rare, it being the wrong season, and crows of any sort were a rarity these days. Buzzards circled but dared not come down because the welcome they received from the living tended to be discouraging. Once someone identified one of the fallen, Taglian prisoners moved the body to the appropriate funeral procedure group. Recruits and additional prisoners were busy building gats, burning corpses, digging graves and filling them, or erecting exposure platforms for the few whose fate it was to leave the earth that way. A lot of corpses had been dealt with already, but I could see that despite the season, we were going to have to dig mass graves for the Taglian fallen. There would not be time to get each man a decent funeral. Although civilians who had had men serving with Mogaba had begun to show up already, hoping to reclaim their dead. I wondered if, in some mystical fashion, new standing stones were materializing on the glittering plain, their faces crawling with golden memorial characters. A subaltern from the land of unknown shadows approached me. It was obvious he was not pleased about having been assigned to the funeral detail. He must have embarrassed himself during the fighting. The unpleasant duty would be his reward. Sir, he said, with a salute so crisp it should have gotten his sentence commuted. It would be a great help if you could offer me the funerary preferences of your old comrades. There was a mildly repulsive fawning edge to his otherwise businesslike demeanor. He led me to a spot where he had isolated non-Taglians who did not hail from Sien. My former henchmen and a couple of Nguyen Bao occupied that little square. Soldiers live, I murmured. Now there was only Mergen and Lady left from the farther shore of the Sea of Torments. Barry Swan and the Engineer Brothers, inside that cemetery over there, make sure that their graves are clearly marked. I'll want to find them later in order to put up a proper memorial. They deserve more than a parting mention in the annals. I wondered what Swan would think of lying to rest beside all those shadow landers. He and Blade and Cordy Mather had helped put most of them there. I had no idea what funeral customs obtained among Blade's people. Neither I nor anyone else ever learned who those people actually were. Lay the black man down in a grave near Swan. Maybe they can be buddies in the next world, too. Maybe they'll finally start that brewery they always wanted. The subaltern was puzzled by that, but did not comment. The soldiers of the Land of Unknown Shadows were growing accustomed to the religious absurdities of the New World. I walked on, across ground covered by the corpses of men Sleepy had recruited during the time of captivity. Their number was disturbing. Before long, she would be as isolated from her own generation as I was isolated from mine. A great many excellent soldiers from the land of unknown shadows lay upon that cold, hard ground, too. And unsurprisingly, so did many men who had joined us recently, locally. Poorest trained, they had stood the least chance during the fighting. I surveyed all that death and hoped Sleepy had reached a watershed here, that henceforth she would seek solutions that did not require head-butting until somebody staggered away and collapsed from concussion. Not that all this could be blamed on her. Based on information available, I could fault none of her decisions, and she was a better tactician than I had been. Chapter 98 Above the Cemetery Mogaba accedes. Twenty-six hours after his order to break contact, Mogaba abandoned all hope of pulling together an attack that would take advantage of the enemy's despair and disarray. 
His own men had been too badly mauled to set aside their own despair and disarray. Only Aridatha Singh's division retained its cohesion. Its reward was the task of screening the retreating army, which consisted mainly of survivors of the Second Territorial. Of Saraswati's former right-wing force, not one man in ten could be accounted for any more. Enemy cavalry remained very active. The captain seemed disinclined to let him get near her again. A pair of billowing black shapes passed low overhead. They radiated a chilling psychic scream. Suddenly, instinctually, Mogaba knew that he was being watched by something he could not turn fast enough to catch staring. He knew that his best opportunity had ended. He summoned his latest aide-de-camp, who had been in place only a few hours. The man's several predecessors were still down there on the field. Bring me the deceiver prisoners. Sir? The prisoners General Singh captured in the Grove of Doom. I want to see them. He thought he could offer them a deal. The girl could pretend to be the protector for a while. Taglios would be less restive if the protector appeared publicly sometime soon. Those prisoners were sent north, sir, under special constraint because of the danger General Singh told us they present. And he was right. That was the best thing to do. We don't want them to fall into unfriendly hands. Publicly, Mogaba insisted on treating the recent encounter as a triumph. He expected his officers to do the same. Mogaba spent a moment considering what options he might have. It took only a minute to conclude that withdrawal toward Taglios was the best course. Oh, but he hated that. No matter the true facts, rumor would call it a defeat and a retreat. That would cost. The great general considered his aid. He did not know the man well enough to be aware of his family status. Tan John, is it? Tan John, sir. A remote male ancestor is reputed to have been Nueng Bao. My family is Vedna. Excellent. Perhaps you can share religious anecdotes with the enemy captain. Sir? Sounding both baffled and irked. I'm sending you south under a flag of truce to arrange for an armistice so we can collect our dead. If anything the great general ever did won him favor with the Taglian people, it was his effort to bring back the fallen sons so their families could honor them with all the appropriate last rites. This time would be a bitch. There was no way he was going to recover all the Taglian dead. Find me some priests. Every kind we have. He needed advice about what to do with so many bodies this close to home. The company, Mogaba was sure, would just fling their share of Taglian corpses into one big ugly hole, cover them over, and forget about them. Chapter 99 By the Military Cemetery Missing Persons Tobo was distraught. Mergen was distracted. He walked around bumping into things, trapped inside his own interior world. I had not seen him so lost since his analyst days. No trace of Sara had surfaced, even with the unknown shadows hunting. So far, Tobo had determined only that she had not fallen into enemy hands. The Taglians were not looking. They were unaware even that they ought to bear the woman a grudge. Sara always had had a knack for going unnoticed. She's dead, Lady told me. She was hurt, she crawled in somewhere to hide, and she died there. Which was plausible enough. Several bodies had been discovered in circumstances that fit the scenario, and Sara was not alone in being missing. Every company in the force was unable to account for someone. Most probably had run away or were prisoners of war, but the hidden folk kept finding others dead in places where no one had yet thought to look. I hoped Lady's simple explanation was the correct one. I dreaded the chance that Sara had been captured by somebody who would use her to manipulate Tobo. The upside was that there was a paucity of villains who might be interested. Mogaba was exonerated. Soul Catcher was buried. 
Bubu and the Kadidas were entombed in the big fortress guarding the southern approaches to Taglios, behind a door that could not be opened by any key still within the stronghold. Others who might have tried something sly, say, the Howler or the Voroshk, had perfect alibis. So it came down to Sara being dead and lost, or lost and wandering around in a shock so profound that she could not recall who she was or where she belonged. Sleepy posted a huge reward for the capture of an older Nguengbao woman wanted for questioning in regard to espionage against agents of the Prabrindra Dra. Mergen provided a description that included the shapes and locations of moles and a birthmark unfamiliar to anyone else. It doesn't make much sense, does it? My darling whispered to me. People go at the oddest times and from the oddest causes. Soldiers live, I murmured. You're turning that into a mantra. You feel guilty. You wonder why him and not me. Then you're glad it was him and not you. Then you feel guilty. Soldiers live and wonder why. One soldier lives because the gods know that I still haven't gotten my fair share of loving. Put that pen away and come on over here. You've sure turned into a pushy broad in your old age. Yeah? You should have seen me four hundred years ago. Tobo announced, Mogaba's had the Kadidas and the Daughter of Night moved to the palace. In a remarkable coincidence, the protector was seen publicly for the first time in months, only a few hours later. She was extremely angry with the Taglians and brought one of her punishments down on their heads. He grinned. Most likely that had something to do with all the graffiti that's begun appearing. All the good old stuff. Water sleeps, my brother unforgiven, and even some that aren't my doing. You shall lie in the ashes ten thousand years eating only wind. I love that one. That one caught my attention. I had heard it before somewhere, but I had heard them all before. Raja Dharma is everywhere. Anyone who can write seems to put that one up. Then there's Madhurprila, which means a friend of the wine and is a popular nickname for Gopal Singh. Seems the Lord of the Greys has a taste for the grape. The one I don't get, and which seems to trouble the Greys more than Madhurpula, is T. Kim is coming. It doesn't make sense. Everybody assumes Nguyen Bao are involved, because T. Kim is translatable only from Nguyen Bao, as Death Walk, except that here it's written as a proper name. I said... If it's used as a name or title, it would more properly come through as Death Walker or Death Walking. Not so. In olden times, a Death Walker was a suspected plague carrier. Goblin, Lady said. It's deceivers announcing the coming of the Kadidas. A dead man still walking around, by the grace or curse of Kina. And a plague carrier, too, if you count the religious side. Maybe... Tobo did not seem convinced. I did not blame him. I had a feeling it was something more sinister myself, based on nothing whatsoever, because Lady's suggestion ought to be true. I nodded in the general direction of where Sleepy should be. She said anything about what she's planning. Not unless you count her complaining about the headbutting she's been doing with our friends from the land of unknown shadows. Every brigade commander is whining about needing replacements, but none of them want local recruits, because of the language problem more than because of their lack of equipment and training. But none of them wants to see their own brigade disbanded so its soldiers can fill open slots elsewhere. But there was no choice, and everyone recognized that fact. The best answer was simple enough, and Sleepy found it without consulting me. Instead of disbanding the hardest-hit units, she took the one least distressed and distributed its people amongst the others, keeping whole groups together. Being with people you know and trust is critical to a soldier. She made sure the officers got better jobs whenever possible. The displaced brigade commander became her chief of staff, with the assurance that he would be given command of all the native troops we raised, however numerous they might become. Maximum result with least distress to oversized egos. Only a few men ended up completely disappointed. Life has turned into a preoccupation with administrative detail. Is that what happens when you get old? 
You worry more about people and their interaction than you do about drama and the violence and the wicked deeds those people do. That is us, the black company, wicked deeds done dirt cheap, but by damn you had better pony up when payment is due. Otherwise, if we must, we will come back from the grave itself to make sure our accounts are properly balanced. I said some of that aloud one afternoon. Tobo told me, you're mad, old man. As a hatter, a reflection. Speaking of which, you know whatever happened to One Eye's old hat? I was going to need that disgusting flea farm one day soon, desperately. One Eye had told me I would, but I had not listened closely enough. I had listened and understood that One Eye's wondrous spear would have to be employed in ways that the little wizard had defined well back into his healthier days. But that hat had been such a commonplace and so foul that it had not clung to its place in my mind. It may be in my junk wagon, Tobo told me. If it's not there, it'll be with Mom's stuff. He winced. Sara remained missing. We took everything of his and Nana Gota's when we left Sien. I need to find it. Fairly soon. Tobo wondered why, but did not ask. What a good boy. He did say... If I was you, I'd think about getting my stuff together, ready to move. For this analyst, all the junk and paper and pens and ink and notes and whatnot can build into piles that threaten to swamp. Sleepy would rather stay here and spend some treasure refitting and recruiting and training and getting stronger, but I convinced her that won't work. Things aren't going to slow down anywhere else. Right now, we have more sorcery available than ever before in the company's history. I've said so myself, more than once, in Jeremiah's about counting too much on powers and skills not part of the traditional company arsenal. Yes, you did, but you didn't say anything about it fading away. Sure I did. You want it to go away, and it will, because these aren't the kind of people who are likely to be content to do what we've got them doing, so we ought to use them up while we can. Meaning? We need to go after Taglios while we have the power to hit it hard. Was he starting to sound just the slightest bit big-headed, like he might know better than the captain what we ought to do? Was it going to be squabble on with Sleepy now that his mother was no longer around? Might be better to keep an eye on our baby boy. He was overdue to outgrow all that. I said, you could be right. Chapter 100 Taglios, the palace. Gopal Singh's report was not reassuring. The graffiti is everywhere, but we just can't catch anybody doing it. It's much worse than it was five years ago. Nowadays, with a lot of people on our side, you'd think we'd be able to come up with a clue. All we get is nonsense about ghosts and demons and things you can see only if you're not looking for them. Mogaba steepled long fingers under his chin. The thing is, Gopal, I've seen both demons and ghosts with my own eyes. When I had just become part of the Black Company, one of the company wizards had a pet demon. It later turned out to be our enemy, but that doesn't matter. It was a demon. And during the siege of De Jagere, ghosts often came and went— we all saw them, though hardly anyone ever talked about them. Most people blamed Nguyen Bao conjurers. Aridatha Singh observed, The reality of demons and ghosts doesn't affect the situation. Whether spooks or clever agitators are writing these messages, the messages are there, and enough people can read that the whole population knows what's being written. And what would you do about it? Mogaba asked. Keep watching for the vandals, but ignore it otherwise. If the people believe we're indifferent to the criticism, they won't take it seriously either. A notion I hoped to put forward myself, Gopal said. Because people in the street have no more idea than we do who's putting that stuff up, which makes them just as nervous as it makes us. Mogaba grimaced. Approved, then. With this caveat... Some of those slogans don't fit the traditional mold. T. Kim is coming. We still don't know what that means. The Walking Death is coming, 
Gopal said. You have to think that means the Daughter of Night's companion. You think it's deceiver work, then? That's my guess. But T. Kim is Nguyen Bao. I've never heard of any Nguyen Bao deceivers. Gopal grunted. That had gotten past him. Aridatha made a joke of it. We'll know him when he gets here. People will start dying. Ha! Huh. And one more out of charity. Ha! Huh. Mogaba replied. In the meantime, we need to make a decision about our guests. We'll have a lot of trouble keeping them under control, especially the wizard, Goblin, who insists on being addressed as the Kadidas. He did help cow the mob when we had the girl pretend she was the protector, but he has no interest in our cause. He'll devour us the instant he stops seeing us as valuable to his cause which is bringing on the end of the world. Neither of the Singhs responded. Each understood that there was more to the great general's words than he was actually saying. That something particularly delicate would come up had been evident from the moment it had become clear that no one else would participate in the meeting. I'm thinking we should get rid of him. Right now, before he gets too comfortable and sure of himself. And the Daughter of Night... Aridatha asked. She's not much threat on her own, meaning the Daughter of Night could be spared, if that was what Aridatha wanted. Though my guess is she's too set in her ways to be redeemed. Aridatha's coloring went pale enough to betray his embarrassment. That isn't what I had in mind. Gopal came to his rescue, inadvertently having failed to catch the unspoken. How do we get close enough to do anything? She'll make us love her so much we'll want to chop off our own toes. There must be ways around that. I'd be happy to hear suggestions. Well, it's obvious she can't do it all the time, whenever she wants, or Aridatha couldn't have caught her. Unless she wanted to be caught. Mogaba feared there might be something to that suggestion. And that power doesn't work on weapons or poisons. Sorcery might be a possibility, Gopal suggested. You think anyone knows either of their true names? Mogaba shook his head. I don't think even our enemies could do much there. The girl hasn't had any name but the Daughter of Night. The goblin thing is two creatures in one, with the Kina side ruling. The man who knew the goblin side's secrets is dead, so we can focus on treachery and poison right away. I don't want to harp, Aridatha said, but I do have to remind everybody that the girl's parents aren't that far away, and right now our prospects don't look that great. Mogaba suspected that to be a subtle invitation to discuss his plans. He did not accept. He did not accept because these days he no longer had any grand plan. He believed his days were numbered, as some of the graffiti insisted. All their days are numbered but the things that made him Mogaba, positive and negative, compelled him to struggle on. Chapter 101 Beside the Cemetery Plans Lady had been preoccupied since our visit to Shivetya's fortress, more than usual. A couple of times I walked in on her while she was practicing her sorcery. I did not ask. The answer was plain. Her ability to steal Kina's power had returned full strength just when the Kadidas had come forward to take control of Goblin. Lady had herself locked down, under rigid control. Being someone who has crawled all over her for years, I knew she was battling hope. She was addicted to the power. She had given it up, not entirely of her own volition, to prevent that old horror, her first husband, the Dominator, from resurrecting himself. Then she had gone away with me, knowing there was no way she could survive powerless in the world she had created. But she remembered being the lady, and as years fled by she missed that more and more. And I think she missed that most when misfortune led her to a close encounter with a mirror. A personable Dejagarin youngster we knew as Milos Sedona made the rounds, summoning the insiders to join Tobo and the captain. 
The kid was only about 16, but had charmed himself into a job as Sleepy's personal gopher. A smile and a winning personality is worth more than genius and sour most any day. I thought well of Sedona myself. He had remembered to invite me to the party. The camp was in turmoil. Sleepy had ordered preparations for movement toward Taglios. Those with the necessary expertise were producing parts for artillery pieces or siege engines to be assembled once we reached the fighting zone. Those without expertise were doing the donkey work. I wondered why Sleepy was having the work done when we did not yet know if we would need the equipment. I expect she just wanted everyone kept busy. Can a bird sneer or smirk? The white crow observed from the arm of an incomplete mobile stone thrower. In my eye, it seemed to do both. Long flight for you, eh? You just get in. The bird jumped, but did not fly away. Be good, I told it. I know who you are, and I know where you live. Crow laughter, a little strained. Soldiers who remembered when crows were plentiful and dangerous paused to stare. The crow winged it toward the cemetery. I grumbled, I do believe our old pal Shevetya is hedging his bets. The day was chilly, but the sky was clear. The captain seemed to think a meeting out in the fresh air would be good for everybody. I slipped around behind her headquarters tent. Tobo spoke first. The great general and his henchmen plan to keep fighting, despite our advantages. Both generals Singh think it would be better to recognize the Prabrindra Dra and save Taglios the damage from heavy fighting. But loyalty is a matter of pride and honor for them, too. And the great general isn't the protector. They consider him their friend. As long as he's still standing, I'm afraid they're going to stick with him. No surprise there. Not to mention that Gopal Singh did not have much choice. As director of the Greys, he had no friends outside the present establishment. He had committed himself to the protectorate, not to Taglios. Aridatha, on the other hand, and despite his participation in the recent fighting, could be considered apolitical and committed to Taglios. The job he had done was the same job that would have been demanded of him by anyone who happened to be in power. That was the consensus. Maybe we were just making excuses. Everybody who met Aridatha liked the guy and wished him good fortune. Enough of that, Sleepy snapped. The man's a paragon, the sort we all want our daughters to marry. Fine. Tobo, get on with it. Last night the generals decided to destroy the Kadidas. He and the Daughter of Night can't read minds, but they did sense trouble. They broke out of their cells which means one of them has more power than they've been showing. They're hiding somewhere in the abandoned part of the palace. The greys and the palace guard haven't found them yet. The Kadidas did something that distorted reality around them. Even the hidden folk lost them. They haven't been able to find them again. Not long after their disappearance, somebody raided the kitchen. They stole a lot of food. Then somebody broke into the offices of the Inspector General of the Records and stole a shitload of paper and ink. Mergen blurted, They're going to reconstruct the books of the dead. This was the first real emotion he had shown since Sara's disappearance. Evidently, Sleepy said, not something they can accomplish quickly, but something they'll manage eventually, if we don't interfere, and we are going to interfere. Tonight, the whole bunch of you are going to fly to Taglios. You're going to pull the same stunt you did in Jaikur, using all the power you have available. I want you to capture Gopal Singh and the great general. Capture the girl and goblin. Put Aridatha Singh in charge, then hunker down. I'll start the army moving tomorrow. As soon as we're past the city gate, I'll send for the Prabrindra Dra. I tried to exchange glances with everyone anyone around me. Nobody seemed interested. They all seemed embarrassed, or something. Like maybe they thought Sleepy had turned simple-minded, but it was up to somebody else to point that out to her. I would bet you saw a lot of that around Mogaba, and a whole lot more around Soul Catcher before her forced retirement. It shall be done, Sleepy's proud new chief of staff intoned. Though he spoke Taglian, that formula hailed from the land of unknown shadows. 
I miss one eye. One eye, or goblin in his time, would have given that officious little asshole a mystic hot foot on the spot. Or maybe a case of fleas the size of tumblebugs. Those were the days, except that those guys had not always gotten it right. They had screwed up and gotten me a few times, too. There was a brief debate about whether or not to include the older Varoshk in the raid, the implication being that Tobo might not have what it took to keep an eye on so many people of dubious loyalty. Arcana appeared to have become one of us, but we did not yet know that. Arcana was the one who had advised Magadan to do whatever it took. Our hold on the Howler was weaker now, too. The little sorcerer had become almost invisible since he no longer announced himself every few minutes. The senior Varoshk, of course, were trustworthy only until they figured out a way to mess us over. If that long, they did not seem much smarter than Gromoval had been. I said only... Don't get overconfident because everything's gone our way so far. Not only sleepy, but most of the others turned studiedly blank faces my way. There are plenty of chances to stumble still ahead of us. No doubt I would get an argument, but I thought our path had run fairly straight and smooth lately. We might be just hours from our final accounting with the traitor Mogaba, and only minutes longer from collecting Bubu and extinguishing the hope of the deceivers. Events had had a ponderous inevitability almost since our first scares in the land of unknown shadows. What? But the question had been directed at Tobo, not me, by a startled sleepy. We can't leave till after midnight. Lady is going to walk me through a raising of the dead so we can find out what happened to Mom. Sleepy wanted to argue, but instantly understood that this was a battle she could not win. Tobo would do this thing Tobo's way, with Mergen's blessing, and it was not good to squabble in front of the troops. Don't take all night. Chapter 102 The Palace Better Housekeeping The great general picked up a snail shell, considered it. More of these things around here all the time, but nobody ever sees a live one. Gopal said, I'd bear down on my household staff if this was my place. A distant crash echoed through the hallways. Greys and guards had begun demolishing walls at random to make it more difficult for the deceivers to hide. And in areas they felt confident were clear, they had masons sealing doorways and walling off entire hallways. Additionally, several self-anointed psychics and ghost hunters had joined the hunt. Mogaba said, you're probably right. He gestured to one of several young men who had been trailing them. That fellow snapped a slight bow and disappeared. Before long, every domestic in the palace was involved in a massive housekeeping campaign. Mogaba observed, We can't have this place looking a mess when our enemies get here. A messenger huffed and puffed into the presence. The search had stumbled onto some corpses from long ago. Three men wearing nothing but loincloths. They appeared to have gotten lost in the maze of the palace, but had perished of wounds suffered earlier. The searchers were troubled because the corpses had not suffered much from vermin or normal putrefaction. Don't do anything with them, Mogaba said. Don't even touch them. Just seal them up where they are. He told Gopal, those would be some of the deceivers who tried to assassinate the Liberator and the Radisha when you were still wearing diapers. He sighed. No matter what we do to hurry this, it's going to take an age. They do have to eat. Eventually, yes. We'll guard the kitchens at all times. And, he said aloud to no one, because these days it was more secure to communicate by passing notes, any food easily reached during quiet hours would be poisoned. Keep at it here, Gopal, day and night. Use as many people as we can spare. The great general expected his enemies to come for him, and he was making preparations to welcome them. Mogaba withdrew to his own quarters. There he invested an hour in one of his hobbies before he moved on to the protector's quarters to nap. He used her apartment now because no one ever went there. No one but the great general dared. 
No one but the great general could pass through the warding spells the protector had left in place. It had become his sanctuary. Mogaba's scouts and spies had reported that Croker and all his mob had rejoined the company, back from wherever they had gone, with even more tools of deviltry. The crisis could come any time now. Chapter 103 Beside the Cemetery Search for a Lost Soul I had been in the neighborhood of necromantic activities before and other high-order divining, but never any closer than I got that night. I do not plan to get that close again. If my honey wants somebody handy to save her sweet butt when she gets in trouble, I will tie a long rope to her ankle and attach the other end to a horse. If something goes sour, I will swat the horse's butt. This seance did not go well, and before it was over, I got a much uglier vision of that place of bones that had claimed so many of the dreams of Mergen and my beloved. The smell was bad, but the cold was worse. I have never felt such cold. I roasted myself beside a bonfire for hours after the summoning was over, but mortal flames did little to defeat that bitter chill. It was so bad we did not undertake the captain's raid that night, or even the next, and when we did, we went only because Her Highness began wondering publicly if us slackers were waiting for summer weather. Mergen, Sleepy, and I were present at the summoning. No one else was invited, not even Shukrat or Sovereign or any of Sara's friends, and it started going bad right away. Right after Lady raised a hand to massage her right temple— Soon afterward, I began to catch fleeting, random impressions of things that were not there. The cold came first, then the smell. Before I saw anything, there were several moments when my balance became very iffy. Lady grew more and more excited as things continued to refuse to go the way she wanted. She started over twice, and when she finally did storm ahead, she did not get where she wanted to go. Eventually, she gave up but not before the rest of us had gotten a good strong whiff of Kina's charnel dreams. I'm sorry, Lady told Tobo. Kina keeps trying to get at me through our connection. The more power I siphon from her, the more easily she can touch me. Not good. We could have Lady turn kick-ass powerful, and be enthralled to the goddess when she did. She seemed to read my mind. She gave me a dirty look. The bitch isn't going to get a hold on me. I considered reminding her of whom we were speaking, the mother of deceit. Kina did not need control where she could manipulate, and she could manipulate whole populations in her sleep. Instead, I asked, Did we find out anything about Sara? Lady's temper was not improving. Certainly not what we would have if that old devil sow hadn't decided to wreck our game. Her mind had been affected somehow. She seemed almost drunk. We couldn't raise Sarah, couldn't even touch her, which leaves the matter's resolution ambiguous. Her speech continued slurred. She was aware of it, yet she persisted in trying to use difficult words. I think she's dead. If she was alive, Tobo and the Hidden Folk would have found her. Nothing hides from the Black Hounds for long. Soldiers live, I whispered. It ain't right, something like that happening. But fortune does not care, unless fortune gets a laugh out of human pain. There has to be more meaning. You going mystical on us at this late date, Croker? Sleepy snapped. You're the one who always says nothing has any meaning we don't put into it ourselves. Sure as shit sounds like me, don't it? Let's go work out our frustrations by kicking Mogaba's antique ass. Sleepy gave us the once-over, unwilling to send us out while we were in so bleak a mood. We might be dangerous to ourselves. She was no happier with us later. We did not improve, any of us. Finally, she swallowed her reservations and told us to go. Howler had completed a large carpet capable of moving twenty passengers. Tonight it carried sixteen of those, plus freight. 
Amongst the sixteen were both Elder Varoshk, a number of commando-trained soldiers from Sien, and Mergen. Mergen had been zombie-like since Lady's failed ritual. He had overheard her saying she thought Sara was dead. I had urged him to stay behind, but he insisted on joining us. I should have stood fast. He could not help but be a liability. Tobo was less distracted. He was too involved with Shukrat to be obsessed about his mother being missing. Still, he would bear watching. Lady and I dressed up in full costume, with Voroshk apparel over the black Widowmaker and Lifetaker armor. My two ravens tagged along. Arcana flew with us, being tested, which she understood fully. Down below, dark things were on the move. They had been since nightfall. Taglios never sleeps. Tonight, those with reasons to be out after dark would have cause to worry about what might be lurking in the shadows. A Mogaba, look out. Darkness always comes. We were still climbing away from camp when I eased over next to Lady. We flew knee to knee, our Varoshka apparel whipping in the breeze for twenty yards behind us. First we discussed which of our companions needed watching the closest, then we revisited the failed attempt to contact Sara's spirit. For the twentieth time, Lady insisted, I do believe she's out there, just as desperate to make contact with us as we were to make contact with her but the ugly goddess wants to keep us apart. Is Kina awake? More than she has been for a long, long time. At least since Goblin went down there. Maybe since the days when she sensed her doom afoot and commenced her war on us ere ever we entered this country. Ere ever? Wow. I have a question on another subject. It's been bothering me for a long time, but I've never quite been able to put the words together right. Artist, power junkie. What's your question, old style? What happened to Soul Catcher's shadows? Lady looked at me blankly. Come on, the old brain can't have slowed down that much. She was an accomplished shadow master. She didn't have a lot of shadows left because Tobo's pets kept picking them off. She stopped trying to use them against us, but she still had some hidden away somewhere, saved for a rainy day. Lady growled. It couldn't have gotten any stormier than it did. But she was not arguing. She had her mind wrapped around the question. My bet is that the unknown shadows finished them all off. There aren't any killer shadows left. If there were, we'd still be hearing reports of unexplained deaths. Maybe. Probably. If they were out there anywhere, the excitement the shadows would cause would be much greater than the numbers justified. The peoples of the Taglian territories had a long history of suffering from killer shadows. Even so, I moved up until I was flying hip to hip with Tobo, an eventuality Shukrat found distasteful. She drifted away, rather haughtily adolescent, I thought. I don't plan to take over your life, I told the boy about my concerns. He seemed to agree that they were valid. I'll find out if there's any reason to worry. I fell back until I rejoined Lady. She asked, What did he say? He'll check it out. You don't sound real happy about that. He said it the way you do when you agree with somebody just so you don't have to spend time with them fussing over something that doesn't bother you. Chapter 104 Taglios View from the Protector's Window Mogaba's eyelids kept getting heavier. Twice he drifted off completely, to start awake violently, disturbed once by some clamor in the city, once by shouting down below that suggested the guards might have glimpsed the Kadidas. It was the wee hours of the morning, when even the heartbeat of the world had trouble thumping on. They were not going to come tonight. They had not come last night, nor the night before. Maybe they were waiting for a larger moon. Something dark blurred the glass in the window whence the great general watched his own quarters and the best part of the palace's northern face, including all the significant entrances. He did not even breathe. 
The unknown shadows could not find a way past the glass and the protector's permanent wards. Mogaba resumed breathing. Slowly, invisible in the deep darkness of the room, he rose and glided nearer the glass so that he would have a broader view. They had come. Not when he had expected, but exactly where. The same place their messengers had come every time. That same turret top. He felt no particular elation. What he felt, in fact, was sorrow. All their lives, his and theirs, had come to no more than this. For a moment there was even the temptation to shout a warning, to cry out that that prideful fool who had made such a stupid choice in De Jagere so long ago had not meant any of them to come to this. But no, it was too late. Fortune's die was cast. The cruel game had to be played to its end, no matter what anyone wanted. Chapter 105 The Palace The Great General's Place Lady led the way, grim as ever when she donned the life-taker persona. I was not pleased. Someone with more power ought to have been first down the stair. But Tobo was sure he needed to go last, otherwise the Howler and the Varoshk might not feel motivated enough to participate. And Howler would not go first, because he had to manage his carpet until everybody was off. The stair was crowded. No one wanted to be there in that darkness, though only Lady, Mergen, and I were old enough to remember when darkness was our determined foe. I tried to stay close to Lady, my foolish mind somehow afflicted with the notion that I had to protect her. There went a joke of cosmic proportion. We made it down the stairwell without mishap, and despite a horrendous racket, without causing any alarm. Lady murmured, Mogaba must be sleeping the sleep of the innocent. All that noise should have raised the dead. Huh? His quarters are straight ahead. I knew that. We had rehearsed this raid before we left, in a half ass sort of way, which means not thoroughly enough to satisfy me. He's a heavy sleeper, I said. That was one of the few knocks against him before his defection. That and an intensity even his brother Nar had found oppressive. But I was speaking to the night. She was pulling ahead. Someone generated a light, a feeble glowball that drifted above our heads. It had an alien feel, so I assume one of the Vorosk was responsible. As the light grew, so did a sense of relaxation, of confidence. Maybe one of those cranky old men was not as dim as he let on. The light is my familiar, someone murmured in one of the dialects of Sien. The phrase possessed the rhythm of ritual. Later I would learn that it was part of an incantation meant to repel the unknown shadows, those being disliked by everyone but Tobo. The hidden realm was there, too, all around us, and so troubled that even I could feel it. Tobo whispered, There's something strange here. I had hundreds of the hidden folk put into the palace, but none of them are reporting. As far as I can tell, they aren't here anymore. He whispered to the creepy darkness. Things unseen moved around us, jostling us from directions we were not looking. Some of the stress oppressing me went away. Lady beckoned soldiers forward. It was time to break into Mogaba's quarters, though that implies more force than was needed. His door was not locked, nor had it ever been before, according to Lady. She and Shukrat took point. They knew their ways around, unless clever Mogaba had rearranged his furniture. Soldiers followed. The Varoshk and Howler crept inside. Mergen followed them. Lady and Shukrat began to argue sharply, in whispers, about who should find a lamp. Somebody stumbled into somebody else. Somebody fell down. Another somebody crashed into something. Then somebody else stated categorically, Oh, shit. Arcana was just sliding into the room, a step ahead of me, when Tobo echoed those sentiments from behind me. He started to push. Out of the way, damn it! A huge crash of breaking pottery. I had not known that Mogaba was a collector, though there were some marvelous craftsmen in this part of the world. A man screamed. 
Before his lungs were empty, other screams joined his, and fireballs leapt from small projectors, and I knew why so many men were screaming and why they were so panicky they were blowing holes through one another. Shadows. The old evil. Killer shadows. Deadly shadows off the glittering plain. Shadows, the exploitation of which had given the Shadow Masters their name. Shadows of the sort Soul Catcher had used to prop up her protectorate until the coming of Tobo's allies from the land of unknown shadows. I had the answer to the question I had addressed to Lady and Tobo. People panicked completely. Fireballs flew everywhere, caused far more carnage than mere starving mad shadows. One of those ripped through my Voroshk cloak. The cloak seemed to whine, but pulled itself together around me. A shadow hit me. My apparel repelled it, a fact I did not fail to note despite the rising chaos. It also shed the next fireball that found me. I saw Lady hit several times, rapidly. I saw one of the Varoshk succumb to shadows. I tried to bellow into the madness to calm them down, but the panic had them all. Even Howler and Lady caught it. But Shukrat did keep her wits about her. She crouched in a corner and let her cloak form a barrier impervious to fireballs and shadows alike. Men fought to get out the door. Howler loosed a spell that flashed so brightly it blinded everyone not in Varosh protective clothing, including the little sorcerer himself. His effort did not avail. A moment later he screamed with more enthusiasm than ever he had before his cure. Get out of my way, Tobo bellowed. He hurled me aside. His father was inside that room. Before I regained my feet, the tower was creaking under the psychic mass of Tobo's unseen friends. Their battle with the invisible killers was brief but belated, and probably needless because the fireballs ate shadows alive. Unknown shadows as well as the traditional lurkers in darkness. I did not know if I wanted to get off the floor. It was very still in that other room now, except for Arcana crying. But I had to get up. We had to get moving. The rest of the palace was not silent any more. An alarm had been sounded. People with sharp instruments would be coming to get us. It was impossible to tell who was dead, who was dying, and who was only mildly injured. For a while it was too dark. I got Tobo to provide another light. Then I started getting the fallen moved back to the tower top. Arcana and Shukrat and Tobo's hidden allies kept the palace guard at bay. I kept my emotions turned off while I lugged bodies. At the moment, I could not afford to indulge. How are we going to get these posts and the carpet out of here? I demanded. Lady, both of the elder Voroshk, Howler, Mergen, were all out of action. So were most of the commandos. Shukrat and I can handle the carpet. You and Arcana will have to tow the posts. You hear that, new daughter? Minutes earlier, I had been about to slap the girl around to crack her shock. But she had solid stuff inside her. She was dragging the dead and injured now, calmer than most of the others. I know. I'll need something to use for tethers. Find it fast. I'll lug bodies. A crossbow bolt buzzed past without doing any harm. An instant later, the section of wall whence it had come was shattered rock and boiling flame. Tobo was not in a kindly mood. I told Arcana, You get those posts out of here right now, all but mine. She had gotten some rope from aboard the carpet. Good girl, Arcana. She got busy. Like Shukrat, she focused on the task at hand. Funny, I thought, how the company seemed to attract good women. The palace guards and a surprising number of greys responded to the alarm, and they refused to be intimidated by Tobo's violence and by Tobo's half-seen friends. Brave men, they. There are always brave and honorable men amongst one's enemies. Missiles filled the air. A few found targets. I began to wonder if this would not be a good time to reconsider my lifelong determination never to leave company people behind but I was incapable of leaving without my wife. 
and I needed the old Varoshk, even if they were dead. Chapter 106 The Palace View from a High Place Mogaba felt no elation as he watched the disaster unfold. In fact, he became more troubled. He could see that there would be survivors. Those people were still strong enough to hold off the guards and greys while they evacuated their casualties. That meant that unless he enjoyed a gargantuan turn of luck, and they were all killed by missiles before they could get away, he still faced a final battle. He had no tricks left in his bag. The shadows had not been completely effective, which proved what he had suspected for some time. The enemy had a similar force at his disposal, and that force had responded in time to save some of the raiders. He watched crossbow bolts, arrows, and even javelins bounce off the creatures in the great seething black cloaks. Only one of those people got hurt. A fireball's flare, as the big carpet backed away from the parapet, gave just enough light for Mogaba to distinguish the life-taker armor. Lady, he murmured, awed. That same flash must have reflected off his eyeballs or teeth, betraying him somehow, because when he glanced at the post-riders, he found the one in the Widowmaker armor hurling straight at him, black cape expanding to shut out the sky. Chapter 107 Taglios Soldiers Live I saw Mogaba behind the window, Rage devoured me. I drove straight at him, accelerating, and even as I did, some tiny remnant of my rationality wondered if what I had glimpsed was real, not my mind seeing what it wanted because I needed somebody else to hurt as much as I had begun to do. If the Mogaba I saw was my own creation, it vanished before I smashed into the window glazing. The glass did not break. It did not yield at all. My post stopped dead. I did not. The post rebounded. I smacked into the glass. Then I bounced back and fell. I had time for one very enthusiastic howl before I reached the end of my tether. Then I was flailing around ten feet below my post. The post kept driving forward, kept rebounding. I tried to climb back up, but could get nowhere with only one reliable hand. The motion of the post got me swinging like the weight on a pendulum. One end of each swing brought me into intimate contact with the palace wall. The Varoshk cloak protected me well, but unconsciousness eventually came. I was still dangling when I recovered. The ground was only a few yards below and moving slowly. I seemed to be flying along above the rock road, barely clearing the heads of travelers. I tried twisting so I could look up, but could not manage. The tether was attached to me in the back, just above my waist. I did not have strength enough to twist around. I did have a bit of pain when I struggled. I lost consciousness again. I was back in mankind's natural state, on the ground, when I wakened again. A pointy hunk of chert was trying to gouge a hole through my back, Somebody said something in one of the dialects of Sien, then repeated himself in bad Taglian. Arcana materialized overhead, face somber. You going to live, Pop? All the aches and pains I've got, it's a sure thing. What happened? You did something stupid. What else is new? A second voice demanded. Sleepy's face materialized opposite Arcana. How soon you going to get off your back? Part time. I need some help. This disaster show you guys engineered is about to put us out of business. Be right with you, boss. Soon as I get my leg bones unbraided and my feet hooked back onto my ankles. The effort of trying to get up because I wanted to find my wife pushed me over into the darkness again. Rain in my face wakened me the next time. My physical pains had turned to dull aches. They had gotten something into me. Cataloging, I decided I had a lot of bruises, but nothing was broken or permanently damaged. Just when I started to make an effort to get up, 
I floated upward. After a momentary panic, I realized that I was on a litter, being moved in out of the rain. Being lifted onto the litter was what had interrupted my sleep, not those first few misty raindrops. I got a better grip this time. I remained rational when Sleepy turned up. How's my wife? I asked, with only a small squeak in my voice. She's still alive, but her situation isn't good, though it's better than it would have been if she hadn't been wearing the Varoshk outfit. I'd guess she might recover, if we can get Tobo to stay focused long enough to help. I heard the unspecified offer of a job assignment in there somewhere. What's the kid's problem? His father got killed. Where were you? I grunted. I was afraid of that. Maybe I had tried to shut it out. It was going to hurt. Sleepy seemed to think we did not have time for pain. I had begun to trust her instincts. You had it right, Croker. Soldiers live. Only three people got out of that scrape unhurt. Tobo, Arcana, and a very lucky soldier named Tom Dolin. Howler, the first father, Nashun, the researcher, Mergen, and all the other soldiers didn't. The rest of you are hurt. Tobo feels guilty. He thinks he should have done more. He thinks he should have realized it was a trap. I understand. What about Shukrat? Bruises and abrasions and emotional distress. The Varoshk clothing took good care of her. It knew her so well it adapted faster than ladies could, as I understand it. Mergen could have worn Varoshk protection, but he had refused. Damn him. There had not been much fight in him since Sara's disappearance. I want you to straighten Tobo out. We need him back. We need the unknown shadows. If I was in Mogaba's boots, I'd have another attack force headed our way already. I don't think so. The man doesn't wait around, Croker. His gospel is seize the initiative. I could only make an ass of myself arguing with a woman who had fought the great general more years than I had known him, who had lived in Taglios for as many years as I had much more recently. Evidently I was just another cranky old man raising a fuss for the attention, except when she needed something. Then we'd better arrange for it to get really dangerous for him personally if anything happens to any of us. I felt stupid before I finished saying that. For Mogaba, there was little chance life would ever be more dangerous than it was already. I had forgotten an early lesson. Try to reason like the enemy. Study him until you can think just like him. Until you can become him. Sleepy told me, You need to find yourself an apprentice, too, if you're going to keep getting involved in lethal stuff. At your age, was implied until the captain actually said, You're too long in the tooth to be out there right where it's happening. It's time you eased up and started passing your secrets along. Sleepy went away, leaving me wondering, Who was I supposed to tap? I was inclined to pick her butt boy, Milos Sedona, except that the kid had one huge shortcoming. He was totally illiterate, and I did not have any inclination to put in all the hours needed to alter that condition. Then the man I maybe should have been thinking of turned up on his own, voluntarily. Sovereign, what the hell's gotten into you? You're going to leave us most any day now. So perhaps I've had an epiphany. Maybe I need to learn the annals because I've decided to face my destiny. Is that the fragrance of bullshit wafting on the breeze? Being an old cynic, I thought it was more likely that he thought this would somehow get him laid— but I did not suggest anything. I just accepted him, then groaned upon discovering that Sleepy's wonderfully educated young man neither wrote nor read a single word of Taglian, which has been the language of these annals for the last twenty-five years. Lady's book was the last written in another language, and Mergen had translated and updated that, along with a couple of my own that had not really needed any polish. Think you can learn to read and write Taglian? I asked. You might never need to do either. Unless I want to read the annals, the holy scriptures of the Black Company. Yeah, 
If I go, you'll be on your own unless Sleepy makes time or Lady recovers. I had had time enough now to put together an act of indifference, but I was not convincing anybody. Sovereign stared, waiting for the punchline. There was none, really, except that he ought to make an effort to see that I stayed healthy long enough for him to develop the needed skills. Two days after Sovereign became my understudy, Sleepy stage-managed a ceremony that formalized his appointment as lieutenant of the Black Company and her heir apparent. We were outside that big nameless hilltop stronghold which broods over the rock road approach to Taglios. A large plain had been leveled and prepared as a place where troops could camp or could practice the close-order skills necessary for success in battle, or as a place where forces defending the city could engage an advancing enemy. No one bothered us there, other than small Vedna cavalry bands made up of youths who wanted to show off their courage, but I advised both Sleepy and Sovereign against leaving the stronghold unvanquished behind us. Sleepy was no more interested in advice than ever before, but these days she did pretend to listen. Her own approach to conquest had been a disaster, mitigated only by the fact that a few of us had survived. Chapter 108 Taglios Someone at the Door Upon reflection, after we beat back a relief sortie by troops from Taglios, the commander of the fortress offered to surrender on terms. He wanted paroles for himself and damn near everyone who ever bore arms in the three nearest counties, which was not all that unreasonable, I thought, considering we were going to turn all this over to the Prabrindra Dra as soon as the deal closed and the prince could get his ass up here from Goja. Even after all her years in the real world, Sleepy retained some Vedna notions about right and wrong that had nothing to do with the practicalities of the moment. Even if this Lal Mindrat is the worst human monster since the Shadow Masters themselves, you have to consider what your moral rigidity can cost the rest of us, I told Sleepy. Evidently Lal Mindrat had betrayed some of our allies during the Kialune Wars, I had not heard of him before Sleepy started getting uppity, so it could not have been a major betrayal. A good many friends of the company had been turned by the Protector in those days. Soulcatcher had had the power and wealth. Be flexible, I advised, but treacherous when absolutely necessary. She understood. With some half-ass help from Tobo and his friends, and the appropriate promises of parole and safe passage, Sleepy got our enemies to evacuate the stronghold with no more violence than occurred when Lal Mindrat came out with his lifeguard. Thus, the captain finished her business with a minor traitor from her own era, for the time being. Mogaba made our approach hell, at least for those of us who pulled the recon, picket, and vanguard duties. Horsemen never stopped harassing our forward elements, the Varoshka girls and I went out whenever the enemy's behavior became overly obnoxious. Eventually we reached the great south gate of Taglios, something that had not existed in my time. These days a truly substantial wall stretched into the distance at either hand. The soldiers on the ramparts seemed much too small. The wall reared up like a vast cliff of limestone. Wow, I told Sleepy. There's been some changes made. The entrance to the city was a fortress in itself, outside the wall but attached to it. I could not tell from the ground for sure, but it looked like an equally formidable structure guarded the pass-through from within. Sleepy grunted. Been a few since I was here. Methinks the great general must have inveigled some appropriations out of the protector somehow. They've added several feet to the height of the wall— and that Barbican complex, she shrugged. As I remembered city politics, public works were particularly vulnerable to graft and corrupt practices. Somebody in the treasury offices must have been blowing in the protector's ear. Sleepy grunted again, uninterested in my opinion. She was watching Sovereign spread the troops out facing the city, offering battle. 
No response was expected. No response was what he got. I said, They don't have to be careful of anybody's property, at least. More than the immensity of the wall itself, I was awed by the existence of a thousand-foot-wide band of empty ground lapping the wall's foot. What had it taken to get people moved off that ground? How did the state keep them off? In a few months there'll be grain fields and vegetable patches as far as you can see. That grid of pathways marks the boundaries of the patches. They started that back right after Sara and I first came to the city. Tobo's going to be a busy boy. Sleepy examined our forces, left and right. They did not appear threatening against the backdrop of the wall, nor did anyone atop that wall appear concerned. He will... I expect him and the girls to hit hard with everything they have, right from the start, so people in there will be stunned by the fury of it. Is he going to be able to do it? I can't guarantee you his heart'll be in it. What about you? Is your heart going to be in it? I heaved a huge sigh. Sleepy asked, How is she doing? Another major sigh. Honestly, I'm worried. She just lays there, midway between life and death. She gets no better, she gets no worse. I'm starting to wonder how much the Kina connection has to do with all that. It took a major effort to let that out, because of what the captain might consider if she grasped all the implications, and she began to see some right away. I said, If I can pull Tobo through his grief, he may be able to find out if Kina's gained any control. I dreaded the possibility that the Dark Mother was setting my wife up as an alternate route of escape from her ancient prison. I could imagine a scenario wherein I struck the sleeping goddess and freed Chivetya, only to see the darkness return through the woman I love. Not that it would take the Mother of Night to accomplish that. She was entirely willing to welcome in her own breed of darkness. Aren't we all? The captain said, I haven't heard a direct answer. Can I count on you to actually pay attention when the arrows start to fly? An old, old formula came to mind from back when I was very young indeed. I am a soldier. I said it first in the language I had spoken then, then repeated myself in Sleepy's own De Jaggeran dialect. I've been distracted before. I'm still alive. Yeah, soldiers live. You only get one mistake, Croker. Go teach your granny to suck eggs. Which was a waste of colorful language. The expression had no meaning amongst these peoples. What's that? Sleepy asked, pointing at something rising above the city. Looks like a big-ass kite. Chapter 109 Taglios No Excuses Accepted Damn it. No matter how much I wanted it, Mogaba refused to be stupid. Facing potential problems with an infestation of airborne wizards, take advantage of the season's almost constant winds, put up about ten thousand giant box kites with poisoned sharp things hanging on tails made of braided fibers almost too tough to cut. There would be no zooming about with youthful exuberance over Taglios, especially not after dark. Those kites would not be able to hurt us in our Varoshk clothing, but they could entangle us and knock us off our posts, whereupon whoever lost their seat would need someone else to come along and bring them out, unless... Shukrat once fixed me up with a post that would travel on its own when its master could not manage it. I issued an order. Just hours later, Shukrat's post brought the girl herself back virtually mummified in cord and deadly sharps that took hours to overcome. But she had cleaned away scores of kites. I made Tobo untangle her. I was having a real problem getting him engaged with life, but Shukrat was supposed to be important to him. She certainly thought so. Once he finished freeing her, too slowly to suit her, she popped him in the middle of the forehead with the heel of her right hand. How about you at least pretend to be interested, Tobe? And moments later, you're making me wonder just how bright I am. Tobo was a real young man, 
He started to protest. I tried to warn him by shaking my head. No way was he going to break even here. Shukrat cut him off, unwilling to grant him the validity of any excuse. After that, I tried not to hear what they were saying. I mused on Shukrat's swift, nearly effortless grasp of Taglian. She had almost no accent at all now, and she appeared equally adaptable regarding strange customs. Arcana was having more difficulty, but she was coming along marvelously, too. Having allowed the girlfriend time to make her point, I approached Tobo. Tobo, we need to know about what's going on behind those walls. He did not look like he cared much. Shukrat punched him. I told him, You have to let go. He gave me one ugly look. You have to let go of the guilt. It wasn't your fault. I doubted that telling him would do any good. These things never are rational. Your mind goes on chasing the irrational even when it knows the truth. If Tobo wanted to feel guilty about his mother and father, he would find ways to do that in the face of every argument, of any bit of evidence, and of all the common sense in the universe. I know. I have suffered through that bleak season a few times myself. I had a little of it going right then, featuring my wife. Shukrat said, the great general did it, Tobe, the Taglian supreme commander, and he's inside those same walls. There you go, girl. Appeal to the darkness within, to the stores of rage and hatred. We really needed to get those emotions cooking inside the most powerful sorcerer left in this part of the world. Chapter 110 Taglios Misfortunes the unknown shadows told Tobo that Mogaba and his cronies were hunkered down, waiting us out. They thought we might begin to fade away before long, despite our wealth. They could be right. Though Sleepy had plenty of treasure left, many of the soldiers from Sien had signed on for only one year in the field. I did not doubt that many would stay as long as their pay was on time, but I did not doubt either that homesickness would begin to bleed us too. We cleared away kites faster than Mogaba could put new ones up. We made a few high-altitude raids each night. We dropped firepots on the properties of known allies of the Protector, the Great General, and the Greys. But fire is a cruel and unruly ally. Some that we started spread way beyond their targets. Even more smoke than usual clung to the city. A second midnight approach to the occupied portion of the palace provided us with some distinctly unwelcome news. We learned that Mogaba's efforts to seize our encampment beside the Shadowlander Cemetery, while tactically disastrous for his loyalists, had not been entirely unprofitable. Sleepy's chief of staff decided he needed a first-hand look at the palace, for planning purposes. He was a thorough man— at Sleepy's urging, he and other selected folk had been getting training using the Varoshk flying posts. We had seven available, with only five regularly assigned, and Lady was not using hers these days. Sleepy hated seeing resources going to waste, Sleepy being Sleepy. The chief of staff had Milos Sedona join us. Milos was the most competent of the part-time flyers, though his only excuse for getting the opportunity was that the captain liked him and wanted his observations. No way was she going aloft herself. I went along to make sure those two had somebody to bail them out if they got in trouble. I made them wear Voroshka apparel, too. If we were seen, we could expect missile fire. Mogaba's people never gave up trying." You just need one lucky break. Milos Sedona had not yet realized that he was not immortal. He ventured too close to the enemy. Then we all learned how Mogaba had profited from disaster. A fireball ripped through the darkness. The boy escaped the worst of it by hurling himself to one side. The fireball struck him a glancing blow, which, however, was enough to knock him off his post. General Chu ignored my shout and went after Sedona, and actually managed to get close enough to get a hold on his post, as fireballs streaked in from half a dozen sources. One struck Chu's post dead solid. 
the explosion of that post was violent enough to set off the other, and the two in concert were violent enough to smash in an acre of palace like an invisible giant's foot stomping on eggshells. More palace continued to cave in around the initial collapse. A wicked wind flung me around like a rogue dandelion seed. Once again I lost my grip and fell off my steed. While dangling I caught rolling glimpses of flames beginning to peek through cracks in the rubble, of panic beginning to prowl amongst the soldiers atop the palace. Chapter 111 Taglios Sleepy Flu We're going to start strapping you down, Pop, Arcana told me as she towed me into camp. She had been on a routine patrol kite-clearing when the explosion happened. In rushing to see the results, she almost got knocked out of the sky by a daredevil swinging from a flying fence post. Just get me down, fast, preferably right in front of the captain's tent. Sleepy had to know, now, and somebody needed to go watch the palace. If the whole damned thing caved in, if Mogaba and his henchmen died in the disaster, if the Kadidas and the Daughter of Night escaped in the resulting chaos. Some hearty fires were burning over there now. A strong glow silhouetted the city wall now. I kept having to explain as more notables reached the captain's tent, and I kept urging Sleepy to make whatever move she was considering making right away. Never again would the other side be as confused and disordered as they must be now. She agreed, but pointed out that our bunch were not terribly well organized right now, either. The captain dealt with the problem of interruptions in the most amazing fashion I could imagine. After delegating Sovereign to begin preparing an attack, she told me, Take me up there. Show me what's happened. You? Me. I'll keep my eyes closed until there's something to see. Before we leave, I'll throw an old blanket over my seat so I won't get your post all wet. I shook my head, disconsolate. I wish Swan was still around. A straight line like that shouldn't go to waste. Let's do it. Wait. Sovereign. She issued more instructions so he would have something to do in his spare time. Her absence would slow nothing down. Tie yourself on good, I told Sleepy. I might decide to do a few loops while we're up there. She growled like a whole pack of angry rats, made it clear that if she fell off, I might as well just keep on going. All right, but coming home hanging underneath like a carp on a stringer is a lot better than the alternative. If you don't mind a little embarrassment... I don't mind at all if I'm alive to get red in the face. Something you learn as you get older, or at least you should. We were passing over the gateway complex when I realized that I had gone right back up without having paused to check on my wife. Was I not a little old to feel guilty about everything? She would not be going anywhere any time soon. It was not possible to get dangerously close to the palace, the fires were huge now. The heat was intense, even through the Varoshk clothing, and the higher you flew, the more turbulent the air became. There were no kites anywhere nearby anymore. I figured Mogaba would give up on the kites soon. They were not doing us any harm. Sleepy clung to the post with white knuckles. I wondered if we would need a chisel to break her grip once we got back on the ground. But she did manage to keep her voice sounding normal. What in the world is burning? That place isn't anything but a big old stone pile. The flames were not limited to the palace now. Several fires were burning nearby. The entire area was crawling with people, most being gawkers who just got in the way of the soldiers, officials, and volunteers actually trying to accomplish something. Somebody's still thinking, I told Sleepy. They've put troops around the place. I dropped lower and moved close enough to spot Aridatha Singh outworking two thin lines of soldiers, one facing outward, holding the mobs back, the other, stronger, facing inward. The latter were more heavily armed. Anyone leaving the palace was going to get a good, hard look. 
I hope they got those guys in place before the Katidas and the girl got away. Back to the gate. If we're ever going to invade this city, now is the time. You found enough boats yet? She tensed up. She did not answer for a moment. You figured it out. Logic suggests that it makes no sense to storm these walls with no more men than we have, particularly when Taglios has almost no defenses on the riverside, a point which would have occurred to the great general, too. There is no easy way in, Sleepy told me. The defenses on the riverside just aren't as obvious. She proceeded to explain about log booms and chains that controlled traffic, forcing it into narrow channels well ranged by massed artillery ashore. A barge loaded with attackers could be pounded into driftwood and fish food in minutes. I said, I see where this is going. Do you really? Will I attack by day or by night? It's dark now, but by the time you can get anybody to the point of attack, the sun will be up. Take me back. I have to get things moving faster. Chapter 112 Taglios Under Siege Gopal Singh looked terrible. He had been close enough to the fire to have had his beard singed. He had blisters on both face and hands. His turban was gone. The rest of him was rags and smoke smell. You'll never pass inspection, Mogaba told him. Singh's sense of humor was moribund. We've got it controlled inside. It'll burn itself out. Out there in the city. Pray for unseasonable rain. Good luck doesn't always work out, does it? Grudgingly, Singh said, No way we could know what would happen if a fireball hit one of those flying things. No, of course not. Here comes Aridatha, like a crow. There'll be more bad news. Mogaba glanced eastward, not even close to dawn yet. Why was this night stretching out so long? You've got a spot of ash on your right trouser leg, Aridatha. The commander of the city battalions actually paused to deal with the matter before he realized that the great general was teasing him, more or less. Aridatha said, They're trying to take advantage of the confusion. I'm getting reports about ghosts and terrors at work around the south gate and the river forts. They're really coming. Gopal Singh could not believe the enemy would assault Taglios with so few soldiers. He had expected them to just sit tight in hopes they could forge alliances with disaffected elements inside the wall. Where? The river, Mogaba predicted. They've had time to scout. That's where we're the weakest. Maybe they just want us to think. They can't get a strong force into place for a while yet. When they attack from the air, we'll know they're on their way and where they think they can get through. Minutes later, word came that enemy commandos were atop the wall, half a mile west of the south gate, ferried there by flying carpet. They were being reinforced rapidly. Neither the city battalions nor the greys had much strength in that area. The bulk of the second territorial was on the waterfront. The garrison of the Barbican was responding to the threat as best it could. Mogaba looked to the east. Once the light came, the enemy would lose the advantage of his unseen allies. Then the city's defenders could exploit their big advantage in numbers. Ten minutes later, news came that swimmers, armed with small fireball projectors, had cut the chains and broken the booms at the upstream end of the city. Firebombs were falling amongst the artillery engines. You were right, Gopal said. It'll be the river. Possibly. Where are their wizards? Mogaba wanted to know. He understood that the post riders need not be sorcerers. If we don't see wizards, we have to remain skeptical about their commitment to any particular attack. All I see now are diversions. Shall we go out there? Aridatha asked. Out where? Would you care to bet that other attacks won't break out sometime soon? This is the best place for us to be. We're central. It had occurred to him that he was being watched, that the captain's plans might hinge on his own behavior. 
Whatever he did might direct enemy efforts where he was not. It was what he would have done, given their resources. We'll stay central. Let's get a tighter cordon around the parts of the palace where the girl might be. That'll let us free up some more of these men. Hundreds had been freed up already, because the gawkers had begun to melt away when fires elsewhere proved too fierce to contain. As soon as there was a specific defense to mount, Mogaba would send reinforcements. News came of fierce aerial attacks on the South Gate complex itself. Massive volleys of fireballs were riddling the stonework with thousands of holes. The sheer profligate expenditure of fireballs awed everyone. That's the point, you know, Mogaba said. This captain is more willing to fight than her predecessors were. But when she does, she ratchets the level of violence as high as she can. She wants to stun her enemies so they'll be too numb to react while she overwhelms them. A glance around told Mogaba that the captain's technique was enjoying some success right here, right now and neither General Singh was eager for a lecture on the subject of combat psychology. So Mogaba just noted, And we'll be at a disadvantage until we know which probe will become the real attack. And that, he suspected, had not yet been determined on the other side either. She could just be trying to figure out where she could get the best return for her investment. They never liked wasting their men, the company captains. At this point, we'll let the district commanders respond to their own crises. We'll reinforce them only to stop a disaster. What I need from you two is regular gauges of the mood of the mob. So far, they don't seem to care, but we wouldn't want any unwelcome surprises. Gopal offered, I'd say the masses favor us. It wasn't us who started all those fires. Mogaba glanced eastward. There was a little color over there, but he felt no elation. Gopal had reminded him of the oppressive amount of work ahead once he suppressed the enemy's attacks. Fires would leave tens of thousands homeless and destitute in a city where a third of the population already enjoyed that distinction. Maybe he should just walk away and leave all the problems to Sleepy. Chapter 113 Taglios. Attack. It became clear to me that Sleepy wanted control of the South Gate itself. She was flinging people and material around everywhere and using up those of us able to fly. But when you did the numbers, over half of our efforts were taking place within a half mile of the Barbican. And the Barbican itself had suffered immensely from above. Parts looked like slag pierced by ten thousand holes. I had better information than Mogaba did, but I knew that the great general would catch on soon enough. He possessed a well-honed instinct for things warlike. How flexible was the captain's planning? Could she shift her point of attack fast once Mogaba did catch on? I did not know. Whatever level of planning had gone into this, I had not been invited to participate. Only Sovereign had a real grasp of the whole picture, and I was not that sure about him. This sleepy was as closed as I used to be when it came to sharing her thoughts. That seemed to go with the job. My predecessors had been the same way. Some day it would hurt us. It was just past noon. Striking suddenly from all directions and enjoying maximum support from above and from Tobo, our troops pushed into the Barbican complex. The defense seemed doomed once the assault teams got inside and got the outer gates open. Mogaba did not respond. The streets near the gate complex did empty as civilians decided this seemed like a good time not to be visible. Bands of Taglian wounded retreated deeper into the city, Still, no one came forward to reinforce or relieve the defenders of the Barbican. Soldiers from Mogaba's own second territorial began saying unkind things about their boss. Something was not right here. Mogaba was way too passive. The man had to know that he had to do something before the night returned and the company waxed far more powerful by grace of the unknown shadows. 
Somehow, we had to be doing what Mogaba wanted us to do if he was doing nothing to prevent us from doing it. Yeah, you can drive yourself crazy trying to work your way around all the angles of that kind of stuff. Sleepy sent everybody but Tobo off to intensify the attack on the upriver waterfront defenses. Evidently, we had gained a good foothold there, cheaply, so the captain wanted to expand it. I had begun to suspect that Sleepy really did have no fixed plan, other than to seize whatever Mogaba was willing to let go. An hour later, when Loyalist troops did respond to the threat on the waterfront, the South Gate again became the focus of our attack. I hoped she decided soon. I was worn out, and we still had hours of daylight left. I was right in the first place. She chose the gate. Back when the men on the walls finally broke into the gatehouses, a signal had gone up to alert the captain and lieutenant. There were two gatehouses, and both had to be cleared. One had proven much more stubborn than the other. In the interim, every man not engaged elsewhere gathered outside, ready to attack. Now Sleepy signaled the advance. The officers all had orders to push through the Barbican and drive straight on to the heart of the city. They had guides to show them the way. The captain wanted the palace captured swiftly. She believed we would face little resistance in the rest of Taglios, once its symbolic heart had fallen. Word was out already that the Prabrindra Dra was on his way, to reclaim his family's dominion. Me, I would have had the prince in my hip pocket first, ready to flash in front of the mob right now. I would have had him lead the charge. But nobody asked me how I would handle things any more. Chapter 114 Taglios Bad News White Crow Mogaba received the news about the South Gate in grim, expressionless silence. He asked no questions, just looked to the west to see how much daylight he had left. He turned to Aridatha and Gopal. The latter nodded slightly. Once a messenger had departed, the great general asked, Are they continuing their attack on the waterfront? Aridatha responded, At last report they were stepping it up. Send another company. Their main force will head straight here, with all their sorceries supporting it. A counterattack down there should have an excellent chance of succeeding. And what should I do about the invaders? Aridatha asked. We've had that set for months. Just follow the plan. Let it unfold. Aridatha nodded, plainly wishing there was some way to reduce the bloodshed. He was less pessimistic about the outcome of this conflict than was the great general. But he feared the price would be so crippling that victory would be the greater evil for the city as a whole. Mogaba told him, I want you to return to your own headquarters now. Continue to direct your troops from there. But if this goes badly and you're here with me when they come, you'll have to pay a crueler price than necessary. Do as I say. Gopal, you take over here. No one goes into the palace. No one comes out. If the enemy gets this far, make sure they know about the Kadidas and the Daughter of Night. I expect you to stay out of the way yourself. The best people to get the information to are the two wearing the fiery armor, Widowmaker and Life Taker. They'll listen to you. They're the girl's natural parents. Aridatha, why are you still standing there? You have your instructions. Gopal asked. What'll you be doing? Readying a pair of counterattacks that'll make these strange foreign soldiers wish that they'd never left the land where they were born. The great general projected immense confidence. He did not feel a bit of it inside. Nevertheless, his stride was that of an arrogant conqueror as he walked away from the palace, a gaggle of messengers and functionaries scurrying behind him. He spun off orders as he went. Mogaba spotted the white crow watching from a cornice stone. He beckoned. Come down here, he patted his shoulder. The bird did as it was bid, startling Mogaba's entourage. 
the great general asked, Are you who I think you are? Chapter 115 Taglios The Special Team There were some tasks too important to entrust to anyone but family. The responsible captains at the South Gate were always related to Gopal Singh, though they were officers in the city battalions. They were all men who dared not be disloyal because their pasts were all tangled up with the Greys, the Great General, and the Protectorate. Also, they were men who were mentally disciplined enough to retreat without running away. They were men who had prepared themselves and their followers for this day, though originally they had expected the Protector herself to be entering their killing zone. Chapter 116 Taglios Outrageous Fortune the passage through the Barbican seemed a maze from inside, though there were only a half-dozen turns. From above it did not look that bad, until huge blocks of stone fell out of the walls, blocking the way ahead of and behind the captain, trapping her, her staff, and another dozen men. The falling blocks initiated a train of mechanical events, the first of which was the launching of a storm of poisoned darts. Horses screamed and men cursed, and as I sent my own flying post downward to try to get the captain out of there, burning oil sprayed from ports in the walls. So this was how they had planned to get rid of Soul Catcher. The heat drove me back. The black Varashk clothing could not stand up to much of that. Sleepy had chosen to place herself in the middle of the invading column, which meant our forces had just been split in two a massive counterattack was sure to develop. I pushed myself up beside Arcana, who was numb with the horror. Get a hold of yourself. I want you to find Sovereign. Tell him I'll take charge on the city side. He can build steps to get the rest of the men past that mess. He can use the lumber meant for siege engines. Go on, get going. Once again, I did not have to whack her to bring her out of her stupor. Once again, Mogaba had dealt us one off the bottom of his deck. This time, our chances of surviving did not look good. We should have been prepared for it. He had told us that there were arrangements in place. Sometimes you just do not hear what is being said. I checked the sun before I reached the ground. We would have to hang on for a bit longer than what inspired me with optimism. It won't be long, I insisted to the commanders on the ground. We need to put ourselves into a position to hang on until nightfall. Once darkness comes, the unknown shadows, the hidden realm, shouts, a scatter of arrows fell. Push a company along the wall that direction, I directed. I want those steps under our control when the others start joining us. I had to show an optimism I did not feel. I hoped Sovereign would press his half of the attack. No man could question the courage of the soldiers from Sien. They mauled the city battalions badly. They mauled reinforcements from the Second Territorial. Unfortunately, the city battalions and Mogaba's Second Territorial elite mauled them right back. It did not take long to see that Sleepy might have taken too big a bite. The great general seemed to have plenty of reserves, though he was parsimonious when it came to investing them. Vigorous support from Arcana, Shukrat, and Tobo kept us from being overwhelmed. Once Tobo woke up enough to begin thinking more than mechanically, the tide began to turn. Once he recalled that he was good for something more than dropping rocks and fire pots, once he added his sorcerous skills to the girl's weaker ones, we got stinging insects, painful worms of fire, lemon and lime snowflakes that pitted armor and flesh. Nevertheless, the enemy kept us confined until darkness came. Darkness always comes. Chapter 117 Taglios Night and the City the great general took charge of the riverfront defenses personally. He found morale abysmal when he arrived, accompanied by reserves from the Second Territorial. 
The long succession of military disasters had the soldiers suspecting that defeat was inevitable and that they were being wasted in a hopeless cause. The great general himself led his own lifeguard in a counterattack of such fury and finesse that the enemy soon lost everything that it had taken them all day to capture. The invaders got no support from above. The great general interpreted that to mean that they were in desperate straits at the south gate. There was not a lot of communication between forces. Nobody knew what anybody else was doing, really. The best anyone could do was cling to the plans and hope the enemy did not get too much enjoyment from his advantages. Mogaba's opponents tried reinforcing themselves with recent recruits. That did them little good. Those men entered the fighting in groups too small to make any difference. The last attackers fled in the barges they had used to make their initial landings, drifting downriver because they did not have enough men healthy enough to row against the current. All the barges were overburdened, one so much so that it shipped water at the slightest rocking. It did not remain afloat long. Mogaba treated himself to a long breather. He turned his mind off completely, closed his eyes, let the cold winter air chill him. When he was calm and breathing normally again, he allowed himself to return to the moment. He could get the best of this thing yet. If he could get these men to the south gate and get in a hard blow, he might damage the enemy enough to earn his own people a fair chance of making it through the night. If he succeeded, victory would be his. They would not be able to survive everything he would throw at them tomorrow. He opened his eyes. The white crow stared at him from a perch on a broken cartwheel scarcely a foot from his face. The crow started talking. That bird was a much better messenger and spy than the crows he had known in earlier days. The great general listened for a long time and wondered if the mind behind the bird was aware of his disloyalty. He would not bring it up first. The great general dragged himself upright, ignoring the complaints of aching muscles. Sergeant Mugworth, spread the word, all officers. Round up every man who can walk. We're moving up to relieve the south gate. The enemy's aerial advantage betrayed the trap before it could close. Mogaba left the soldiers to their work and hastened toward the palace. He arrived as dusk began to deepen shadows. The view from that eminence included half a dozen fires still burning. Smoke and trickles of fire still attended the fallen parts of the palace, too. Awaiting him was the news that the enemy had reduced most of the defenses at the downriver end of the city. Their forces there had been augmented by the survivors from upriver. These outsiders were stubborn fighters. Send reinforcements, Gopal asked. Mogaba thought a moment. Those foreigners ought to be near their limits. Yes, actually. These are all your men here around the palace, aren't they? I thought that would be best. Makes them all men I can trust. Let Aridatha's soldiers take their place. Send yours to the waterfront, and gather up any of your brothers and cousins who are still alive. I want them here. What? Do it. Quickly. Quickly. And round up all those captured fireball throwers. I think we used most of them up. That means there are some of them left. I want them all. Darkness came, and soon after it did, messages reached the great general informing him that his enemies, inside both their footholds, were hunkering down for the night rather than pressing forward when their shadowy allies could come out to play. The great general refused to let the night intimidate him. By his example he inspired those around him, and it did seem that the enemy's spooks meant to do little more than yell boo. The great general reorganized the city's defenses, shifting almost all responsibility into Aridatha Singh's hands. Then he led Gopal Singh and the man's kinsmen, armed with fireball throwers, toward the waterfront conflict. Gopal asked, What are we doing? This is a false peace, Mogaba replied. They lost their captain this afternoon. 
The trap in the gate worked to perfection. They lost most of their command staff, too. He did not explain how he knew that. They'll need to work out who's in charge and what they're going to do now. They might even decide to go away. He shivered, told himself it was the winter air. But he knew that Croker had survived the day. He knew the company would not be going away. He knew the succession there had been assured, and the new captain would attempt to complete the work of the old. Chapter 118 Taglios A New Administration I'm not ready to take over, Sovereign argued. And I'm too old to come back, I countered, and the only other qualified person is in a coma. Lady was not literally in a coma, but practically speaking, the effect was the same. She had nothing to contribute. Sovereign grumbled under his breath. Sleepy picked you. She thought you could handle it. She's been giving you opportunities to get a feel for the job. Sleepy was a big part of the problem. Her death, so sudden and cruel, had stricken everyone. Most of us were still in a daze. I said, we take too much time here. We'll give the children of the dead too much time to think. We don't want them looking at how bad the numbers thing has gone since they've been on our side of the glittering plain. A moment of self-loathing followed. That was exactly the sort of thinking I found repugnant in the company's employers. Sovereign reflected briefly. We can't spend time grieving, can we? We have to go ahead or call it off. No decision there. Go ahead. I've tried to get messages to Aridatha Singh. He seems like a good man, willing to put Taglios first. He might be willing to spare the city some pain. If you can convince him that the great general isn't going to eat us alive. The way Tobo tells it, Mogaba isn't particularly worried. He will be. Once we get settled in here, I just might take the girls general hunting. Sovereign still showed some of that pudgy, baby-fat look he had always had. He needed to get busy and develop the hardened, piratical look of a captain. He yielded to his hidden desires. All right, I'll be the captain, but I reserve the right to quit. Excellent. I'll spread the word, then I'll go smack Mogaba around. My hatred for the great general was no longer virulent, though. It was more like a bad habit these days. I'm the captain now, right? Completely in charge. Yeah, spoken with a twinge of suspicion. My first directive as captain, then, is that you should stop putting yourself at risk. Huh? What? But, Croker, you're the only one left who can keep the annals. You're the only one left who can read most of them. You didn't finish teaching me, and you haven't trained anyone else. I don't intend to lose our connection with our heritage, not at this last stage. Therefore, henceforth, you're not going anywhere that'll put you at risk. You son of a bitch. You jobbed me. You can't do that. I'm the captain. Sure I can. I just did. I'll have you restrained if that's what it takes. You won't have to, because I buy into the whole company mystique like a religion because I cannot defy orders just because I do not like them. Ha ha. How long would it take to find a way to weasel around this if I felt a genuine need? But I wanted Mogaba. We'll catch him for you. Then you can skin him, or whatever you want. I went out and spread the word that we had a new captain and that the officers should attend him. Then I looked for Arcana, who was off somewhere, wasting a valuable part of her life sleeping. As I stumbled around, shivering because things unseen were everywhere in the night, I realized that Sovereign unwittingly had given me orders of critical importance. If I kept running around, getting into the middle of everything, and I got myself killed for my trouble, more than the annals would die with me. So would the little plan I had worked out for fulfilling our commitment to Shivetya. I had not shared that with anyone, and would not unless I was convinced I was dying. Words never spoken cannot be overheard by sleeping goddesses.
Chapter 119 Taglios Messenger Guided and masked by the folk of the Hidden Realm, Arcana penetrated Aridatha Singh's headquarters undetected, flying post and all. The general was alone. He had collapsed of exhaustion an hour earlier. Solicitous subordinates had put him to bed. They had left sentries outside his door to keep him from being disturbed. Arcana got in through an open window, lying flat upon her post. She was not especially nervous. She was confident that she could manage any trouble that came her way, at least for the moments it would take her to escape. She had been instructed to flee at the first sign of trouble. She believed in those instructions with the fervor of a new convert. Once inside, she dismounted and turned her post so she could get away without any delay. She kept herself tethered to the post, so it could drag her out even if she was not in the saddle. Even if she was unconscious. Maybe even if three guys were hanging on to her, trying to keep her from going. She found a lamp and lit it. Then she awakened Aridatha Singh. The general did not waken quickly, but he did so quietly and cautiously, understanding that he was in a dangerous situation. Maybe it was the unknown shadows... The sense of their presence was strong, because they were all around. Singh rose into a cross-legged sitting position. He moved slowly, keeping his hands in sight. He asked his question by expression alone. Arcana strained to ignore his looks. She had been warned. She was not an idiot like Gromoval. The captain wants to know if you received the analyst's messages... The captain wants to know if you're ready to spare Taglios the agonies of further conflict. She enunciated carefully, having no desire to be misunderstood. Of course I do, but how do I get you people to go away? He could not tell much about his visitor because of the Varoshk clothing. Here's an idea. You can have your soldiers lay down their arms— as one of the Varoshk, that sort of statement directed at an outsider would not have troubled Arcana at all. But here, tonight, she was just another refugee and freelance, and a very young one at that, with limited confidence in herself. Maybe Croker's confidence was misplaced. That clever old man. He had set her up so she would risk her freedom rather than let him down. That was a characteristic of old men all old men in her experience, anyway. Aridatha said, There's little I'd like more than to end this fighting before even one more person gets hurt. But I have no control when it comes to making the choice between war and peace. I've undertaken obligations. I've given my word. Right now, Taglios is in the keeping of the great general. If he gives the order to stop fighting, I'll do so instantly. And he said no more. That was as clearly as he could speak. Even that much clarity troubled his conscience. That's your firm response, then. Arcana's confidence had begun to swell. There is no other position open to me. Your captain will understand. Your honor could get you killed, and there'd be no one to sing your praises. Arcana departed before Singh could figure out what that meant. He thought it sounded like something foreign that did not translate well. Aridatha was a little less exhausted than he had been before he collapsed, but he did not fall asleep again for a long while, and not because of the potent sense of alien presence still filling his bedroom. He kept hearing the visitor's last words and remembering his father, Narayan Singh, a man of high honor within his own world, now without a soul to sing his praises, unless maybe his beloved goddess sang him lullabies within her terrible dreams. And Narayan's murderer was still hiding somewhere inside the remains of the palace. Chapter 120 Taglios T. Kim was always here. Mogaba did not participate much in the fighting, he told Gopal, The spirit is willing, but this body is just too damned old and tired. I'll just sit here and tell you what to do. 
but mostly he visited with the White Crow, which had begun scouting for him despite the presence of unfriendly ghosts. The bird could see those ghosts quite clearly, for it warned him regularly when it was time to keep his mouth shut. When Mogaba suggested that the unseen things did not seem to be helping the invaders much, the crow told him that the folk of the Hidden Realm were completely devoted to making their master happy. What little they did contribute, they did in response to the will of their messiah, Tobo, whom they worshipped almost as a god. As T. Kim, which in the canonical languages of the priests who had created the unknown shadows, meant one who walks with the dead. Startled, the great general demanded, You mean to tell me that T. Kim isn't Nguyen Bao? The title came from a language closely akin to the Nguyen Bao of four centuries ago. So Deathwalker is the half-breed kid. Not Deathwalker, one who walks with the dead. Mogaba was too tired to wonder much about the difference. Go find Aridatha Singh, Mogaba said. I want to know what he's doing. The bird was not pleased about being given orders, but it went. Mogaba called for Gopal immediately. He asked, What are your feelings toward this city? He knew, but wanted to hear it from the man's own mouth. Gopal shrugged. I'm not sure I understand. Like everyone who lives here, I love it and I hate it. Our enemies have reorganized their chain of command. Right now they're resting, but they'll resume their attack while there's yet darkness enough to conceal their hidden allies. I'm sure now that our forces will survive the night with more than enough strength left to be able to counterattack tomorrow. I think we'll be able to hurt them badly when we do attack, but their damned sorcerers will save them, and when night comes again... Their allies will finish us. The great general said all this without having seen any proof that the unknown shadows were capable of doing anything lethal. And I think Taglios will suffer a great deal more destruction during that time. I believe that eventually both sides will be so weakened that no matter who wins, neither will be able to restrain the religious factions, nor be able to contain the ambitions of the gang lords priests, or anyone else likely to take advantage of a state of disorder. We might even see rioting between the followers of the different major religions. Gopal nodded in the darkness, unseen, as Chief Grey managing unofficial ambition had been his task. He had been particularly hard on criminal gangs. Mogaba had not dug for details, but knew that something in Gopal's past drove him to shatter criminal enterprises. What are you trying to say? Gopal asked. I'm saying that if we continue this war the way we are now, we can win, probably, but we'll destroy Taglios in the process, and even if we do lose, the results will be anarchy and destruction. And? and our enemies don't care. They didn't come here for the city's benefit. They came to get you and me, and the Kadidas and the girl, especially the Daughter of Night. Mogaba felt Gopal's growing suspicion. The White Crow would be back soon, too. I think we should walk away, Gopal, and save Taglios the agony. The garrisons in the eastern provinces are loyal, we can continue the struggle from there. Gopal was not fooled. Neither did he raise the objection that they had little hope of success against an enemy seated in the capital, armed with a crew of wizards and well supplied with funds. Gopal had known his commander a long time. The great general was a stubborn warlord, imbued with no weakness whatsoever. Unless that was his secret love for his adopted city that he had revealed several times lately. Gopal found he had no trouble believing that the great general could walk away rather than let Taglios be destroyed as a monument to his ego. This Mogaba was not the arrogant youngster who had led De Jagare against the worst the Shadow Masters had been able to deliver. Where would we go? Agra. 
or possibly Mukra in Ajishstan. Fedna strongholds, both. A band of heretic Shadar aren't likely to be welcomed, particularly if the strife puts any more strain on religious tolerance. That could happen, Mogaba admitted, or it might not. Nor have we mentioned families. Family was extremely important to the Shadar. I have only my brothers and cousins, but most of my brothers and cousins have wives and children. Mogaba said, I suppose they could stay here, cut off their beards, and pretend to be people who haven't been getting much sun. Gopal, I'm being completely unfair. I'm putting this all squarely on your shoulders. Stay and fight, or go away and spare the city. As if to punctuate his remarks, a mushroom of fire rose above the heart of the city. For an instant, it resembled a gigantic, glowing brain. Flying shapes hurtled across its face. Mogaba said, That respite is over. Chapter 121 Taglios Sleeping Beauty It was driving me crazy, having to hang back over friendly territory, observing an aerial assault on a cluster of buildings anchoring a defense stubbornly blocking our advance toward the palace. We had brought the knowledge of war to this end of the world, and we had taught our students too well. These Taglians refused to yield even in the face of sorcery and the unknown shadows. Someone had pointed out that the troops of the city battalions were mainly Vedna and Shadar, both religions assure swift access to rivers of wine and acres of eager virgins for the man who falls in battle, though originally that only meant warriors who perished in the name of God. I wonder what the Vedna paradise was like for Sleepy. We had not yet been able to identify her body. The corpses in that passage had been burned that badly. Why don't we go around these guys, I wondered, and the answer was, they would not let us. They had an interlocking defense nicely laid out. The only way past was through, or over. Over we could do. Over we did go, twenty insanely courageous children of the dead at a time, with a tobo so tired he was cross-eyed doing the lifting. The unknown shadows supported their pal from every possible direction, sometimes so blatantly that I could see them clearly from where I hovered, doing nothing whatsoever that was useful to the cause. I had a wife in the camp outside the city. It had been a while since I had gone to see how she was doing. That might be considered doing something useful. So I did leave my brethren to go visit my wife, while a fight was going on a fight that would no doubt be completely unique amongst all the fights ever fought, so that somebody really should be right there to record every nuance of its unique ebb and flow. Lady remained unchanged. She lurked halfway between life and death. She kept talking to herself in her sleep. What I saw did not inspire me with hope. What I heard only confused me. Mostly it was incoherent, such individual words as were recognizable did not fall together at all sensibly. A few minutes of that reminded me why I always resisted visiting till I had forgotten the despair of visit inspired. Chapter 122 Taglios Unknown Shadows only two unmarried second cousins of Gopal chose to leave the city with the great general and the commander of the greys. Because they had families, the rest all chose to take their chances with the invaders. Mogaba understood. In the coming confusion, scores of his allies would be finding new looks, new races to be, while the conquerors scoured the city for enemies. Many would somehow fail ever to have heard of the greys, let alone have contributed to that organization's criminal oppressions. Here, Mogaba said, leading the way out onto an ancient, rickety dock. This one will do. 
He indicated an 18-foot boat that, from its aroma, had been bringing in fish since sometime early in the last century. Mogaba invited himself aboard. Gopal and the others followed warily. Shadar and large bodies of water had a relationship somewhat like that between cats and bathtubs. Mogaba said, Untie those ropes. You really do know how to row, don't you? Gopal had made the claim. Singh grunted, but not competitively. To Mogaba's astonishment, they stole the boat without a challenge. He was amazed that a vessel so large had been untenanted, there should have been at least one family aboard, but tonight the entire waterfront was silent and unpopulated, as though the riverside nights were too terrible to endure. Mogaba's internal struggle waxed and waned. He reminded himself that it was fast becoming too late to change his mind, to give in to his prideful, arrogant side. That weakness had brought about these terrible end days. How different his life and the world would have been had he been able to control his interior demons during the siege of De Jagore. He would hardly be a hated and lonely old man, whose memories were all of serving faithfully and well a parade of despicable masters. The White Crow found them while they were trying to work out the mechanics of raising the boat's lateen sail. There was a good breeze blowing, capable of carrying them up the river far more swiftly than could their incompetent rowing. The bird settled in the rigging. What are you doing? I did not give you permission to flee. Why are you running away? No battle has been lost. The Shaddaa gawked. Mogaba thumped himself on the chest. No, a great war has been won. Here, at last. Now I go somewhere where I will do no more harm any more, forever. Gopal looked from him to the crow and back, gradually gaining understanding of both. He grew increasingly agitated and afraid as he did so. The bird was capable of a range of voices, though it was only a haunted crow. Turn this vessel shoreward. Now. I will tolerate no disobedience. You hold no terror for me any more, old whore, Mogaba replied. You hold no power over me. I won't be your toy or cat's paw tonight or ever again. You have no idea how much you will regret this. I won't be imprisoned forever. You will be the first chore on my list when I return. Gopal Singh, turn this disgusting tub around. Ark! Gopal had whacked the bird with the flat of his oar. Flailing, losing feathers, shrieking, it flung from the rigging into the fetid, muddy river. The retiring commander of the greys observed, That bird has an amazingly foul vocabulary. He grinned. Then he began digging through the bag he had carried aboard. He really needed a sip of wine. His kinsman scowled. Glower all you want, you magpies. I'm my own man now. The tenor of the bird's incessant natter changed suddenly, becoming pure corvine terror. It flapped in panic as the surface of the river lifted it up. The rising water tilted the boat precariously. Gopal lost his grasp on his bottle. One of his cousins took a wild swing with his oar, swatting a gallon of water out of the thing taking form. His effort had no enduring effect. Holy shit, Gopal said from flat on his back. What the hell is that? He was staring over Mogaba's shoulder. A thing loomed against the light of fires burning in the city. A thing resembling a huge duck capable of a grin filled with wicked, glistening teeth. And the thing was not alone. Oh, man, one of Gopal's cousins sighed. They're all around us. What are they? Mogaba sighed himself. He did not say that the monsters were not the sort of things people saw and lived to describe. Chapter 123 Taglios Crow Talk 
Aridatha Singh had just gotten back to sleep when fiery pain pierced the back of his right hand. He leapt up and flung his arm out. He thought his lamp had somehow spilled burning oil and feared his cot would be on fire. But the lamp was not burning. Not fire. Something had bitten him then, or maybe clawed him, and he had thrown it across the room where it was struggling feebly and making incoherent chicken noises. Those people were attacking him directly now. He shouted for the sentries. Once light filled the room, he discovered that his visitor was an albino crow. One of the men threw a blanket over the bird and wrapped it up. Another examined Aridatha's hand. That's one ragged-looking critter, General. You might want to see a physician. It might be diseased. Send for soap and hot water. It doesn't look like the skin is broken much. What is that? The blanket with the bird inside had begun talking. It's talking, the soldier said, so utterly amazed that he could do nothing but state the obvious. Seal the window. Close the door. Get yourselves ready to hit it with something when we turn it loose. He recalled that one of the company chieftains sometimes carried ravens on his shoulders, and one of those was white. Escape was no longer an option for the bird, Aridatha directed, Turn it loose now. The crow looked like someone had tried to drown it, then had decided to pluck it featherless instead. It was in terrible shape. The bedraggled beast cocked its head right, left, surveying the chamber. It made an obvious effort to put aside its anger to collect its pride and dignity. Aridatha did not think this was the raven he had seen with that man, Croker. This one seemed smaller, yet more substantial. The bird studied Singh, first with one eye, then with the other. Then it eyed the sentries. It seemed to be awaiting something. You have something to say? Say it, Aridatha suggested. Send them out. I don't think so. He motioned two soldiers into positions where they would be better able to swat the crow. I am not accustomed to... Nor am I in the habit of taking back chat from birds. I assume you bring a message, deliver it, or I'll wring your neck and go on about my business. I fear you will live to regret this, Aridatha Singh. In that moment, with the bird's voice changing, Singh understood that he was in touch with the protector. But her enemies had buried her beneath the glittering plain, had they not? I await your message... If it's just a threat, I'll have the Vasuda step on your head. Very well. Until the day, Aridatha Singh. Aridatha Singh, you are now my viceroy in Taglios. Mogaba and Gopal are no more. I will instruct you as to what steps to take. Excuse me. The great general and General Singh have been killed. They tried to do something foolish. For their trouble, the enemy's shadow creatures destroyed them, which elevates you to... Aridatha turned his back on the crow. Jitendra, get that word out. I want every company to disengage. The only exception is to be where the enemy won't let them. And get the word across the lines that I'm prepared to discuss terms. The white crow flew into a cursing rage. Throw the blanket on that thing again, Vasuda. We may have some use for it later, but I don't want to listen to its nagging now. You could get a wife if you needed that, General. Chapter 124 Taglios The Sandbar Already there were stories on the street about how the great general had sacrificed himself in order to void the strictures of all the oaths and vows binding him and his allies, because he had wanted to spare the city further devastation by the invading rebels and outlanders. Amazing. We had just started taking charge, and already people were nostalgic for the good old days of the protectorate. Hard to blame them, I suppose, it was a generation ago that the Prabhrindra Dra last saw the inside of his capital city. Let them feel however they wanted, as long as they stayed out of my way. 
Topo and I drifted above the palace, studying the ruin. Smoke still found its way out of the rock pile. Every few hours, a little more caved in. A third had collapsed already. That third included almost all of the occupied modern sector. Maybe the abandoned parts had been constructed from sterner stuff. They had survived generations of neglect. Even during the worst fighting, Aridatha had used volunteers from the city battalions to keep sifting the ruins for survivors to rescue and bodies to deliver to distraught relatives. He continued in that role, now reinforced by units formally committed to the fighting. Elsewhere, whole battalions now engaged the more stubborn fires instead of invaders. I asked Tobo, You really think they're still in there somewhere? I meant Boo-Boo and Goblin. I know they are. The hidden folk have seen them. They just can't remember how to get to them. Strange as it may seem, I need them out of there alive. Without them, I can't keep my promise to Shivetya. Tobo grunted. I had not included him in my planning. In fact, the inner circle still consisted of a council of one. Me. And I intended to keep it that way. Nothing spoken. Nothing betrayed. I think Arcana's in love. Below, the Varosh girl had come up with another excuse to consult Aridatha Singh. Tobo grunted again. He was better than he had been, but victory had given him no satisfaction. He would be a long time getting over the loss of his mom and dad. I asked, Have you found any trace of Mogaba or Gopal Singh? Aridatha said they were dead. He claimed to have been told so by the White Crow, not an entirely reliable witness. The boy studied me before responding. They drowned while trying to escape upriver by boat. Evidently the boat capsized. I see. My tone made him stare at me intently. I could not see his expression, of course. The Varoshka apparel concealed that and mine masked my features. We continued to dress up because some people did not approve of our conquest. Incidents abounded. Mostly, though, Taglios had heaved a huge collective sigh and began getting on with the business of life. Thus far, there had been almost no retribution against those who had served the displaced regime. Most people seemed of the opinion that the Greys had done more good than harm since they had repressed criminal behavior with a ferocity greater than they had shown to enemies of the great general and the protector. In general, the masses of people were entirely indifferent to who ruled Taglios and its dependencies. The who seldom touched their lives deeply, one way or another. The human species never ceases to amaze me. I would have bet more people would have cared a lot more. But from the inside, nothing is ever what it looks like from without. Raja Dharma graffiti continued to appear. Some folks are never satisfied. T. Kim is here was turning up now, too. I had not pressed the kid on that. He did not want to talk about it. I would let it ride, even though that mystery was not yet solved to my satisfaction. There had to be more to his relationship with the unknown shadows than had become obvious so far. I left the boy and circled the palace. Our men had replaced the city battalions on that perimeter. They made a colorful line. City troops were clearing rubble, particularly in areas where Tobo's friends believed people were trapped. A number remained alive, caught inside interior rooms that had not collapsed. Now thirst was their implacable enemy. All was going as it should, it seemed, but I was not comfortable. I had a sense of there being a wrongness somewhere. Intuition, based upon subconscious cues. I drifted away from the palace, waving in passing to Shukrat, who just had to see Tobo after having completed a courier run to the approaching Prabrindra Dra and Radisha, once out of sight, I put on speed and headed for the river. I started at the downstream end of the waterfront. I drifted upstream. The boats were out, as they would have been had the fighting still been underway. 
I asked a few questions of terrified fishermen, not at all sure what I might find. The current had had ample time to carry bodies and wreckage down to the delta swamps. Or perhaps not. There is a miles-long sandbar just off the curve of the north bank. It has been there so long that it is an island now, with grass on its flanks, brush above that, and trees along its highest parts. The channel on its north side is narrow, shallow, and choked with mud. An overturned boat lay in the mouth of that channel. One dead man sprawled in the mud. A dozen Taglians clad only in loincloths were trying to right the boat preparatory to dragging it off the bar. None of those men showed the least interest in the corpse, but it was obviously Shadar, and they were all Guni. The scavengers had a definite interest in not being anywhere around when people came swooping out of the sky in a billowing black cloud. A couple jumped into the channel and swam for the north bank. Others ran into the growth on the island's spine. A few tried to make it back to the boat that had brought them. It had beached a hundred yards down the bar. The dead Shadar appeared to have been an officer of the Greys. I discovered a second corpse underneath the boat, also Shadar. There were disturbed crows in and above the nearby trees, which was interesting because we saw so few of those birds anymore. I made a couple of lazy passes overhead to finish scaring the birds away before dropping carefully through the branches. Mogaba was recognizable only because of the unique color of the bits of skin left to him. Gopal Singh I identified only by deduction. They had been tortured, terribly, and for a long time. Mogaba may be for days. His corpse was not that old. I slid downstream behind the island and eventually rejoined my own people. I searched out Arcana. We need to talk, adopted daughter. I jerked a thumb, somewhere up high in the brilliant noonday sun. She picked up on my concern. She drove upward a thousand feet, tending south, as though we were going to check on the Prabrindra Dra's progress. In fact, a sizable dust cloud could be seen to the south. What is it? she asked. I think Tobo may be out of control, or so close to it as makes no difference. If we're not careful, we might all be sorry his mother isn't here to scold him, and that Sleepy and Mergen are gone. He may be a grown man, but he still needs direction. I told her what I had found on the sandbar. Why tell me? You don't let anybody in on anything, Pop because I've seen you making moon eyes at General Singh, and he was a partner with the great General and Gopal Singh. If Tobo's really unhinged, he might go after Aridatha next. Why do you blame Tobo? I led her through my reasoning, which relied heavily on my assessment of the character of the great General. Mogaba knew Aridatha wanted to spare Taglios from the fighting. He wanted that himself, he couldn't surrender, though, and Aridatha's sense of honor wouldn't let him desert Mogaba. So Mogaba decided to arrange it so Aridatha wouldn't be encumbered, and Tobo got him. You didn't say why you blamed Tobo. Because only Tobo could have known what Mogaba was doing and where he would be doing it. There was something badly wrong on the river that night. All the waterfront people felt it and ran off to hide in the city. All right. Suppose it's true. What are you going to do? I just did it. I told you to be careful, and now I'm going to see if my wife's gotten any better since this morning. I knew Lady would not have done so. I had begun to lose hope for her. Chapter 125 Taglios An Afternoon Off I took Lady out for a picnic, with a little help from my adopted daughters, in the vain hope that some sunlight and fresh air would make a difference when even Tobo's best effort could not shake the enchantment holding her. According to the boy wizard, I was supposed to consider myself lucky. If she had not been lady, had been some ordinary person, she would have been long dead. He assured me this was not the spell that had claimed Sedvad and still gripped Soulcatcher, 
I could not see any obvious difference, except that Lady was getting no worse. His best advice was to take my questions to the perpetrator once we found him. The girls left me alone with my honey. I held her hand and rambled on about a thousand things, recollections, current affairs, hopes. I shared my suspicions and concerns about Tobo, too, which might have been dangerous since I had no idea what might be listening. Nothing I did helped her even a little, nor did it seem to do me any good. I fought the good fight against despair. A squeaky clean, thoroughly polished corporal from Sien trotted up. Captain's compliments, sir, and could you come to the palace? They think they might have located the Kadidas and the Daughter of Night. Damn. Yes, I'll be there as soon as I can. Tell them not to mess with anything. Tell them to be very careful. Those two are extremely dangerous. They knew that, of course, and Tobo would be right there to remind them. But repetition never hurts, not when it helps get you through the deadly times. Shukrat and Arkana came running. What's up? Shukrat asked. As I explained, I reflected on how much better the girls were getting along. They seemed to have shed the conflicts they had brought into captivity. As we three got Lady ready to go back to my tent, I asked Arkana, Will you want to go home someday? What? Home, where you were born. The world I used to call Katavar. Do you want to go back? I think I could make it happen. But it's all destroyed. Not really. The First Father and Nashun the Researcher said so, but that was just to excuse their cowardice. I'm not sure I want to believe that. Good. Excellent. That's the way I want my kids to be. Skeptical. That's the truth according to Shivetya, and I'm not a hundred percent sure of our demonic friend myself. Why didn't you ask me if I want to go? Shukrat demanded. Because you don't want to go. You just want to be where Tobo is. That isn't exactly a secret. It isn't a crime, either. But I'm not bereft of my senses. You'll sure never see me do some die-for-love kind of thing. If you guys do go... Tell me. I'll decide what I want to do then. Chapter 126 Taglios Royal Return I did not make it to the palace. Shukrat beat me there and came right back with instructions to head for the south gate. The Prabrindra Dra was about to arrive, and Sovereign wanted somebody there to greet the man we had been touting as the city's legitimate ruler. Per instructions, I rounded up a few men from the city battalions, along with a handful of their officers, and off I went, grumbling all the way. I expected the prince's homecoming would be a huge disappointment for him and his sister. Taglios did not care. I told several people to spread the word to try to get something going, that did very little good. The route inward from the gate was never more than sparsely populated with spectators, and the rare feeble cheer we did hear came from really old people. I hate to waste pomp and pageantry. Not that we did put much on. Aridatha got to bring out his marching band a little late. Never would have been better. They were terrible. And not just because what passes for music here is so alien— I have spent half my life in this end of the world. I asked Singh, Those guys practice much. They've been too busy being soldiers. Aridatha had an attitude I appreciated. Each one of his men was expected to be a soldier first, and whatever else secondarily. Singh said, I do have to tell you, this prince doesn't look very impressive. I hope he's a better ruler than he is a showman. I was no longer sure bringing the prince back would be good for Taglios myself. There had been big changes in the city, and bigger changes in the man. They might have nothing in common any more. I shrugged. He's old. If he hasn't got what Taglios needs, Taglios won't have to put up with him for long. In the old days, the prince and I had gotten along well, until he had turned on us. 
As an officer in my command, he had shown a hunger for learning and a lust for doing the best thing. So I told him straight away, when we met inside the South Gate, that his first order of business, now that he was back in business, had to be the establishment of a generally acceptable line of succession. Otherwise, chaos would follow his demise. Raja Dharma, old buddy, let's get the job done. My remarks earned me a tired growl and not much more. The prince seemed used up and worn out. His sister showed more spark, but had a lot more years on her because she had not shared the stasis of the captivity with her brother. Chances were nowadays that she would go first, despite being the younger. She could not be titular ruler anyway. When she did exercise the power during all those years... There had been a pretense of a regency in place until the legitimate ruler could resume control. Because the Prabhrindra Dra was still alive somewhere, neither custom nor law allowed a woman to rule in her own right. Arkana came to meet me with the news. They've definitely found the Kadidas and the daughter of Night Pop. She was a willing participant in that charade now, and more and more helping herself to a job as my personal assistant. Now, if I could just teach her written Taglian. I suspect the frequency with which I crossed the path of Aridatha Singh had something to do with all that. Singh, I noted, had not failed to recognize what a tasty morsel my little girl was either though Varushk protective apparel seldom flattered. Tobo remained patient enough to wait until I reached the palace, barely, and only out of impatient courtesy, because that was my real daughter and my former friend in there. My real daughter, a grown woman whom I had never seen. Arkana, known less than a year, was more daughter to me in life, and Narayan Singh was more a father to Bubu. Aridatha was there and interested. I wondered why. Then I recalled that he had seen Bubu a few times before, and those women have a way of getting under your skin without ever trying. It did not occur to me that he might be thinking more about the Kadidas. At first the prince was put out by everyone's sudden loss of interest in him. Then he got a good look at what had happened to the palace. He moaned aloud, a textbook cry of anguish. He managed some respectable gnashing of teeth. Sovereign stepped in. The little pudgeball could be weasel slick handling people when he wanted, which might be the ideal leadership skill for the times. I turned to Arcana, gave her special instructions. She flew off to my rooms in the building we had taken for our headquarters. Once upon a time, it had been a Gray's barracks. Most of the greys have vanished. We all pretended not to notice that there are a disproportionate number of Shadar in the city battalions, say, compared to when we were duking it out with them in the streets. Aridatha was sharing his own good fortune, though there was less popular inclination toward vengeance than I had expected, and that little focused entirely on individuals. The Radi Shadra also let out a disconsolate wail on discovering the state of the palace. She and her brother remained still and silent for minutes. Then she slew the silence with another cry of pain. I told Sovereign, I hope they don't decide that this is all our fault and just have to get even. I did not think they would be that stupid after having survived what they had suffered for having turned on us before but with royalty you never know. They think differently than real people. The real world never quite seems to reach them. Smoke still trickled out of the ruins here and there. While we watched, a small avalanche of weakened masonry cascaded down. The prince observed, The stonework must have suffered more than we thought during the earthquake. Huh? That had happened so long ago that I had forgotten it. You're probably right. Plus, the protector never wasted a copper on maintenance while she was in charge. I approached Tobo, who continued to prance about impatiently. Where are my treasures? As I asked, Arcana swooped down, black cloth popping and crackling in the wind. She carried One-Eye's spear and his ugly old hat. 
The hat still smelled of the ugly old man who had worn it. Right there where the red flag is. Poles with colored streamers indicated points where the unknown shadows had detected something human under the rubble. There were just two red ribbons. The rest were black. There would be no rush to dig there. The red streamer not indicated by Tobo was the focus of frenzied activity. I asked, what's over there? Ten to twelve people trapped in one of the treasury strong rooms. We're sending water and soup down through bamboo pipes. They'll be all right. Um, I could imagine the nightmares they would suffer for the rest of their lives. Just hang on to that stuff, I told Arcana. I studied the stone around the base of the red streamer pole. Tobo, are they conscious down there? I don't think so. I'd hate to think they're just waiting to do something obnoxious when we dig them out. He said, We can just leave them there. Without water, they'll die. It's a solution, but not one that interested me. Only Boo Boo would really suffer. Sovereign, may I? When he nodded, I beckoned some men who were standing around awaiting instructions. If the girl was aware, I was sure we would get a dose of the love me real quick which meant only people in Varoshk clothing should do the final digging. The Kadidas and Daughter of Night had crawled into a corner of their hiding place when the collapse came. The walls had held up just enough, but they had not had time to collect food and water. Sadly, my baby did have a lamp and supplies, and did make a valiant attempt to keep right on inscribing the Books of the Dead perhaps in hope of lending Kina enough strength to save her. She could not have had much hope otherwise. I thought a lot about what Boo-Boo had been through in her near quarter century, about what had been done to her and what she believed she was. The loving part of me thought it might be a priceless mercy if she was saved the cruelty of reawakening. It never got beyond being a notion— no argument I could present would ever convince Lady that that was appropriate. She wanted a little lady so badly. I discovered the Radisha beside me. It was amazing how much she had aged. She even carried a cane. It's true, you know, she said in a weary voice. What's that? Though I knew what she was going to say. The coming of the Black Company did mean the end of Taglios just not the way we imagined. All we ever wanted was to pass on through. She nodded, keeping her bitterness contained. You think we were hard on Taglius? Consider how happy the Shadow Masters must be. But you haven't finished with Taglius, the Prabrindra Dra observed, joining us. I've just heard what happened to Lady. How is she? Stable. He was another of those men who had been infatuated with my wife at one time. And you're right, in a way. As long as people try to push us around, people get hurt. But that shouldn't last much longer. We're close to where we have to go. I stepped forward, spoke to the men digging, first in the language of the children of the dead, then in Taglian. We're getting close. Hold up till those of us who are protected can help. Tobo? Girls, they're almost through over here. Not far off, more interior brickwork surrendered to the seduction of gravity. Chapter 127 Taglios and My Baby The soldiers created a precarious opening through which someone might wriggle. I asked for a lantern, meaning to be first inside but Tobo seized it when it arrived. I did not argue. He was better equipped than I. Seconds after the boy began to duckwalk, a blast of urine-colored light ripped through the opening. It glanced off Tobo, hit a block of stone, scattered. It was a potent blast. Stone melted, and one stray ricochet found the Prabrindra Dra. The results were ugly and instantly fatal. That was it. Tobo called back, unaware of the disaster. That's all he had. He's out of it now. Croker, help me drag them out. The Radisha began to wail. The boy recognized the scope of the disaster immediately. 
The Taglian Empire was, as of this moment, without an acceptable helmsman, was without legitimate direction. It'll have to wait a minute, I said. The prince is hurt. I want to get him to medical care right now. Maybe, just one more time, we could pretend the supreme authority was fine but staying out of sight. Soulcatcher got away with it. The great general got away with it. Why not my own band of opportunists? I feared there had been too many witnesses, though Sovereign and Aridatha took up the pretense immediately, and the Radisha herself joined me after only a few heartbeats. She put on a creditable show of threatening me with serious unpleasantness if her brother happened to die. Now aware that political disaster threatened, Tobo launched some glitzy distraction, to which I paid little attention because I was desperate to get the prince out of the public eye. There was a lot of flash behind me and changing colors playing through the ruins. A big bunch of masonry went down, and Shukrat began helping Tobo pull the Kadidas out of the ground. Aridatha's men hauled the prince's litter away. The prince seemed to. Akana and I began to ease through the rubble toward the hole. I beckoned more stretcher-bearers. The thing being dragged into the light did not look dangerous. It looked like an old, worn-out version of a goblin who was already dead. "'You want these now?' Arcana asked. "'Hang on just another minute. Get him over here, guys. On the stretcher. Easy, easy. Tobo, can you wake him up? Just for a second. Long enough for him to recognize me and what I'm doing.' Probably, if you want to risk it. There was a choke in the boy's voice. He looked at the spear and the ugly hat and wanted to believe that I had a way to reach the goblin trapped inside the Kadidas, the goblin who was always like an uncle to him. Oh, shit, I said. Wait, wait. What? I just had an ugly thought. About how Kina might react through Lady if we drive the devil out of goblin. Tobo sucked in a bucket of air, released it. I don't see how she could work that. But why take a chance? She is the mother of deception. Shook, honey, do me a favor. Get me the small carpet from my room. Just fold it up and bring it back. We'll use that to haul them away. Shukrat jumped onto her post and zipped away. While he waited, Tobo had an awning erected to keep potential rain off Goblin, then snaked back into the hole. He did not ask for help, so I stood back with Aridatha and Arcana, insides turning over, awaiting my first glimpse of Bubu. I asked Singh, The fires under the rubble never go out. What the hell keeps burning? Five hundred years' worth of archives, everything that belonged to the Inspector General of the Records, It'll make for interesting times when we try to put things back together. Shukrat, the little darling, obviously knew her way around Tobo's quarters. She was back with a small folded flying carpet before the kid himself poked his head back out of the hole. With Arcana's help, she snapped the frame into position, stretched the fabric taut. Arcana finally found nerve enough to speak to Aridatha directly in a non-business capacity. You think it's going to rain? You could see she wanted to melt like a slug freshly sprinkled with salt. All that work to find the nerve to speak and something that feeble was all she could get out. When fat raindrops had begun plunking down at random intervals nearly a minute before. She was just a kid. They had the Kadidas on the flying carpet now, and a couple of soldiers, one Taglian and one from Sien, had hold of a pair of ankles. You all right, Pop? Arcana asked, holding on to my left arm. She looks just like Lady did the first time we met, in a time of terror. There was terror here now, but of an entirely different sort. Then your wife must have had some filthy hygiene habits in her younger days. Ah, but she was eager to learn. Tobo, can you make sure Boo Boo doesn't wake up until I want her to? I did not want to have to cope with her witchery. And let's keep these two away from each other from now on. We don't need them getting their heads together. We don't need them, period. <laughs>
someone muttered. Shukrat, I realized. Shukrat did not like the way Tobo kept eyeballing the Daughter of Night. Nor did my other adopted offspring particularly approve of the contemplative stares of Aridatha Singh. Tobo called, Croker, you want to wake up yourself, just for a minute, so you can take a look at her, see if anything's missing or broken. One of the city soldiers told another that everything looked just fine to him, a little soap and some clean clothes. I never thought I would be a father and have to pretend not to hear such remarks. The man was right. She was a beautiful child, exactly like her mother. And, like ladies, most of her beauty lay right on the surface. I had to remind myself not to be taken in by what I saw or by what I wanted to feel. My emotions would not be trustworthy. They might not be my own. The mother of deceit had not left the game. I knelt beside my daughter. My emotions were engaged indeed. I felt a thousand years old and utterly powerless. It took a major application of will to touch her. Her skin felt cold. In moments, I reported, She's got lots of bruises and scrapes, but there isn't any serious damage. Nothing permanent. She is dehydrated. She shook each time I touched her, as though I was massaging her with pieces of ice. She'll recover if we take care of her. Put her in with Lady. Tobo said, You'll need somebody to stay with her, somebody who can control her. I will, I will. Shukrat and Arkana both volunteered. Well, were they that concerned about competition from a beat-up, unconscious woman who knew absolutely nothing about men? I would bet Tobo was grinning when he said, All right, ladies, work yourselves out a schedule. Croker, what do you plan to do about Goblin? Sovereign seemed a little irked. Events were going forward without consulting the new captain of the Black Company. But in matters concerning Bubu and the Kadidas, he was no expert. Stash him. I'll wait until I'm well rested to deal with him. Meantime, we need somebody to crawl into that hole and collect up all of Bubu's scribblings. Somebody from Sien, preferably. Somebody illiterate. We'll take no chance anybody will read that stuff. I'll take care of it, but right now I'm going to take a nap. I'm totally exhausted. Chapter 128 Taglios Another Great General I was worried. I pranced from foot to foot like a little boy at a wedding who really needed to pee. It was another day, and I had still not gotten started with Bubu and the Kadidas. Giving them and their goddess any time at all was bound to lead to mischief. But I had more immediate responsibilities. The fighting was over. Our obligation to the dead had to be handled now. And a huge city, with many dead of its own, had to be kept on a tight rein. Recent disasters would encourage plotters and conspirators. The children of the dead knew how to put on a memorial for fallen comrades. Deep-voiced drums muttered and grumbled. Horns conjured forth the mood and gloom of a chilly, rainy morning, despite a bright, cloudless winter sky. The soldiers paraded in all their brilliant colors, with all their thousands of banners. The locals were suitably impressed. We sent Sleepy off in more style than she could have hoped for while she lived. We said our goodbyes to a great many people. Then we stood back and rendered appropriate honors, as Aridatha Singh directed equally large, if not nearly so dramatic, ceremonies honoring those who had fallen on behalf of the Protectorate. And when that was done, we joined the local soldiers and the most important men of the city in honoring the Prabhindra Dra. His funeral was the grandest I ever attended, I developed the distinct impression that all those leading men had gathered, however, to eyeball one another suspiciously, rather than to mourn the passing of a ruler none had seen since they were young. Aridatha Singh was popular with these men. Because Aridatha Singh had gathered to himself the loyalties of the survivors of the 2nd Territorial Division, the Greys, 
and the commanders of the rural garrisons nearest the city. Aridatha Singh had become the most powerful man in the Taglian territories, despite having done little to acquire that power, except to be competent and a nice guy. They say that when the hour comes, so will the man. Sometimes fate will even conspire to put a competent, honest man in the right place at the right time. Almost overnight, the graffiti began giving Aridatha Mogaba's old title, Great General. Now if he could just manage to get by without antagonizing the occupiers. I tried to keep an eye on Tobo, but that was difficult with a kid so talented. Chapter 129 Taglios Open Tomb, Open Eyes the hours of ceremony ground me down. I wanted to put myself away for another long nap, but I refused to give the Queen of Darkness any further respite. These are them, Arcana told me in perfectly colloquial bad Taglian, indicating eight bitty wooden kegs. Eight different men took turns crawling in there and stuffing papers and everything else they could find into a keg, which I had sealed up as soon as the man came out, by an illiterate cooper. You are a treasure indeed, daughter dear. Gentlemen, let's build us a bonfire. I had brought a couple of carts loaded with wood purchased from a wood seller, whose usual customers were people who needed firewood for funeral gats. I had been surprised to find he had any stock left, considering recent events. The gentlemen I spoke to all hailed from Sien. They knew only that the eight kegs contained the hopes of life of a monster, more black-hearted than the legendary shadow masters who had tortured the land of unknown shadows. And that was all they needed to know. The pyre went up quickly, the kegs scattered throughout it. A fraction of me bemoaned the fate of the latest incarnation of the Books of the Dead. I hate seeing any book destroyed, but I did not interfere when the oil splashed and the fireballs zipped in. My reluctance might be Kina trying to manipulate me. I stayed there until I was confident that my natural daughter's life's work had been consumed completely by the flames. In some myths, Hagna, god of fire, is Kina's mortal enemy. In others, when she is in her destroyer avatar, he is her ally. The more I am exposed to the Guni Pantheon, the more confused I become. What task now, I wondered aloud. Everyone but Arcana and a few curious street kids, the near feral ones called Jengali, had moved along. A ragged, bemused white crow had been hanging around, too, but it had nothing to say. It had been doing a lot of sticking close and keeping its beak shut lately. Time to wake somebody up, Pop. Your wife, your daughter, or the Kadidas. I surveyed the workmen clearing rubble. Most were civilians now, supervised by soldiers there just to keep them from stealing any treasures they unearthed. The masonry had stopped collapsing. The fires had burned out. The popular consensus was that an all-new palace should be erected once the old structures had been cleared away. I could not imagine what treasures and surprises might surface if they did demolish and remove the whole rambling monster. No one ever knew the palace in its entirety. No one but a long-dead wizard named Smoke. The death pyre of the Books of the Dead attracted more Jengali, who wanted to take advantage of the warmth. Shukrat glowered at Arcana. Seemed Arcana was not doing her share of boo-boo watching and Arcana did not care if Shukrat was pissed off. I noticed a change in Lady. She did not seem to be in a sort of coma anymore. She seemed to be in a normal but deep sleep. I threw open a window. I am a firm believer in the health benefits of fresh air. The scruffy white crow appeared almost immediately. I asked, How long has this been going on? I had my back to Boo-Boo. Cleaned and groomed and dressed in decent clothing, she was quite the sleeping beauty. I tried not to look at her long. 
seeing her still ripped at my heart. What? Shukrat asked. She stuck her tongue out at Arcana. The snoring. Lady didn't snore before. I meant since she had fallen under the spell. Before, she had snored for as long as I had been sleeping with her, though she refused to believe it. Shukrat said, She started right after we brought the Daughter of Night in. I didn't think anything about it. No reason you should. Arcana nodded. I never noticed her not snoring. The white crow chuckled from the window sill. I asked, Did she snore when she was a kid? The crow made a noise. The girls looked at me, then at the bird. No dummies. They realized right away that it was not just an albino with bad personal habits. Being sorceresses, they soon understood that it was a genuine crow, too, rather than some creature whose usual form was no form and out of sight. Assuming she is sleeping, she's been there a long time. You'd think she would have wakened on her own. I touched my wife gently. She did not respond. I shook her, much less tenderly. She groaned, muttered, rolled onto her side, pulled her knees up. I said, don't give me that stuff. It's time to get up. The girls smiled. They felt my relief. She was just sleeping now, even if that had been going on for a long time and might go on for a while more. Come on, woman. We've got work to do. You've had enough sleep for ten people. She's sure been getting my share. Lady cracked an eyelid. At the same time, she muttered something incoherent that sounded suspiciously like one of her traditional early morning threats. I said, All that rest hasn't improved her disposition any. I'll remember this next time she claims lack of sleep is why she's cranky. You want me to dump a bucket of cold water on her? Arcana asked. She could be a presumptuous little witch. She does need a bath. Lady growled again, but this time in a lame attempt to be cheerful. I told her, don't even try to be nice. The way the human body works, returning from a coma in a good humor, is flat impossible. Her throat was dry and tight. After we dealt with that, she asked, where are we? How long was I down this time? I had lost track. Fifteen days, at least, probably more, Shukrat said. You were sleeping for all of us. We were all too busy. Lady examined her surroundings. She knew she had not been here before. She could not see Boo Boo from where she sat. I told her, The war is over. We won, sort of. Aridatha Singh surrendered. We offered them good terms. Lady grunted, mind not working swiftly. Mogaba let him do that. The great general isn't with us anymore. I need to talk to you about that, Pop, Shukrat said. I went out to that sandbar. I signed her to silence. Something from the hidden realm would be around somewhere. I continued talking to Lady. A lot of people aren't with us anymore including almost everybody who went to town with us the night you got hit. Sleepy, too, later on, in an ambush. Sovereign took over. He'll be all right. He'll grow into it, as long as we help him. Arcana added, Don't forget the prince and General Chu, and Milosh. I miss him. Because he panted around behind you like a horny hound dog, Shukrat sneered, and you just let him on. And who went out of her way to make sure she wiggled and jiggled whenever he was around? Girls. What? I'm just jealous. Where were you when I was Milos's age? Lady interrupted. What else do I need to know? The palace fell down. We've occupied the city. Aridatha Singh is in charge now, and gets Arcana wiggling and jiggling whenever he comes around. We don't know how the succession will work out. We captured Boo Boo and the Kadidas. We destroyed the Books of the Dead. Again. Boo Boo is right over there, if you want to see her. I extended a hand to help her rise, if she wanted. She's pretty. I want, but I won't be able to stand up by myself. 
I don't think I'll even be able to sit up for long without help. The crow snickered. Lady gave the bird a long, hard look. Then she offered me its twin. I asked, How's your connection with Kina? What do you mean, how is my connection? Did I stutter? Is it still there? Is it stronger? Is it weaker? Why? Because I want to know. Why not answer me? The girls were startled. They looked like they wished they were anywhere else, but they spread out. She didn't take me over while I was sleeping, if that's what you're after. I did have some awful nightmares, though. It was like I was trapped inside her imagination for an age. But she ignored me. She had something on her mind. She came close to grinding her teeth with each word. She did not want to open up. The nightmare went away a while ago. I could understand. The only place I want to reveal myself even a little is here, where hardly anyone will ever notice. Did you have any sense of time? I'm thinking maybe something happening here changed what you were going through there. Sense of time? It was forever, and no time at all. Kina doesn't experience time the way we do. I don't think. She sure doesn't let it oppress her. Come on, show me my baby, before I collapse. She strained to get up. Shukrat and Arkana got hold of her arms and helped her up. Arkana asked, She always this cranky when she wakes up, Pop. You're going to become part of the family. Get used to it. You will if you don't take it personal. I chuckled when Lady asked me how I would like it if she stopped getting personal. She's not bad today. The crow hissed. Clearly, it did not care if Lady figured it out. In fact, what it said sounded like, Sister, sister, which was the taunt Lady had employed a few years ago when she was looking out from behind the eyes of another crow. Curious, the white crows, there has been one around, off and on, since the siege of Dejagore. Back then, Mergen had been the mind behind the bird's eyes, most of the time, apparently. But was Shivetya the mind behind the crow-riding minds? Could he have had that much power to affect events outside the glittering plain? That would explain a good deal. Maybe even Mergen's former difficulties with his place in time— but that would mean that Soulcatcher was not responsible for much of what we believed were her crimes. I was not sure I wanted it to be that way. The bird snickered, like it could read my mind. Soulcatcher always had had a knack for reading me. We lost Mergen, too, I said, as we moved into position facing one another over the unconscious girl. I understood that, from your having told me how many we lost. That would be everyone not wearing Voroshk clothing, correct? Except for one damned lucky soldier from Sien, who managed to be behind the right person at the right time. Lucky is now Tam Do's official nickname. Must be in the blood, Lady muttered, forcing herself to look at the girl. The women of my blood are fated to spend most of their existence trapped and asleep. She rested her weight more fully on the girl's, extended a hand to touch Boo-Boo's cheek. She lapsed into the language of the jewel cities. A sleep like this was the only way I ever saw my mother. She was the one they told the first Sleeping Beauty stories about. Her Prince Charming never came. My father did, and he was content with her the way she was. Now there was a slice of horror to lug around in the back of your brain knowing that your mother was not even aware that you had been born. And we like to whine about how cruel the world is today. They were giants in the olden days. We will be giants ourselves five hundred years from now. So this is our baby, she stared, conceived on a battlefield. Her emotions were plain upon her face. Never had I seen her looking more vulnerable. This is our baby. Shall we wake her up? I don't think so. Not now, anyway. Life is insane enough right now without asking for more trouble. That did not set well. Not at all. 
Lady wanted to establish some kind of emotional dialogue with this flesh of her flesh. For my part, I found that now I had been exposed directly, the emotional distress was fading away. I do not believe my thoughts were skewed by might-have-beens and wish-that-wers. Lady did concede that it might not be a good plan to waken Boo-Boo without Tobo there for backup. She did not do anything untoward, but she did have the girls breathing nervously for a while. Chapter 130 Taglios Cadidas Tobo was there to help when I wakened my old friend Goblin, who had become the unwilling vessel of the Cadidas. It was not that difficult once Tobo's controlling spells had been cancelled. Tobo shook Goblin while I stood by, and once the little shit began to stir, Tobo stood by while I nagged. The little man's eyelids snapped open. The eyes behind them were not the eyes of the hedge wizard Goblin. I was looking straight into large chips of the darkness. Those eyes seemed to want to suck me in. The mouth of the Kadidas opened, preparing to vent some infamy or blasphemy. I interposed one eye's ragged old hat between Kina's slave and myself. The effect was electric. The goblin body convulsed as though I had whacked it with a hot poker. I slapped the hat down on its head. Lift, I told Tobo, who had placed himself at the head of Goblin's cot out of the Kadidas's field of vision. I held the hat in place while Tobo raised Goblin into a sitting position. It works. Better than I hoped. Better than I thought it would, for sure. One eye always did underplay it when he did something right. The wicked light had left Goblin's eyes. Now he just looked empty. Not even a thousand yards stare there. More like nobody at home at all. Do the spear. I did the spear. But man, was I reluctant to trust the wisdom of a dead man when it came to putting that potent a tool into the hands of a devil. I stood it up in front of Goblin, its butt between his heels. I wrapped his hands around the black shaft. Then I shoved one eye's filthy felt relic down onto his head even more solidly. Then I gripped his hands hard, squeezing them onto the silver and black wood. Life began to enter his eyes. I told Tobo, not as dramatic as watching a baby being born, but dramatic enough. Even a dummy like me did not need a map to see that we were conjuring up the real goblin. A goblin in pain so deep, I was aware immediately that only Lady could begin to understand. I settled myself on a stool. Tobo eased Goblin onto a chair with an upright back, then planted himself on the edge of the cot. Goblin kept turning from one of us to the other, tears streaming but unable to speak, however hard he tried. He reached out to Tobo in a silent plea for contact. Careful of that hat, I said. I'm already thinking about nailing it to his head, and thinking about how wonderful a friend one eye had been, too because he had foreseen some possibility like this and had invested his final years in making a rescue feasible. I choked up for a moment, thinking I never had a friend who would go that far for me. Then I recalled that Sleepy had spent fifteen years working to exhume the captured, and now, barely five years later, all those people but Lady and I were gone. Belly up, up in smoke, finished. Soldiers live. Not once had Sleepy ever behaved like she believed that she had wasted her life, but I am sure she had thought it sometimes, regarding some individuals. I said, You ought to keep at least one hand on the spear, Goblin. We had done nothing to rid him of the Kadidas. The monster had been pushed back into the pit where it had lain till it had sprung forward to seize control, but now behind feeble barriers. The monster was much stronger than Goblin. We would have to work hard to keep it suppressed. What are we going to do with you? I asked, and felt a twinge of guilt, because I had plans for him already. Plans that might change the world. 
What do you think, Goblin? You going to help us help you hang on? Goblin was getting some muscle control back. He managed a week. Yeah. As he nodded his head, too. I'm going to leave everything in the hands of you two, gentlemen, Sovereign said. He nodded politely to Goblin. I scarcely knew this man, and then mainly from the perspective of being the butt of practical jokes he and one I played, meaning I might not be disinterested, even if I tried. What is that stuff around the bottom of that thing on his head? Glue. That thing is a hat. You must have seen one eye wearing it. The old fart rigged it up with some spells, planning for something like what did happen. You told me. All right. The glue is because we don't want the hat to come off. Ever. If we could come up with a way that would leave him free to feed himself and scratch his butt, we'd glue his hands to one eye's spear, too. There is something about becoming captain that takes the humor out of a man. It had gotten to Sovereign already. He never cracked a smile. He asked, You gotten any useful information out of him? Not yet. When? I don't know. He's coming around. Really. Remember, in practical terms, he's been dead for six years. He's having trouble figuring out how to use his body again, especially his tongue. Meanwhile, the Kadidas is still inside of him, trying to take over again. And lady? I was more concerned about my wife than I was about Goblin. She was acting strange. It did not seem like I knew her any more. I had resurrected all my earlier worries about her connection with Kina. Kina was the master manipulator and planner. Kina schemed schemes ages long and many layers deep. But Kina was slow, very slow, which was why she favored plots that required years to ripen. She could not handle swiftly changing fortunes. Lady is in a puzzle right now, I confessed, but a benign one. Goblin made a gurgling sound. The Kadidas was working hard to keep him from talking. Sovereign asked, Do you know anything about the leading men of Taglios? Not the current crop, except for types. My advice would just be, don't ever turn your back on any of them. You could talk to Runmust Singh, if he survived the latest fighting. I had a feeling he might have been with Sleepy in that ambush. Or you could just ask Aridatha to loan you a couple of advisors. Sovereign seemed unusually amenable to consulting for a captain of the company. He told me, We need to resume our lessons, so I can study the annals. I responded, We need some peace for that. Maybe a few years. We could build a new company while we're at it. Goblin gurgled again and nodded. The little creature was like a puppy in some ways. I told Sovereign, I need to talk to Goblin a while. Once our hesitant new commander stepped out, I said, We need to work out ways around the Kadidas's interference. Nod. And that's how we'll do it, I guess, unless it can control more than your speech. I peered at the little man. He did not respond. I realized that I had not posed a yes or no question. Can it do that? No. All right, then. The most critical question of all. Is the Kadidas in direct contact with Kina? No. And yes. And a shrug. So we proceeded to play a game of a thousand questions, during which I seemed to go the wrong direction, no matter where I went, making him gurgle in frustration. His best efforts to speak seldom produced more than one recognizable syllable. Eventually, despite my density, I got it. The Kadidas could communicate with the goddess only when it was in control of the goblin flesh. It could not do so when it was not in control. That made sense. Some, though I had been cautioned to remember that the goblin I was interviewing was actually a ghost that had not been able to leave when its body died and had been reanimated by the breath of the goddess. That is exciting news, goblin. Look, I have a plan. Difficult as it was, I dredged a form of it up from its hidden place deep down inside me, hoping the goddess had no way of listening in. 
My plan depended entirely on my understanding of the goblin I had known for so long, hoping he had not altered drastically during the past two decades. A man might change a lot in that much time, if he had to spend part of it dead and enslaved by the mother of deceivers. On the surface, Goblin seemed to like my plan as I presented it, seemed willing to participate, even seemed enthusiastic about plunging One-Eye's spear into the blackest of hearts. I told him, I don't want to waste one minute I don't have to. You understand? Nod, even a gurgled, Yes, with enthusiasm, with outright eagerness. I'll be back soon. I felt almost bad not telling a dead man all of the truth. Chapter 131 Around Taglios Aerial Recon I found Arcana and asked if she wanted to go flying, nodding to indicate that she really did want to make a tour of the upper air. For the benefit of the curious, I mentioned wanting to check rumors that troops loyal to the Protectorate were headed toward the city. One force had crossed the main at Vedna Bota. Another was gathering out east, near Mukra in Ajistan, where Mogaba had enjoyed considerable popularity among the tribes. Since those rumors were beginning to make a lot of people nervous, nobody would be surprised that I would want to take a look. And that is what we did when we were aloft, because it was work that had to be done. Doing the work, though, gave me time to talk to Arcana. She replied, I can see one big problem with your plan. Maybe. What happens to the plane and the shadow gates? You asked me if I wanted to go home. The answer is yes. I don't think to stay, though, just to see what happened there. To bury my dead, I guess you could say. But I don't see how that could keep from complicating everything else if I had to do it first, because there wouldn't be any way later. You're right, and I need to do what I've got to do as soon as I can, before Kina catches on, if she had not foreseen the possibilities already, or learned of them from Goblin, or Shivetya, or from Lady, who was smart enough to guess what I was thinking. Sometimes particularly before my wife catches on or starts thinking I'm chasing around. We were approaching the river main, heading for Vedna Bota. There were pillars of smoke north of the ford, away from the small settlement, but not many. Arcana told me, that's not much of an army. Not in any hurry to get into harm's way, either, looks like. There's plenty of daylight left they could use for traveling. Not in any hurry. When we went down for a closer look, we found men scattering like startled roaches. Somebody covering his ass, I said, making a show of honoring his obligations. That bunch will never actually get to Taglios. We went back up. We talked, not just about what had to be accomplished. Arcana seemed able to relax now, seemed to have made peace with the bad times. Some managed that with comparative ease, Others remain crippled for life. Those are not the sort who remain soldiers. They become ex-soldiers and get intimate with wine or poppies. I asked about her leg. She laughed. I can be one of the old folks now. I can use it to predict the weather. It's all right otherwise. Yes, I do good work. Lots of practice. You get that in this racket. We flew back toward Taglios, chatted in a relaxed way, me thinking that this was what it would have been like had Boo Boo grown up with her parents, me fooling myself, lying to myself. No child would grow up even as normal as Arcana if they had Lady for a mother and me for a father. Maybe I had found the way, adopt them after they had gotten through their formative years. We were passing south of Taglios, going to scout the forces gathering in Ajistan, when Arcana spotted a billowing figure climbing toward us. That's Shukrat. Have you two made peace? Real peace? Sort of. Mainly because we've only got each other. From back home. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't even be talking. 
partly it's because of family stuff, things our parents did to each other, and partly it's us. She's too cute and too sweet and dumb as a bucket of rocks, but all she's ever had to do is make big eyes or bounce a little and look helpless. And you were the smart one, always expected to figure it out for yourself. Yes. Well, you're growing up to be the prettier one, too. Shukrat's going to be all freckles and frump before long. We slowed so Shukrat could catch up. She came up on my other side. I asked, What's up, other daughter? Croker, I wanted to talk about what happened to those men on that island. That scares me. Really bad. I really like Tobo. A lot. I was sure she was bright red behind her facial wraps. She did blush easily. But I don't think I want to be involved with anyone capable of doing that. We're all capable of that, Shukrat. Put in the right place at the right time and given a motive, it's the people around us that keep us from doing it. What do you mean? I mean, Tobo cares about you, probably a lot more than he's willing to admit. He's a passionate kid. Because he's what he is, he's always had the capacity for huge evil, Shukrat. You know, nobody starts out to be a villain. Not the Shadow Masters, not my wife or her sister, not even the Varoshk. But being powerful can turn you villainous, because there's nothing to stop you from doing whatever you want to do, except for something inside you. For Tobo, for a long time, that something was his love and respect for his parents. He fought with Sara every day, but there was no way he was ever going to do something that would disappoint her, while she was alive. After she disappeared, the break on his dark side became his father. But now Mergen is gone, too. So there's only one more person whose good opinion is important enough to him to keep him from letting himself go. Shukrat had to think about that for a while. She was nowhere as dim as Arcana claimed, but there were times when it took her a while to get her mind wrapped all the way around complex issues. You're saying me caring about him is what will keep him from doing that stuff again? Yes, I think that but I also think you have to confront him with your knowledge and make him understand that you won't accept any excuses for behavior like that. Don't nag. Don't carp. State your case firmly and clearly. Then shut up. Don't negotiate. You have to mark out an absolute limit he'll always know is there. And stick with it. You always have to know it's there, too. Shukrat nodded. While I waited to see if she got it, I told Arcana, I might turn out to be pretty good at this fatherly advice stuff. You're definitely long-winded enough. Thanks a lot. For the record, I think you're right, what you said to her. You know what she's talking about. She warned me, in case I wanted to watch out for General Singh. Not long after you warned me about it. I had to go see what you were excited about, didn't I? The girl rose in my estimation every damn day. The force gathering at Mukra was much more of a threat than that at Vedna Bota. It would mean major new trouble if Aridatha, as the new great general, was unable to sell the concept of peace to Mogaba's old allies. Chapter 132 Taglios Wife and Child Lady was sitting beside Boo-Boo again, or still. I pulled up a stool opposite her. Want me to take over for a while? Give you a chance to get out and about and stretch your legs? The Green Dragon Banner Company have a wicked lamb stew going. Don't ask me where they found sheep in this madhouse. She lifted her face. There were tear tracks on her cheeks. Help me, Croker. I can't stop thinking about how much was taken away from me when Narayan Singh stole her, how much that one event changed my life. It changed all our lives. It affected everyone in this end of this world and hundreds of thousands in at least two others. But she was completely self-involved right now. Get up and get out of here, I told her. Go get something to eat. Go flying. It's a beautiful, cool day. 
There are signs that things are going to start greening up soon. Go take it in. I want you to get a hold of yourself before I go. I don't want to leave you here if you don't think you're all right. Go? Where are you going? It's almost time to release the first contingent of the children of the dead. Some of us are going to scout the way south and across the plain and get the guys at the Shadow Gate busy collecting supplies. Why don't you come along? It'll get your mind off things. No, I couldn't. There isn't anyone here who can take care of her. Damn. Now I saw where she was vulnerable. I saw the door the darkness would use to get in, if it had not done so already. Clever me, though. I knew how to close that door forever, and I had just set myself up to take care of it without interference. Go get some stew, strut around, make the soldiers hate me for being lucky enough to have you. There was a time when every man did, when every man responded to Lady the way women did to Aridatha Singh. But those days were gone, and so were all those men but me. I glanced down at Boo-Boo, then up at the silent white crow standing in the open window. It certainly seemed to run in the blood. The white crow was around a lot now, but was quiet about it. So far, I had not forgotten to look around before I said anything I did not want overheard. I needed to keep my fingers crossed for the future, though. Lady dithered. I said, if you don't get going, I'll call some guys in here and have them hold you down while I paddle you. For a moment, the lady I love peeked out of the dark place. She flashed a smile, said, Promise? That might be fun. Once she left, I collected Boo Boo's hand and indulged in a little of the same despair. The girl's fingers were cold as death, but she was breathing. The white crow found it all amusing. You've become sickeningly domestic, lover. I growled something. Ah, I know. You were so stubborn when I had you. But it might be fun to see what happened if somebody said you weren't, after all these years. I grumbled. Well, maybe not fun for you. And after a moment, in a different, sorrowful, almost little girl voice. It could have been something amazing. No doubt, and fatal besides, probably. Chapter 133 Glittering Stone A Dangerous Game Only four of us flew south. Five, if you counted the ragged-ass lazy crow riding the tip of Goblin's flying post. The little man was flying independently, but his movements were limited by a tow rope and a safety harness, each of which connected him to a different companion. We told him it was for his safety while he was learning to manage the post, but even dead he was smart enough to see through that. We did not want him herring off if the Kadidas regained control. Goblin was much stronger now. He could manage most self-care without assistance and many other uncomplicated tasks as well. He had a vocabulary of maybe thirty words, he could lay one eye's spear down for minutes at a time without risk of wakening the demon within. We were blazing along through blue skies, cloaks streaming thirty yards behind, at an altitude low enough to panic livestock and send children running to tell skeptical parents. The girls whooped and shrieked, having a wonderful time. Whomever's turn it was not to mind goblin, sword, and dove. Spring was going to spring soon. With these kids, that might become an adventurous season. With spring would come the rainy season, too. Lots of wet and lots of ferocious weather. I made a couple of brief side trips. The main one was a brief look at De Jagore, where life had settled into a semblance of normalcy, and nobody was mourning the passing of one of the city's most famous daughters. Probably not one in a thousand people outside the garrison knew that Sleepy called De Jagere home. The other side trips involved looking for evidence of the Neff in places where I thought I might have seen them before. I found nothing. Since there had been no sign of those ghosts of the glittering stone outside my own glimpses, 
I was pretty sure what I had seen had not been the genuine articles. Tobo had expressed a suspicion that, had I not been imagining things, what I had seen were some of his hidden folk trying out disguises. He believed some would do that just for the hell of it. The folklore of the land of unknown shadows supported his contention. In fact, that sort of prank was a huge favorite. So probably the Neff were less of a problem than I had feared. But a problem even so, unless they were trapped in the Varoshk world. Pandaman at the Shadow Gate robbed me of that foolish hope. They're out there begging and whining every night, Captain. Looks like you guys have made yourselves right at home. They had built themselves a tiny hamlet, complete with women and livestock, most of both showing signs of gravidity. Best duty we ever had, Captain. Well, now is when it starts getting tough. I spun out a gaggle of orders. Then me and my new daughters, my pal the White Crow and my dead friend, passed through the Shadow Gate. Though I could see nothing, I thought I could sense the pressure of the Neff inside. The plain boasted a thousand patches of dirty snow. Old snow lay drifted against the standing stones on their west sides. The air was bitterly cold. The place was getting its weather from somewhere other than my native world, and it had an air of neglect, as though the residents had given up housekeeping and maintenance. The neglect was less evident inside the nameless stronghold. The stench of human waste was gone. Evidently Baladitya had cleaned up after Shivetya's Vorosk guests. But there was a taint of wasted human. We need some light, I told the girls. Still competing with one another in some ways, both hastened to create those little will-o'-the-wisp glowing balls that seem to be the first trick any sorcerer learns. The source of the odor was obvious instantly. Baladitya had fallen asleep at his work table and had not yet awakened. The chill, dry air had done a lot to preserve him. I was unhappy, but not surprised. Baladitya must have been an antique when I was born. Arkana and Shukrat made appropriate noises expressing sorrow. This isn't good, I muttered, staring at the copyist's remains. I was counting on him to help me talk to Shivetya. From somewhere in the darkness, the white crow said, Hi there, soldier, looking for a good time. Fumbling around after oil with which to refill Baladitya's empty lamps, I said, Ah, yes, you. All is not lost, but neither is it found. What? That voice was a high-pitched squeak, I wondered how she managed to produce so many of those, even when using a bird to do her talking. Trust. I recalled a time when anything she said scared the shit out of me. I guess familiarity does breed... something. I was almost comfortable with her. Why on earth would you expect me to trust anything you say? It helped my courage, knowing she was buried and in a sort of undying coma. Shivetya won't let me lie. Right. Call me a cynic. But I had a notion that the golem might have been with us more than Kina had over the years. A notion that it would be impossible to untangle his manipulations from hers. A suspicion that he might be just as much a deceiver as she was when it came to maneuvering toward the end of the world. Right then. Got your word, do we? I'm comfortable with that. Let's get started. Does the goddess know we're here? Does she know what's in my mind? Her attention is elsewhere. The girls took over filling and lighting the lamps. They were good girls. They had learned to do for themselves. And they watched their daddy at work with respect and awe. Or at least they wondered what I was doing, talking to a crow that looked diseased. And having the crow talk back like it was intelligent. I told Arcana, If you could read and write Taglian, you'd understand all about this, because you'd be able to keep up with the annals. No thanks, Pop. Not even a good try. I said no yesterday, I'm telling you no today, and all you're going to hear is no again tomorrow. 
I'm not going to get pulled any deeper into your mob than I already am. Which is what Sovereign used to say. Sovereign, who started out as a prisoner of war. Shukrat said, Don't even bother to look over here. I had not considered Shukrat. I would not. But I did think Arcana might work out, if she would give it a chance. She had a personality suitable to be one of the gang. Recruiting season over, the crow demanded. For now, I peered into the darkness, trying to make out more details of the golem. There was not enough light, but the demon seemed to be asleep, or at least uninterested, which puzzled me since I was there to set him free. I shrugged. His indifference would not slow me down. I collected Goblin. I led him well out onto the floor of Shivetya's vast hall, away from other ears. Had I brought a lamp along, I would have been able to see how lovingly the floor detailed the features of the plain outside. I reviewed for the little man. Kina is a very slow thinker. We need to get this done before she understands that we're already here, that we intend to strike and that we do have a weapon puissant enough to do the job. one eye spear shimmered all the time here. Filaments of fire slithered over it in unpredictable patterns, excitedly. The edges of its head groaned as they sliced the air itself. It seemed to sense that it had come home. No one could argue that the spear was not a masterpiece of a peculiar sort of art. No one could deny that in creating his masterwork, One Eye had reached a level of inspiration seen nowhere else in his long but rather pathetic life. Many an artistic masterpiece has fallen into that same category, the sole triumph of the genius of its creator. Once we reach the black veil across the stairwell, she'll start to realize her danger. You'll have to move fast. Get up as much speed as you can, so you can drive the spear as deep as you can. The lance of passion wasn't potent enough, but it wasn't made for God-slaying. One Eye's spear is. You could name it God-slayer, you know. You were there during most of the years he worked on it. When we were in Sien, it became his whole career. Goblin had been there, but that goblin had been alive not a ghost still trapped in the flesh it had worn in life. At least part of the time, this goblin was an agent of the very monster this goblin was going to kill, or maim, or just irritate. As the doubts began to circle round me like Tobo's hidden realm friends, I kept right on talking, explaining yet again why he was the only one of us who could make the strike. And he really did find my arguments compelling, or else his mind was made up and the hopes and wishes of others no longer mattered. The goblin thing climbed back aboard his flying post. I pushed my own forward so I could see the tip of his and make doubly sure I knew which one he was riding. Let's go downstairs then, I said. I'll be right behind you. Your post is spelled to come back on its own if you're unconscious. He knew. He had been there when Shukrat fixed it to do that. If that doesn't work, I'll swoop in and grab you, drag your ass away. If you want, I even brought an extra hundred yards of line to hook onto your safety harness. We can tie it to your belt. The little man looked at me like he thought I was trying too hard. He had been working himself up for a suicide mission, convinced that the destruction of his flesh was the only way he could rid himself of his parasite and find rest himself. I played the whole scam by ear. I had no real idea what Goblin really wanted or what he hoped to achieve with the false life he had been given. I had not been able to guess much about him when he was alive. The only thing I knew for sure was that he was working crippled. Doing without one eye was for him like doing without one of his limbs. And he did want to hurt Kina. That was never in doubt. A long, difficult discussion ended up with me chagrined a bit as I finally got the message that Goblin was not deeply interested in backup that would pull him out if things went sour. He wanted backup that would make sure the job got done, even if he failed. 
I do not know why I had so much trouble recognizing and understanding Goblin's program. Possibly because I was concentrating on getting things to go forward exactly the way I wanted. Goblin had told me almost everything before, one time or another, when I had been focused enough to ask. Personally uninclined toward mortal self-sacrifice, I had trouble overriding my cynical nature, particularly as regarded someone as self-indulgent as Goblin had been for so long. Goblin brandished one eye's spear and told me what I had already told him, but had not done. Time to go downstairs, Croker. He got it all out in a single, bell-tone, clear sentence. I patted myself down. Final check. Still not sure I was ready for this. Chapter 134 Taglios, Best Served Cold The only check on Tobo was Lady, who could not maintain her level of interest. The only check on Lady was the Wonder Boy, and he had other things on his mind, and altogether too much of that touched by the darkness. No Shukrat, no Croker, no Lady paying attention. Nights in the city lost their traditional noisome urban charm. Some people began to compare the New Age to a time when the Protector had loosed her murderous shadows upon the city for no more obvious reason than existed behind the unleashing of the horrors out there now. The fact that there were few actual deaths went unremarked. The unknown shadows enjoyed themselves greatly, tormenting the living, as did Tobo, who found himself free to do anything he wanted. Except in his dreams. A woman had begun to haunt those, a beautiful Nguyen Bao woman who seemed to be the embodiment of sorrow. He understood in his heart that this was his mother as she had appeared when she was young, before she had met his father. Usually she was not alone. Sometimes she was accompanied by a young, unbent Nana Gota, and sometimes by another woman, always gentle, always with a smile, forged of steel tougher than that of Uncle Doge's sword Ash Wand. This woman, who had to be his great-grandmother, Hong Tre, never spoke. She communicated more with a disapproving eye than Sara could say in a hundred words. His vengeances were unacceptable to all these women who had created and formed him. Tobo could not determine if he was being touched by the ghosts of his ancestors, a possibility entirely in keeping with Nguyen Bao beliefs, or if the women were the product of some conscience-stricken seller of his mind. The darkness within him was strong enough to make him want to defy them. None of them wanted to be avenged. Sara's ghost warned, you won't just hurt yourself, darling. If you go on, you'll be running into a trap. Put aside your pain. Embrace your true destiny and let it lift you up. Hong Tre studied him with eyes like cold steel marbles, agreeing that he had come to a crossroads, that he was about to make a choice that would shape the rest of his life. He knew, of course, that the words the ghost women spoke, and the ghosts themselves, had to be metaphors, he had no trouble with his conscience when he was awake, so he tried to avoid sleep. Sleep deprivation clouded his judgment even further. The hidden folk always reported the same thing. Aridatha Singh would not leave his offices. He worked day and night, seldom doing more than catnap, as he tried to hold the Taglian world together by the weight of his own will. The struggle to maintain control ought to have beaten him down and have shredded his spirit in days. Most men would have started cutting throats to more swiftly facilitate reconstruction and assuage frustration. Aridatha just beat people down with reason and public opinion. He treated with no one in secret. He made sure the world knew when someone refused to handle the city's business publicly. Obstructionists were becoming known— the mood of people displaced by strife and fire was not forgiving of traditional factionalism. The unthinkable happened. Several men of high caste were beaten savagely. Shadar were seen in the crowds, encouraging the violence. No one wondered, though, and Aridatha Singh did not appear to be aware of that personally. 
It was deep night, but a light traffic continued to and from the city battalion's barracks containing Aridatha Singh's headquarters. A dark fog slowly gathered around the place. People grew sleepy. Shadows scampered among the shadows. For an instant, here and there, little people or little animals were visible briefly, had anyone been awake to see them. Tobo came walking through it all, so tired his eyes were crossing, so sure of himself that he had not brought his flying post, nor had he armored himself in Voroshk black, so sure of himself that he did not double-check reports from his unknown shadows. He expected to walk in, complete his revenge, and be gone with no one the wiser. Aridatha Singh's fate would become a great and terrible mystery. The hidden folk could tell him nothing about Singh's office. They could not get inside it. It was kept sealed airtight. But the sentries outside were snoring. Tobo shoved the door. It gave way only grudgingly, swinging inward. He stepped inside, panting. Across the room, three men had fallen forward onto a work table or lay sprawled in their chairs. Not good, Tobo muttered, unexcited by the presence of the potential witnesses. Not good at all, Aridatha said, lifting his face off the desktop. Tobo just had time to catch the swish of air behind him before something hit the back of his head with force enough to crack bone. He went down into the darkness knowing he had been betrayed, that he had walked into a trap. The unknown shadows scattered in every direction, going mad, making Taglios a city of nightmares. Sara, Gota, and Hong Tre all awaited Tobo on the other shore of consciousness. All three told him that this was a disaster entirely of his own devising. He could have avoided it simply by doing the right thing. He had been warned beforehand. He had not listened. Sara's sorrow was deeper than ever Tobo had known it before. Chapter 135 Taglios The Mad Season Lady dealt with the temptation easily for several days after Croker departed. She kept reminding herself that all she had to do was hang on till he got back. By then, the Daughter of Night would not be the Deceiver Messiah anymore. She would be just plain boo-boo. Sense told Lady to be patient, but emotion knew no patience, and emotion threatened to devour her. Despite her long history, emotion had stolen control. She broke after only four days. Lady took a quick look into the hallway to make certain no one was likely to intervene, then settled on a stool beside her daughter's bed. She plucked the ends of strands of spells, keeping the girl asleep and constrained. She worked quickly and deftly. She had been studying Boo Boo's bonds all those four days. Those spells unraveled almost as if they had a will of their own. Lady proceeded with an uncharacteristically naive haste. That part of her that had grown hard and bitter in the real world mocked her for her childishness. This was the world, her world, the real world. There was no reason to expect any good to come her way. Boo-Boo's eyes snapped open with mechanical suddenness. The color was right, but still they were not the family eyes, nor were they Croker's eyes. They were eyes colder than Lady's own in her cruelest hour. They were the eyes of a serpent, a naga, or a deity. For an instant, Lady froze like a mouse caught in a snake's stare. Then she said, I'm an incurable romantic. The essence of romance is an unshakable conviction that next time will be different. She tried to assert control while the girl was physically too weak to act. The girl's love-me aura had touched Lady already, so subtly that she remained unaware of it until it was too late. Lady had not worn her Varoshk costume. There was no shelter from the storm. A vibration developed down deep inside her, at glacial speeds. As it built, she watched the power of the goddess slowly fill the daughter of night. The buzz within Lady included a trace of mirth. She understood that her unpracticed maternal emotions had been discovered and manipulated ever so subtly for a very long time. 
so subtly that she had not suspected. Worse, so subtly that she was not adequately prepared to respond to any disaster. Nevertheless, she was a woman of incredible will, having had ages to practice employing it. There was a counter-move left. In an instant, Lady made the cruelest decision of her life. She would regret it forever, but knew the choice she made would leave her with the least painful long-term wounds. The Lady of Charm had centuries of practice making terrible decisions quickly, and just as many years of practice living with the consequences. From her belt, Lady drew a memento of her brief passage as captain of the Black Company. The dagger's pommel was a silver skull with one ruby eye. The ruby always seemed to be alive. Lady lifted the blade slowly, her gaze locked with that of the Daughter of Night. The sense of the presence of Kina grew ever stronger between them. I love you, Lady said, responding to a question never asked, existing only within the girl's heart. I will love you forever. I will always love you. But I won't let you do this thing to my world. Lady could do it, in spite of all. She had slain as dear before, when she was not yet as old as the child lying beneath her knife, and for less reason. She felt a madness creep through her. She tried to concentrate. She could kill, because she was filled with a conviction that there was no better thing she could do. Kina and the Daughter of Night both strove to crack Lady's terrible will, but the dagger descended toward the girl's breast, its progress inexorable. The Daughter of Night quickly became the hypnotized prey, unable to believe that Lady's blade kept falling. The tip of the knife touched cloth. It passed through, found flesh, then a rib. Lady shifted her weight so she could drive the blade between bones. She never sensed it coming. The blow, seemingly struck to the right side of her head, was powerful enough to hurl her sideways a half dozen feet into a wall. Darkness closed in. For an instant there was a living dream in which she saw herself trying to strangle her child instead of stabbing her. The Daughter of Night felt fire rip across her chest as her would-be killer flung toward the wall. She screamed, but the agony that moved her was not that of her wound. It was a black explosion inside her mind, a sudden tidal wave of knife-like shards of a thousand dark dreams, of a scream harsher than ten thousand whetstones sharpening swords, of a rage so vast and red it could be called the Eater of Worlds. That blow was violent enough to fling her upward and to one side, she came down, sprawled across the still form of her birth mother. But she did not know. She was unconscious long before gravity placed and posed her. A whiff of old death, of graveyard mold, hung in the air of the room. Chapter 136 Fortress with No Name God Stalking Goblin was too eager. Twice I felt compelled to yell at him to slow down. He plunged down the dark stairwell at a pace I could not match. Even wearing the Varosh apparel, the bruising impacts with the walls became too much for my nerve. We had not yet gone as deep as the ice cavern where Soulcatcher lay when I bellowed an order to stop. Wonder of wonders, this time Goblin heard me and listened and responded when I told him we had to go back up. What? He turned the word into a two-syllable whisper from an old tomb. We can't do this in the dark. We'll beat ourselves unconscious before we get down there, or at least get there too beaten up to think. He made a sound that signified reluctant agreement. He had had a few unpleasant collisions of his own. We have to go get lights. Why had I overlooked something so obvious? because I was too damned busy looking for the subtle and the sneaky, I suppose. The stairwell was much too tight to turn the flying posts. We had to back them up. That was a slow, humbling, sometimes painful task, and things did not get much less humiliating when we did reach the top. The girls and the white crow awaited us. In attitudes so smug, they could be read even though the ladies were clad for action. 
Arcana swung a lantern back and forth. For an instant, I suffered an entirely irrelevant worry because I had not brought my Widowmaker costume. It seemed appropriate to the situation, but definitely not necessary. All that armor ever was was a costume. Now Shukrat waved a lantern back and forth and laughed. Not a word, I grumped. Did I say anything? You're thinking it, darling daughter. She raised her lantern higher, the better to see what I was wearing. My apparel was in slow, creeping motion all around me, repairing extensive damage. Not a word from me, old-timer. You know your Shukrat honors her elders to a fault. But I'm going to laugh now. Please don't jump to conclusions and think that it's at you. Arcana laughed harder. Goblin made a series of noises, depleting his vocabulary fast. He's right. Give us those lanterns. We need to get this done. I hoped my dimwit failure to consider the need for light would not be the one little thing that got us destroyed, and that that was the last little thing I had been dumb enough to forget. Goblin took the lantern from Shukrat. He headed down into the earth again. He was not nearly so hurried this time. Possibly his lust for revenge had begun to cool. I took Arcana's lantern. The white crow flapped over the tip of my post. Before I finished telling it that traveling with me might not be a good idea, Shukrat had another lantern going and was helping Arcana get herself another lit. The girls had been ready for us. I bickered with them all the way down to the ice cavern. They had fun with me all the way. They refused to listen to my warnings. The white crow decided the cave of the ancients would be a fine place to detour. I bellowed, Don't touch anything in there! Especially don't touch yourself! I continued, mumbling, When will I learn to keep my big damned mouth shut? It would be a great and wonderful irony if the bird's touch was soul catcher's undoing after all her lucky years. Goblin got the hurries again. When I tried to slow him down, he told me, There's something going on with Kina. She's starting to stir. Shit. Keeping up was impossible until we reached the black barrier. There, Goblin's nerve failed him. There he froze, recalling the horror of the years he had spent on the other side. Goblin, we're almost there. We've got to do this. We've got to do it now. Numb as I was to things supernatural, even I could sense Kina's proximity and her heightened awareness. Which must not be our fault. Her attention was focused elsewhere. Now, I said with more force. Behind us, the girls had begun whispering, troubled. They sensed much more than I ever could. I told them, You two go back upstairs now. I guarantee you that you'll be glad you did, especially if things don't work out for us. Goblin. He reclaimed his courage, or maybe just found his hatred again. His face hardened. He started forward. Don't rush! I stage whispered as he passed through the black barrier. Girls, I mean it. Start running now. There have to be some survivors. I pushed through the terrible barrier behind Goblin, nearly messing myself with the fear. Despite what I had told the little man, this was no time to be slow or tentative. Once we breached the barrier, Kina knew that we had come. Her slowness would be our only ally. Once I breached that barrier, I flung myself into the anteroom area outside the entrance to Kina's prison. Goblin lined himself up to charge. I had to do several things at once. Encourage him, prepare myself to weather what was about to happen, and do my thankless bit to make this deicide work. Got to keep the whole picture in mind. Got to do each thing on time, in the right order, just the way you worked it out over the last few months. As Goblin surged forward, I placed my flying post into the angle where the floor met the left-hand wall, then plastered myself against the wall above it and willed my Varoshk clothing to form a protective scab over it and me. Then, in light almost too dim for use, I found the right page in the First Father's notebook. I kept my protection open just enough to let me watch Goblin hurtle straight at Kina and, to my surprise, 
drive One Eye's spear into her temple. I had expected him to go for the heart. I completed the cantrip that would destroy Goblin's post, finished shutting me and my post in. Then I allowed myself to feel lower than snake shit because of what I was doing. I had been hard at work justifying myself to myself for months and had carried on. But now it was happening, and when it was over, I would have to live with my deceits forever. The entire universe shook. The cavern where Kina lay was big, but it was confined. The stairwell was the only escape the products of that violence could find. The energy wave pounded at my protection. I clung to the stone wall beneath layers and layers of Varosh material while the universe howled and shuddered. I swore that if Kina was powerful enough to get through this, I would enlist in her service myself, because the only thing tougher than her would be the guys who tied her up, and they had not been seen for several millennia. The noise began to fade, but I had trouble hearing it go. The roar had deafened me temporarily. I hoped the girls did head back up the way I told them. I hoped the violence did no damage elsewhere. I doubted that it would. A major earthquake had split the plane open without destroying the ice caves or doing any harm down here. I willed the Varoshk clothing to open a crack through which I could see. If need be, if Kina had survived but was injured, I would push my post in there and blow it too. And if I survived a second blast, I would start hoping that I did not suffer a heart attack or starve to death while trying to climb those miles of steps. The material protecting me had been so traumatized that it took ten minutes to respond. It twitched and shivered and crawled, moving in small surges as it tried to heal itself. Once I had an eye hole, I discovered that there was nothing to see. Intense bright light still burned inside Kina's cell. It might have been fading, but it was going slowly if it was. It was half an hour before I could look for details without having my eyeballs hurt. Just as well, it took that long for my protective outfit to heal and relax sufficiently to allow me off the wall. Those outfits are made smart. They take just long enough recovering to keep you from doing something stupid. I mounted my post and moved forward knowing as I went that my protection would not survive another blast soon. At first, I could find nothing. Later, after the light faded some more, I began to discover bits of what might once have been tooth or bone embedded in various surfaces. Of flesh, be it goblins or the goddesses, there was no sign. In fact, I doubted that any of the tooth and bone fragments could have belonged to any mere mortal. The explosion had been that violent, more violent even than those that had destroyed the Varoshk Shadow Gate that had initiated the collapse of the palace. Kina's destruction had somehow added vast energy to the explosion. My post was not behaving quite right. It stuttered and was slow to respond. It must have gotten rattled around some, even though I had done my best to protect it. Once the light faded round where the goddess had lain, I saw what looked like a long black snake lying in the rubble of Kina's rock bed. It was the only non-white thing in the place other than me. I approached carefully, for all I knew that was the bone of darkness that had snuggled next to Kina's heart, and I was prepared to believe that anything I saw or experienced in this place would be illusion. Kina was the mother of deceit. One of the great powers of the deceivers was their ability to leave you doubting everything and trusting no one. The black thing was no snake. It was the deformed remains of One-Eye's spear. It had come through the violence with surprisingly little damage. It was just twisted and bent a little, and lightly charred on its surface. The metal inlays had been only slightly distorted by intense heat. Man, he must have put some artful protective spells onto that thing. I gathered the spear, went and made sure that I was securely attached to my post, then gave it the command to take me back to base point. Chapter 137 Taglios The Melancholy Wife 
We wobbled down out of the sky like a family of mangy buzzards. My Varoshk clothing still had not healed completely. The girls were more tattered than I. The blast had caught them climbing the stairwell. They had bruises over most of their bodies. The real miracle was how well all the posts had come through, though none remained unscathed. The Grove of Doom rose to meet us, welcoming us like a mother greeting lost children. Bizarre thoughts and images kept worming into my mind now. They worried me. They made me doubt that Kina was actually gone, not just in hiding. Jokingly, Shukrat told me what I ought to be worried about was Kina's father and husband wanting to get even. I did not laugh. To me, it seemed like a worthy concern. The Grove of Doom was empty, of humanity. But some birds had moved in already, and there were a few small animals in the underbrush now. There was no sense of grim foreboding about the place any more. We did it, I sighed. Finally, for real. No more Kina to torment the worlds. Not having spent their lives under the threat of the Year of the Skulls, the girls were less excited. The white crow settled on a nearby branch, divested itself of a dirty feather. Are you sure? The beast was having lots of fun tickling my fears. She and I seemed to be headed for a long and unpleasant relationship, unless I kept my promise to Shivetya. I said, If there was any place in this world where Kina's survival would manifest itself, that would be here. This place has been almost a part of her since her cult began, and that might have been here. I don't think she could disengage herself from the grove even if she wanted to. Then let's get going, Shukrat said. Arkana sneered. She can't wait to get her hands on Tobo again. She was not being mean-spirited. And Shukrat's counterfire included a mention of Aridatha Singh and Arkana's terminal timidity, which did turn Arkana serious. Hey, Pop, what do you think Kina being gone will mean to the Daughter of Night? Walking on eggshells, but worried by the glances she had seen Sing lay upon the girl, not entirely believing that every man reacted like that. Is she going to turn normal? Shukrat showed a sudden interest, too. I don't know, baby doll. I worry, though. She's been connected to Kina from the second she was conceived. Seems like to her it would be about like you or me having our liver ripped out. I was more worried about my wife. Her losing her connection to Kina would devastate her. Everything she was, in her own heart, was tied up in her being the terrible sorceress. Without Kina to leech from, she would be just another middle-aged woman gone dumpy and gray. The weather had been problematic all the way up from the Shadowgate. We had to skirt rainstorms and thunderheads again and again. That had cost us more than a day. Now, only twenty miles out... There was no evading the weather, except by going up way high, where it was icy cold and almost impossible to breathe, then zigging back and forth between seething mountains of cloud while being tossed and taunted by turbulence. Shukrat and Arkana were dead set against getting caught aloft in a thunderstorm. Arkana told me, Think what might happen if you got hit by lightning. I did not think long. There was no one I wanted to see badly enough to have my post blow up between my legs. I headed for the ground. We holed up in a goony farming village where the locals treated us with the same cautious respect they would have shown a trio of Nagas, the evil serpent people goony myth has living deep underground, but surfacing to plague humanity on numerous occasions, always a couple, three villages away. We did not steal any of their babies or maidens, nor their sacred cattle, nor even their sheep. I found it interesting that they were sufficiently flexible religiously to raise sheep for sale to folks like the Vedna, who were going to gobble them right down. The lightning quit stomping around soon after midnight. We left our hosts with coin enough to have them blessing our names, which we never mentioned. There was no lightning now, but there was a steady light rain. The Varoshka apparel helped, but only some. I was cold and miserable, and my pet crow, now riding right in front of me in order to get under a fold of my cloak, 
was so far gone in the miseries that it no longer bothered to complain. The company barracks seemed both unnaturally quiet and abnormally alert. Armed sentries appeared everywhere. Looks like Sovereign's worried about an attack. Something must have happened. I hovered. You girls sense anything? Something definitely isn't right, Arcana said. I don't know what. We'd better find out. Gone less than two weeks and everything had gone to hell. Sovereign explained. I controlled myself and did not run off to see Lady before I got the whole story. Sovereign told me, General Singh has Tobo in a cell that's isolated, so the unknown shadows can't reach him for instructions. Singh won't let anyone visit Tobo. We do know the kid is hurt, though. Obviously, or he wouldn't put up with this. He tried something stupid. Oh, yes, and I don't have the horses to get him out of it. Now you do, if you want to bother. What about Lady? We don't know what happened. Nobody was there, and I've had no reports recently. Last I heard, she was conscious, but sullen and unresponsive, and the girl is worse. Your effort was successful. Pretty much, which probably explains Lady and Boo Boo. I did not expand. It feels creepy around here. Gets more that way every night. Tobo's friends aren't happy, and they get unhappier by the hour. But Aridatha isn't intimidated. We'll see if we can't change that. After I see my wife, or the person who used to be my wife. I took Arcana with me, just in case. Don't say anything, just stay in the background and cover me, I told her. There was a guard outside my quarters, but he was not there to keep anyone in. Probably not to keep anyone out, either. He was an early warning marker for Sovereign. He and I exchanged nods. He broke Arcana's heart by failing to notice that she was an attractive young woman. I guess that was supposed to be obvious despite the Varoshk outfit. Lady sat at a small table. She stared into nothingness. At some time she had been playing a solitaire-type card game, but had lost interest long ago. The lamp beside her was almost drained of oil. Black smoke boiled off it because its wick needed trimming. Wherever she was looking, it was plain she saw nothing but despair. She had lost all interest in maintaining her appearance. I laid my good hand on her right shoulder. Darling, I'm back. She did not respond right away. Once she did recognize my voice, she pulled away. You did it, she said, more thinking out loud than actually speaking to me. You did something to Kina. Only in the you was there any human emotion. I glanced back at Arcana to see if she was paying attention. This would be a critical moment. I killed her, just the way we contracted to do. If there was any fragment of the goddess in her now, that ought to provoke a reaction. It did, but not the physical attempt at revenge I would have preferred. Almost. She just started crying. I did not remind her that she had known this day was coming. Instead, I asked, How is Boo-Boo? How is she taking it? I don't know. I haven't seen her. What? Before I left, we couldn't get you away from her long enough to eat. The dam broke. The tears started. She became a woman I had not seen before, busted open like an overly ripe fruit. I tried to kill her. What? She had spoken very softly. I tried to kill her, Croker. I tried to murder my own daughter. I tried, with all my will and strength, to put a dagger in her heart. And I would have done it if something hadn't knocked me out. I know you, so I know there was a reason other than you just thought it might be fun. What was it? She babbled. Years of holding everything together gave way. The floods swept all before them. The timing matched my assault on Kina. Lady's violent reaction to Boo-Boo could have been caused by fear leaking through from the goddess. Boo-Boo's own behavior would have been shaped the same way. Lady sobbed for a long time. I held her. I feared for her. She had fallen so far, and I had been ballast almost every foot of the way down. 
all my fault, or just the spark and romance of youth's summer turning to the bleak seasons of despair of old age. Arcana was a good daughter. She stood by patiently throughout the emotional storm. She remained there for me without intruding on my wife's black hours. After we left, I thanked her profoundly. You think she'll be able to pull herself back together? Arcana asked. I don't know. I don't know how to make her want to. If she did, I wouldn't have any worries. She's got an iron will when she wants to direct it. Right now, I'm just going to try to keep on loving her and hoping something happens to sting her with a spark of hope. I don't know if I could stand being completely powerless either. I might kill myself. 999 people out of a thousand live their whole lives without having a millionth of your power, and they get by. Only because they're completely ignorant of what they're missing. Nobody mourns losing what they never had in the first place. She had me there. The full meaning of Lady's melancholy would be denied me forever, because I was never able to experience life as she had at the opposite extreme whereas she knew my way of life very well indeed, and that might be contributing to her despair as well. Chapter 138 Taglios The Lost Child Boo-Boo was worse than Lady. She was lost inside herself. She had real guards watching her. They told me she had not done anything but stare into infinity since she recovered consciousness. Not once had they felt any urge to serve her or ravish her. One guard was a Shadar who had followed Sleepy since the Kialune Wars. He told me, Suravija Singh and her children are taking care of her. I felt a slight twinge. Iqbal Singh's widow, favored by Sleepy, but I had been unaware that the family had survived the fighting south of Taglios. I had been too centered on my own preoccupations to look after the welfare of company dependents. The daughter of night was clean and well-groomed and had been dressed carefully. She sat in a rocking chair, which was an unusual piece of furniture in these parts. She was aware of nothing outside the boundaries of her mind. She drooled on her pretty white sari, which was only a shade paler than her near-albino skin. Someone had placed a rag where it would catch the drool. Speaking of albinos, the white crow had managed to arrive before me, but it was being very careful not to piss me off these days. It had overheard enough here and there to suspect that I might have a great deal of influence on its future. Shivetya had given us an unbelievable amount of help in return for our promise to end his stewardship of the glittering plane. I meant to keep that promise. I try to keep all of the company's promises. Keeping our promises is what separates us from people like the Radisha, who try to screw us rather than keep their word when that seems inconvenient. I circled Boo-Boo twice. She gave no sign she was aware of me. I knelt in front of her. Her eyes were open. Her pupils were tiny. Her eyes did not track when I moved a finger back and forth in front of them. I backed off and considered options. Finally, I led Arcana into the hallway, told her what I wanted to try and how she could help. We rejoined Boo-Boo and the bird. Neither appeared to have moved a muscle. Arcana and I separated, each moving slowly, as though hoping to drift around behind Boo-Boo without being noticed. Once there, we just waited, and waited. It is hard to be patient when you are Arcana's age. Eventually, she began to fidget, which caused the occasional faint whisper of motion, after which she would even stop breathing for a while. After a time so long, even I began to get restless. I signaled Arcana forward. Doing her absolute best to remain totally silent, she dropped to her knees beside Boo-Boo's right rocker, out of sight behind the girl's right ear, but with her face so close, Boo-Boo might be able to feel the warmth of her presence. I did the same on the left. Neither of us moved till my knees were about to kill me. We tried to avoid breathing on the girl. I nodded. Arcana whispered, Sosa, Sosa, 
so softly that I could not hear her, so softly that even someone who did hear the words whispered directly into her ear would not be able to make them out. I have no idea why she chose to say that. I leaned closer so the warmth of my presence would be a hint more obvious. I nodded. Sosa, Sosa, no louder than before. The skin on Bubu's neck twitched. I smiled at Arcana, winked. Treachery will out. Sosa, Sosa. Slowly, the girl began to turn her head toward Arcana, the child within unable to restrain her curiosity. It was not that she had been faking, just that nothing obvious was going to sneak past her palisade of despair. I got up and drifted so she would not discover me without making a special effort. Arcana gave me a look which asked how I had known that Bubu could be reached. I shrugged. Just intuition, I guessed. A conviction that her curiosity could be wakened if it was teased with sufficient subtlety. But what now? how to hold her attention forcefully enough to keep her from running away again. Soon the girl was seeing and hearing us perfectly well, but still she did not respond. Still she would not answer questions. She had no will to live, and I could see why. At no time had there ever been anything in her life but Kina and the struggle to release the goddess. Never had there been anything but the quest to bring on the Year of the Skulls. Suruvija appeared. I had not known her in the days when she and her husband joined the company. She might have been a beauty then, but I doubted it. She was not now, and none of her children made you want to jump in and hug them. But they were good people, if sad. You got her to wake up, Suruvija said. That's great. Now we need to keep her that way. Any ideas? Why? We all turned to the girl. I asked, what? Why do you trouble me? Release me. I have no reason to live. There is no future. There will be no salvation and no resurrection now. There will be no age of wondrous rebirth. She was wide awake now, but bleak, depressed. I dropped to my knees in front of her, took her hands in an effort to keep her engaged with the world outside her head. What does that mean? what you just said? She seemed puzzled by the question. I spent a few minutes demonstrating my ignorance of her faith. I hoped a chance to explain might animate her. I have not yet encountered a true believer who could resist an opportunity to expostulate upon his particular truth. Boo-Boo was no exception, though she was a slow starter. I did not interrupt her until near the end. Until that point she did not mention anything I had not heard before, somewhere, in some version. Excuse me, I said. I think I missed something. The Year of the Skulls isn't the end of the world. Suravija's oldest boy, Bijar, arrived with food and drink. I made sure Bubu got served first. She sucked down a pint of water before telling me, Yes, it is the end of the world. Of this world, the way it is now. It's a cleansing, a time when all evil and corruption get swept away, and only those souls with a genuine chance of redemption get left on the wheel of life. I felt confused. I felt lost. I did not understand. I knew the deceivers wanted to hasten the coming of the Year of the Skulls. That was pretty much what their cult was all about. I knew most Guni wanted the opposite but believed that the coming of the Year of the Skulls was inevitable. Someday. It was one of the ages of creation, the fourth age, ordained at the dawn of time. But this was the first I ever heard that there was supposed to be something on the other side, particularly something apparently positive. I murmured to myself, All evil dies there an endless death. Then I asked, you're telling me Kina's ultimate task was to clear away all the human dross so that good and righteous men can pass on to paradise. Exasperated by my density, she shook her head violently, then went to work trying to explain. I whispered to Arcana, Have them bring my wife. 
I am not as dim as I pretended with my daughter that evening, but I admit I never did get what she was trying to explain. However, I did realize that she truly believed that by destroying Kina, I had deprived the world of any opportunity to get past its current age of sin and corruption into an age of enlightenment. I guess Kina had been meant to devour all the demons again, only this time those would have been the devils of humankind who make life and history over into torture chambers. The Lords of Light were going to have to take it from the top, hatch themselves a whole new scheme for worldly redemption, assuming they were still around somewhere themselves. Lady arrived, accompanied by Bijar. She melted the moment she saw that Boo Boo was awake. I watched, numb, as she took my place on her knees in front of the Daughter of Night. This was my wife. This clump of raw sentimentality was the woman who used to be the lady, once able to inspire an entire empire with the terror of her name. I did not listen. I have to admit that I was embarrassed by her behavior, because I had not realized that there was so much sloppy emotion bottled up inside her. Around me, Lady always clung to shreds of her old image, whenever she was not lost in her own realm of self-pity. The whole scene seemed to amaze the Daughter of Night. She did not know what to make of it. Suravija became embarrassed, too. She hustled her brood out of the room. The boys went quickly, unable to stand so much sentiment. Suravija herself offered me a look of commiseration before she shut the door. I tried to tell Suravija I was thirsty. My throat was too dry. I went after her. I stumbled as I crossed the room. Not that that made any difference. Mental clumsiness was my real downfall. I stepped into the corridor and called after Suruvija. Please bring some more drinking water. We're all still dry. She nodded her understanding. She was embarrassed again, this time because she was alone with a man who was not her husband. I was about to say something to spare her when Arcana yelled at me. It took me a moment to get back through the doorway. Boo Boo had a rumel, a deceiver strangling scarf wrapped around her mother's throat. Her eyes were dark with the last ghost of Kina. Her strength was obviously supernatural. Arcana was having no luck breaking her hold, and that little blonde was no weakling. I needed not die to get sent to hell. I had an instant to pick which torture I wanted to suffer for the rest of my existence. I slapped Boo Boo with my bad hand. She did not let up. I punched her. She rocked. Blood gushed from her nose. She did not ease up on the yellow silk cloth. I drew the dagger that is with me all the time, that normally gets used only when I am eating. I reached out and pricked the skin right under her left eye. And still she did not stop. The white crow said, This is Kina's revenge, Croker. Which hell? Lady was almost gone. I stabbed the girl in the arm. She hardly even bled. I stabbed again, trying for the elbow joint. No good. I tried to cut the tendons in her wrists. All the while, Arcana was still trying to pull her off from behind or to break her grip on the silk cloth or to cut that cloth. I launched as violent a blow as I could manage. When that did nothing but rock the girl's head back again, I lost control. As the saying goes, I saw red. When Arcana finally stopped me, I had stabbed my own daughter more than twenty times. I had not killed her, though, yet, but she had given up her hold on the strangling cloth. Possibly too late. Lady was hacking and gasping, still choking. I got down and started trying to clear her windpipe. There seemed to be some damage to her larynx. Arcana remained calm. She summoned help. Where did Boo Boo get the strangling scarf? I asked. She didn't have it before we went south. She had been stripped naked, scrubbed down, and dressed in new clothing. Then she had been placed in this room. So someone had brought her the rumel, a secret deceiver. We need to find out exactly who visited her. I did not want it to be Suruvija, though she was instantly the logical suspect, except for the fact that she was a woman. 
Hitherto my wife and daughter had been the only women we knew to have been admitted to the secret brotherhood. Still, this was a time of great changes. Suravija's sorrow and slowness of wit could be an act. They do not call them deceivers for nothing. Chapter 139 Taglios The Great General the villain was not a deceiver, after all. He did not understand what a deceiver was, he being Surovija's son, Bijar, whom Bubu had pulled in with her love-me effect, working him only when no one else was around. She had sent him to a secret member of the Strangler Brotherhood. He had gotten the killing scarf there. That had happened while we were in the air, coming home from the glittering plain. The boy received only what punishment his mother thought was appropriate. The deceiver who supplied the rumel, though, soon went the way of his goddess. Along with a number of friends, there would be no mercy for stranglers until the last was dead. While others rooted out the truth, I stayed busy with Lady and Bubu. I soon realized that I did not have the skills to save either. I summoned the best physicians from the land of unknown shadows— to a man, they told me what I did not want to hear. Sorcery was the only hope for either woman, and Tobo was the only one with a command of the appropriate sorcery. Arkana and Shukrat could not help much. They knew little about the healing arts. I told Sovereign, Regardless of my personal motives, the boy is one of us. We can't leave him in a Taglian cell. Sovereign had a little too much of the politician in him, too much of the kind of mind willing to let an individual go so the rest will not be inconvenienced. He wanted to avoid a confrontation with Aridatha Singh. I continued, You do need to get into the annals, Captain. You need to understand completely what it means to be a brother of the Black Company. Maybe I do. Until I do, I'll run things the way I am now. I did not argue. I had not expected any other answer. I met Shukrat outside, shook my head. She tested her sleep spell on the men Sovereign sent after me to make sure I behaved. That spell worked perfectly. Shukrat and I went looking for the great general. Arkana kindly flew high cover. We were going to bust Tobo out. The flaw in that plan was we did not know where Tobo was being held. So we had to go ask Aridatha. Being more careful than Tobo had been when it came to invading the great general's quarters, Shukrat prepared the way with her sleep spell. It all started out so well I was hard-pressed not to look on the dark side and expect a trap. Singh was not easy to handle unconscious, at least not easy for a gimp old man and a mite of a teenage girl. Nevertheless, we got him aboard my post before he was missed, then took him way up high into the clouds and through into the moonlight. I had Shukrat wake him up. We need to talk, Aridatha, and you need to stay calm while we do, because it's almost a mile down to the ground. Singh was a cool one. He collected himself. What do you want? Tobo, where is he? I'm asking, counting on you to continue being concerned about Taglios, about what new fighting would do to the city. Singh did not say anything. I told him, You're doing a good job of riding the tiger, but that tiger is going to get a chance to run wild if I end up having to drop your ass from a mile up in the sky. He considered that, suspecting that I might not be bluffing. You could start a new war. You could. The man tried to assassinate me. He won't do that again, Shukrat told him. We're going to have a talk, Tobo and me. When we're done, he'll stop doing stupid things forever. She did not sound like she had any doubts. She did make it sound like Tobo had a surprise coming. I said, To lay your mind at rest, it won't trouble me a bit if we get into a new fight with you people. I don't have much left to live for. I can burn Taglios to the ground without compunction. Unlike some, I don't love the place. It's done nothing to win my heart. Arkana said, If he kills you, there won't be anyone to look out for the Radisha. The Radisha had become regent despite tradition because Aridatha Singh insisted, 
strongly, and nobody wanted to argue with the great general. Even out in the provinces, resistance to the new order seemed to be weakening, almost as if it was just too much trouble to fight over all of this when things were going so well otherwise. Akana did not give a rat's ass about the Radisha's welfare. She just wanted Aridatha to survive this incident. Just tell us where Tobo is, I said. Shukrat and I will bring him out. Slowly, slowly, I tilted my post forward. Timing its arrival well, a gap in the clouds appeared below, allowing the moonlight to get through and reflect off the surface of the river. We discovered that when he could actually see how high he was, Aridatha Singh had a fear of heights. It proved to be one of those fears which evades reason's control. We set him down on the north bank of the river. Arcana stayed with him. I wondered if she would find the nerve to betray her interest. Chapter 140 Taglios Brain Surgery Before Tobo could help me with my women, I, with the help of the best physicians and surgeons among the children of the dead, had to bring him back from his head wound. His Taglian captors had done nothing for him. He was two-thirds of the way down the path to a lonely grave. There were no other Nuengbao with the company any more. The handful who had reached Taglios with us had stolen away to their native swamps soon afterward. Tobo required delicate surgery to clear a dozen dangerous bone chips off the surface of his brain. I did most of the work myself, using my fellow surgeons as my other hand. The job took twelve hours. Shukrat was there every second. Sometimes I thought the ghost of the boy's mother was looking over my shoulder. I collapsed moments after we finished, my physical and emotional reserves utterly spent. Some kind soul saw to it that I got into a bed. Chapter 141 Taglios Family Matters It had to be afternoon. Storm season thunder rocked the old Grey's barracks. The roaring hiss of the deluge ate up almost all other sound. The air was cool to the point of feeling nippy. I told myself to enjoy the cool while I could. Once the rain stopped, the heat would return, and the air would be damp enough to steam vegetables. A whole different pounding roar developed as wild winds began to slam and kick the barracks. Hail had begun to fall, heavily. The streets would be filling with Taglian children determined to harvest the ice. Some surely would be injured by large hailstones. It happened frequently. Shukrat came in. She did not look cheerful. Suruvija followed her, bringing food and drink. I asked, How bad is it? Is it infection? Shukrat was puzzled for a moment. Oh, no. Tobo is all right. He was even awake for a minute a little while ago. So... The way she did not go on told me where the real problem lay. When I jumped up, nearly injuring myself in my haste, she barked, Take it easy! Getting in a dangerous hurry won't help! And when I failed to calm myself enough to suit her, You won't be fit enough to help anybody if you show up emotionally too ragged to cope. She was right. An old man like me, in my professions, got plenty of exposure to that truth. Not only fear, but most emotion, is the mind killer. We do stupid things when we let emotion take over. Then we are forced to endure the consequences for the rest of our days. I took deep breaths and drank cold water. I told myself I could handle even the worst news because I had been dealing with bad news all my life. Lead on, I told Shukrat. Soldiers live. Bad news is part of the life. Arcana and the White Crow were with Lady and Boo Boo when I arrived. Suravija had gotten there ahead of me. She slipped out right away with a murmur of gratitude for excusing her son from the worst consequences of his actions. It was not a good day for me physically, either. I was having to use my cane. Both of my women were lying on their backs, making no noise. I saw no immediate cue as to what the crisis might be. 
The crow paced back and forth on a shelf above Lady's cot. Arcana perched on a chair beside my daughter. I went to my wife first. Lady was breathing, barely, and having to work extremely hard at it, gasping and fighting for every breath. I groaned. I may have to cut her throat open below the obstruction. The operation might save her life, but her vanity would be sorely tested. The results are never pretty. I felt relieved as I turned to the girl, and guilty because I felt so much relief. Soldiers live. Boo Boo was gone, but it had only just happened. That ripped my guts out. Arcana told me, There was someone with her every minute, Pop. It was like she just didn't want to make it. She made me take the chair. Oh, I understand that part. She didn't have any reason to go on. We took everything that meant anything away from her. But knowing she wanted out, in here, and I tapped my temple, doesn't do anything to stop the bleeding in here, tapping my chest. I drew a deep breath, let it go in a long sigh. Tell Suruvija to come back in. Once the little Shadar woman returned, I told her, Buy as much ice as you can get. I want to pack my daughter in ice. I touched Boo Boo. She was still warmer than the surrounding air. Shukrat asked, What's up? What are you going to do? I'm going to take her down to the ice cave. We had to go back to get the children of the dead back across the plain and to keep our word to Shivetya. Maybe sooner was better than later. The white crow made a little sound, simply a device for getting my attention. I said, She's first in my heart. If that's what it takes to save her, then I'll put her down there with you too. Suruvija was gone. I hoped she got no grief trying to buy ice. If anyone tried to keep her from getting the money, I would be tempted to break some bones. I did not reflect on what my response as captain would have been toward an underling with my present attitude. The words immortal are, that was different. The first ice arrived not much later. Boo Boo had chosen the perfect time and season to die. We bundled her in a quarter ton of hailstones inside heavy blankets which we sewed shut. Lady's flying post, slaved to Arcana's, was just able to hoist the weight. The fly of indecision bit me. I wanted to get the girl into the safety of the cavern before nature had its way. But I did not want to be away from Tobo and my wife and run the risk of disaster here. Shukrat assured me, I'll damned well make sure Tobo is all right, and as soon as he's able, I'll have him help Lady. If you're not back, now go. Do what you have to do. Come on, Pop, Arcana told me. Once we put on some altitude, that ice isn't going to melt nearly so fast. Yeah. Shukrat, if anything happens, get more ice. Come on down. Maybe Shivetya can help. Before we left, I did have to visit Sovereign, to let him know what was going on and arrange it so he would know what to do if the fates ordained that this was the time when Croker would not be coming back. Even when you fly with the wind, it takes a long time to get from Taglios to the fortress with no name. It seems to take forever when worry is your most intimate traveling companion. The White Crow was not good for much of anything but an emergency source of provender. Arcana was a dutiful daughter, more helpful than she needed to be, but she was just too young. Most of her earnest conversation seemed so naive, or even foolish, that it became hard to recall a time when I was that age, still idealistic and hurling myself at life headlong, believing that truth and right must inevitably triumph. I kept my opinions to myself. After everything she had suffered already, Arcana did not deserve to have her surviving optimism skewered by my bitter cynicisms. Perhaps her youthful shallowness was useful as a shield. It might help her shake off those early traumas. I have known people like that, who live only in the present moment. Chapter 142 Glittering Stone Bitter Desserts 
Soon after we placed Boo Boo in the cave of the ancients, a scant few yards from her aunt, I was stricken by a series of horrible thoughts. What got me nervous in the first place was the way the imprisoned soul catcher's gaze seemed to follow me everywhere as we brought the girl in and settled her, while Arcana set the stasis spells on her, as relayed to her by the white crow. Paranoia struck deep. Soul catcher had control of the bird, and she knew all the ins and outs of the sorcery necessary to lock someone into the ice caverns or to release a prisoner she could let herself go. The bird was not right there when that thought hit me, else she would have known that I had realized the possibility. I covered up before it noticed. I stood in the weak, sourceless, pale cold light and stared for a long time without really seeing. My baby. Hard to believe. I never knew you, darling. A tear rolled down. I thought of all the cold, hard men I had known and wondered what they would think if they could see me now, having turned into a maudlin old man. They might be envious of the fact that I had hung around long enough to become an old man. The white crow came flapping in from wherever it had been, landed on my right shoulder. Wings slapped my face, stinging. God damn it! It had not taken the liberty before. I do not know how long I wallowed in self-pity before the bird stirred me, far longer than I realized at the time. The crow brought me back to this world of real trials and deep pain. Arcana, we'd better head back now. My separation from Lady would be more than a week long before we reached Taglios. It was going to be longer than that. Arcana did not respond. Arcana? Arcana was not there. The flying posts were not there. Emotion is the mind killer. In my worry about my women, I had forgotten that my adopted daughter was the one Voroshk with a brain, the one who had said she was going to bide her time and pick her moment. That moment had come and gone, it seemed. There was nobody down in that cavern but me and the scruffy white bird. She had not been completely cruel, she took the key to the shadow gates so the gimp old man had no way to get away, but she did not make him climb all the way up out of that hole, only part of the way. She left my flying post just far enough up to give herself a few hours' head start, just long enough that I had no chance to catch her. Shivetya Mana makes a tiresome diet, however good you feel for the first few hours after you eat. Self-pity and self-accusation make bitter desserts, and a crow haunted by your oldest and dearest enemy makes for a somewhat less than ideal partner in exile. After the anger faded and the despair subsided, I helped myself to Baladitya's writing materials and went to work on bringing the annals up to date. There was no time in that place, so I do not know how long that took, it seemed longer than it probably was. I began to worry because nobody came to see why we had failed to return. I feared that meant there was no one who could come, the most likely someones who might not be able to come being Tobo or Lady. But Shukrat was healthy. How come she did not show up? With no one else there, I found myself talking to the crow more and more and more as time went by in an effort to defeat the gathering despair. Shivetya watched from his huge wooden throne, evidently amused by my predicament, while I was amused by soul catchers. She did have the knowledge to get herself out of the ice cavern, she just did not have the hands, and I thought that was delicious. I was five or six sleeps into my exile when the Nef returned, first appearing inside my dreams. Chapter 143 Fortress with no name Sleeping with the demon Soulcatcher kept reminding me that she was in touch with the demon, that in fact as long as she remained attached to the white crow she would be little more than Shivetya's tool. This information did not seem newsworthy or particularly important until I suffered the visit from the Washene, the Washane, and the Washone. 
I had not been especially sensitive to them in the past. I knew them better from description than encounter. This time around made clear why that was. Their ugliness invaded my dreams, but only as a sense of presence, little more concrete than that of the unknown shadows. Golden glimmers of hideous beast-mask faces in the corner of dream's eye and scattered single-syllable fragments of attempted communication were all that I recalled after I awakened, sweating and shaking and filled with undirected terror. Shivetya's gaze, directed my way, seemed more amused than ever. I soon learned that his amusement had limits. I had made him a promise— he could look inside me and see that I intended to keep it, but he could also see that I meant to stall for as long as it took me to arrange my own life to my satisfaction. He had been patient for ten thousand years. Now suddenly his patience began to wilt. I became aware of it first while I was sleeping. On a night when the Neff were almost getting through, my dreams filled unexpectedly with a presence that pushed in like a whale driving through a pod of dolphins. A big, unseen thing that approached like the darkness itself, but without containing a thread of evil. Just a vast, slow thing that was. I knew what it was, and understood that it was trying to make a mind-to-mind -mind contact the way it had with others before me. But my mind had a hard shell around it. It was difficult for ideas to get through. Good thing Goblin and One-Eye were no longer around. They could have gotten hours of joy out of a straight line like that. A couple sleeps more, though, and my mind had become a sieve. Me and Shivetya were yucking it up like a couple of old tonk buddies. The White Crow was put out because she did not have a job translating any more. I guess the demon had the sheer mental brute force to make contact with anyone. I learned from the golem in the way that Baladitya had learned before me. I learned by being taken inside the demon's living dream, where past was almost indistinguishable from present, where the wondrous pageant of the plain's history and the history of the worlds it connected were all remembered in as much detail as Shivetya had cared to witness at the time. There was a great deal about the Black Company, he had chosen the company as the instrument of his escape a very long time ago, long before Kina chose Lady to become her instrument inside the enemy force and the vessel that would birth the Daughter of Night, who was the intended instrument of her own liberation. Long before any of us were the least aware of all the pitfalls we were going to encounter on our road to Katovar. But Shivetya chose better than did Kina, the goddess failed to look closely enough at Lady's character. Lady was too damned stubborn and selfish to be anyone's tool for long. There were just seven of us when some inexplicable urge made me decide to retrace the company's olden journeys. And of those seven, now there is just me. Soldiers live. The Black Company is in Sovereign's hands now, such as it is, it is headed south now, according to Shivetya's dreams, satisfactorily avenged, planning to cross the glittering plain back to the land of unknown shadows. There are only a handful of Taglians and Dejagarans and Sangalis left to miss our world. The company will become a new thing in a new world, and pudgy little Sovereign will be its creator. Never before had there been anyone of the Black Company who had survived so long— that he could see how vast are the changes time will sculpt, even upon a band determined to stay one with its past. When my thoughts ranged those bleak marches, Shivetya always filled my head with ripples of amusement, because those were almost invisible changes when compared with those that he had witnessed in his time. He had seen empires, civilizations, entire races come and go, he remembered the gods themselves, the ugly builders of the plain, and all the powers that had come into and changed his estate, and then had faded away again. He even recalled a time when he was not alone in the fortress with no name, a time when his devotion to duty caused his mates to nail him to his throne, so they could desert without him interfering. 
At long last I began to understand what had happened to Mergen in those long-ago days when he had had so much trouble clinging to his place in time. Mergen was crazy, some, and Soulcatcher was involved, some. Those were the days when Soulcatcher had found her way onto the plane, and Mergen never had a clue himself what was happening, but behind everything else was Shivetya, carefully setting up his path into retirement. And of course, Shivetya does not see time like the rest of us. Unless we demand his attention right here at the vanguard, he floats everywhere, every when, re-experiencing rather than remembering. Gods, how I envied him. The entire histories of sixteen worlds were his to know, not just to study and interpret, but pretty much to live whenever the mood took him. I did have a question, the question of supreme importance if I was going to set the demon free. He had to answer it to my satisfaction if he wanted me to fulfill our agreement. What would happen to the glittering plane if he was no longer here to manage it? Chapter 144 Fortress with No Name Arcana's Tale Shivetya was never as powerful as Kina, but he was a whole hell of a lot faster on his mental feet. It had taken the sleeping goddess years to impact the world outside and create a vast paranoia concerning the Black Company. Shivetya it took just weeks. It would not have taken that long had he not reached out for a specific someone with a mind shell thicker than mine. Shukrat. The demon was disinclined to connect with Tobo, Tobo had been his good buddy before, but Tobo's behavior recently hinted at potentially troublesome character flaws. Shukrat finally began to get the idea that there might be a problem causing the prolonged absence of Arcana and her beloved adopted daddy. Even when she did start to worry, though, she did not want to leave Tobo. Tobo was less popular with the Children of the Dead than he was with the Unknown Shadows, the men from Sien might not give their utmost to pull him through. The boy's health kept suffering one setback after another complication. The fact that the army was moving would not help his recovery. Shivetya could show me the company's southward progress, and did regularly. But I would not look in on Lady. My wife's condition was more grim than Tobo's. There was nothing I could do about it, but it upset me so I just did not know where the pain was going to get me. Sometimes the blind eye is the least terrible way of suffering what we cannot make right. Then there was Arcana. The little blonde had run off in accordance with her own stated doctrine, home to the world of the Voroshk. She used the key we had brought to enter the plane to make her exit, because Shivetya was interested, the once shattered Vorosk shadow gate was almost completely whole again. In Arcana's homeworld, the war with the shadows continued, but sporadically. The shadows had been reduced to a tenth of their original number. The Vorosk had suffered as badly. Their world had been all but destroyed. Not one in a hundred peasants had survived an invasion so enthusiastic it is almost impossible to find a shadow on the plain these days. Shadows kill. They prefer people, but will prey on anything they run into, even things you find under rocks. People are smart enough to figure out ways to get through the night. Not much else can. The few survivors in the Varoshk world were starving, they had lost so many draft animals they could not plant. Their livestock had all been taken, if not by the shadows, then by the Varoshk themselves. The Varoshk had no intention of sharing the common suffering. Arcana had gone, had seen, had changed her uncertain mind. This was not what she wanted. But she had waited too long to turn back. She was seen. Family closed in fast and deprived her of her post and clothing. She became a prisoner of her relatives, who began formulating big breeding plans immediately. The Shadowgate disaster had left the Varoshk with few women of childbearing age. Arcana got elected to become queen-aunt for a whole new mob. 
She would do what she had to do to survive. She would bide her time once again. Her uncles had confiscated her key to the shadow gates, but were unaware what it was, and she was not talking. They were the sort of men who would abandon the disaster they had created and go coursing off in search of new worlds to conquer, so much easier than rebuilding. It was a good thing Shivetya had power enough to will the shattered gate to heal itself, though that might imply that the non-functional gates had failed because of benign neglect. In fact, recalling what Tobo and Suffren had reported concerning their explorations, all the shadow gates were crippled somehow. Shivetya did not like anyone very much these days. I let him know, I have a couple of things left to do. Since my mind was no longer a mystery, he knew what already, and he did have a little patience left. A pretty indulgent partner in crime, that old devil. Chapter 145 Glittering Stone Then Shukrat came. Shukrat arrived while I was sleeping, dropping in through the hole in the roof. So entangled with Shivetya was I now that I knew she was there without noticing or paying much mind. My friend the White Crow came and did the wake-up dirty deed. I sat up, rewarding the bird with some rude remark or other. Just trying to be helpful. You aren't leaving me much to do these days. Funny how being a prisoner reduces your options, isn't it? What goes around comes around and all that. But we can still be friends, can't we? Hi, cuter daughter. You finally got here. Shukrat was exhausted, but game. So what's going on, Pop? Where's Arcana? Well, Arcana got a wild hair, ran off home, and now is knee-deep in shit, I explained. Shukrat's reaction was, Yuck! Hey, you could be the most popular girl in town yourself if you give them the chance. They might try. They'll be sorry if they do. I didn't waste all my time with Tobo playing games. How come you know all that if she took your key and you can't go out poking around? Shivetya and I have been getting to know one another. There isn't much else to do around here when you're waiting for your slower child to start wondering if you haven't maybe gotten yourself into some trouble. I see you did some writing, too. I'm running short on time, daughter, I said revealing a secret never even shared with my wife. I've had so much luck for so long that the law of averages is overdue to catch up. Any day. There's only one risk left that I'm willing to take, so I want to have all my shit in order before something happens. I want to check out knowing I did everything the company could ask, and then some. My expectation that I do not have much time left has become an ever more powerful influence on my thinking since our return from the land of unknown shadows. It has approached the level of obsession since I have been back here in the fortress with no name. Shukrat proceeded with normal journey-ending business while we talked, unloading her flying post. She swung down a large hemp sack that rattled as she said, let me get some rest first, then we'll go rescue Scruffy Butt. Not because I give a damn what they do to her, you understand. Just as a favor to my pop. I understand. I appreciate it. Maybe she can do the same for you someday. Oh yeah, that would be good. What's in the sack? She thought about being evasive, realized that there was no point. Snail shells. Tobo didn't want me to travel unprotected. He worries about me. How is he? He has good days and he has bad days. More bad than good. In his health and in his mind. It scares me. Nobody can tell me if he's going to make it, or if he'll be sane if he does. I'm afraid it might all depend on his mother. What? Sara turned up. No, she's definitely dead, I think. But her ghost, and her mother's ghost, and her grandmother's ghost keep following him wherever he goes. Whenever his fever gets to him, he sees them, and they talk to him. They nag him, he says. He doesn't like it. But my opinion is, he damned well ought to start listening to them, because he gets these brain fevers every time he starts to do something that his mother wouldn't have liked while she was alive. 
even if it's only something like forgetting to clean his teeth. You really believe he's being haunted by his female ancestors? Doesn't matter if I do, Pop. He believes it. Even when he's fever-free and completely sane, he'll say his mother intends to stay around until he no longer needs her guidance. Then she'll be free to join Mergen. Tobo really resents the implication that he isn't mature and his behavior is keeping her from her rest. And Sara, apparently, is just as resentful of his immaturity, because she'd rather be somewhere besides here babysitting a grown man. Why do I get the feeling there's something more? Because you're right. There is more. He thinks those women might run out of patience. He's afraid they'll just drag him along with them. You mean kill him? No. His mother, Pop. Not kill him. Take him along. Out of his body. The way they say his father used to do. Only they wouldn't let him come back. If that happened, his body would die eventually. And before you tell me Sara wouldn't let her baby die... You need to remember this ghost isn't the Sara you knew. This Sara has been on the other side for a while, running with ghosts who have been there a lot longer than she has. And at least one of those was able to see Tobo's various potential futures, way back before Mergen and Sara ever got together. Sounded to me like Shukrat was just as much a believer as Tobo was. All right. Rest, little girl. I'll come up with a plan while you do. Look at me. Manly man. Older than dirt. Limping. One bad eye. Short one hand. Reads and writes. But a manly man for all that. Chapter 146 The Varoshk World Stronghold Ruknava the Varoshk Shadow Gate was being watched from the other side. Shukrat's uncles hoped she would find her way home, too, and they were eager to obtain another breeder. We did not work hard to avoid being discovered by the Watchers, but we did come by night, and Shukrat did leak some of her most unusual companions through to distract the sentries. Tobo did not stint when he gave her unknown shadows to help her out in her adventures down this way unlike when he gave me those two wannabe ravens that were never around and had not been seen now in months. He assigned her some of the biggest, the darkest, the smartest that would stand by her and do what she said. The black hounds darted around and over the two watchers, keeping them from flying just long enough for us to get through the shadow gate and add ourselves to the equation. Shukrat was able to put them both to sleep, despite the state of high excitement the unknown shadows had aroused. In moments, we understood why. They're just kids, I said while undressing one. This one can't be more than eleven or twelve. The one Shukrat stripped was even younger. These two are the youngest Tolagev brothers. Somebody really is desperate if he's sending kids this young out alone when there are still shadows roaming around. I thought that was just fine. The thinner the Varoshk were spread, the better. The two boys we left behind, up in trees for their own safety. We confiscated their posts and clothing. It was a long flight. We did not show ourselves during the day. Along the way, Shukrat showed me the ruins of Katovar. I did not feel inclined to explore. I did not have time. There were changes going on inside me. I had to hold them off until I got Arcana free. The White Crow mocked me and accused me of cheating on Lady. She refused to believe I was not. I no longer argued. She was still bitter because she had not been able to take me away from her sister. Arcana was being held in a minor Varoshk fortress called Ruknava. We flew in low to within a mile then awaited midnight while floating high up in the tops of trees that were old when Katovar fell. We put out a dozen shadow traps Shukrat had crafted according to Shivetya's instructions. Once she released the unknown shadows, though, the traps were not necessary. At my insistence, Shukrat made doubly sure that the unknown shadows clearly understood we were about to butt heads with people who had considerable experience dealing with creatures of darkness. 
Their advantage over the killer shadows was that they were not just driven clumps of hunger and hatred. They were cunning and wicked and able to reason, although unfortunately weak on the concept of cooperation. I asked Shukrat, You think we might have better luck in the daytime, after everybody inside there relaxes? They're not that alert. They haven't had an incident here for a long time. How do you know that? I just do, now that I'm close enough to feel them. Meaning probably that she was hiding the whispers of the unknown shadows already. Um, are you close enough for them to feel you? No, because I'm alone, and because I'm dressed, and because they aren't trying to feel for me. I see. If it was not our unseen associates, it must be something like the way I had begun to sense Shivetya. Bird, pay attention. It was not my intent to waste any resource. The white crow was a valuable resource. So where is my other baby, Shukrat? Be as exact as you can, because my feathered friend needs to know how to get there to tell her that we're coming and she should be ready to go. The crow squawked like it had just found a snake raiding its nest. It protested so vigorously that the surrounding night fell into an uneasy silence. Good for you, nobody in these parts would recognize Taglian. What's the big squawk? You infiltrated how many places at other times? The crow continued to mutter something to the effect of that was different, the difference mainly being whose idea the infiltration was. She understood that I was getting real thick with Shivetya, though, and the golem might have a great deal to say about whether or not she ever got out of the Cave of the Ancients. Once she got the frustration worked out, she was ready to go. I had Shukrat describe the interior of Ruknava the best she could, which was not that well. She had not been there in ten years. The crow would have to locate Arkana on her own. Shukrat could not pin her down. I said, You just tell her we're coming and she should be ready, and if she can manage it, she might put a sleep spell on anybody near enough to touch. The crow left. We waited. I stared at the sky. I found this one far stranger than that of the land of unknown shadows. There was no large moon here, apparently, at least none tonight, nor during the nights I spent here before. But there were scores of little ones, the biggest maybe a fifth of the size of my own. All the moons seemed terribly busy, scampering hither and yon. When I mentioned them to Shukrat, she began telling me about her world's unique breed of astrology, which relied upon the motions of all those moons. Even after ages of study, those moons still presented the occasional surprise. Once, when I was little, two of them banged off of each other. None of the others have moved quite the same way since, and it rained down pieces for years. Only about a hundred miles from here there's a place where a really big piece hit. I was at Junkledesag, which is over that way another eighty miles, and it was still awful. There were earthquakes and noise like the end of the world. There was a fire in the sky that took all night to fade away. It was like when one of the right Geisteden explodes, only a million times worse. It knocked a huge hole in the ground. Now the hole is kind of a lake. The white crow dropped out of the night. Ready. Easier than you expected, eh? The bird grunted sullenly. Show us the way, fearless feathered explorer. The next stage was anticlimactic. Only three or four actual Varoshk occupied Ruknava. In behavior so human, I do not know why I did not foresee it. A small faction of survivors were concealing Arcana's return from the rest for what little advantage controlling a viable breeder gave. We left our posts nuzzling the fortress beside an unglazed hall-end window. The interior was too tight for flight. The crow showed the way to Arcana's chamber. There were no bars anywhere, but there was a sleeping, non varoshk sentry slumped on a stool in the hallway. There had been a pretense that Arcana was a guest. The girl jumped on me the moment we entered. I knew you'd come. Did you? I hoped you would. All right. I'm sorry. I was stupid. I just wanted... 
I had to. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Why not save your talking until we're out of here? The point of sending the bird ahead was so you'd be ready. The critter named flapped out of the room's one small window. She grabbed odds and ends, not much. I don't know where my right Geistede and Chef Sepulka are. We brought something for you. Let's go. All went well until we were sliding out the window. Then a child, rubbing sleep from her eyes, wandered into the hallway, presumably disturbed by some sound. She stared for a moment, then folded, touched by a sleep spell from one of the girls. Nothing happened immediately, but in time the child would tell somebody unless she had a habit of sleepwalking. Comfortably aloft and heading south, I asked Arcana, Are you pregnant? She took no offense. No, they hadn't worked out who got to be first, though every time I turned around somebody was trying to sneak in, like they thought I couldn't possibly resist them. I passed out enough bruises that even Gromovol would have figured out that that kind of shit could get somebody hurt. But these guys were real optimists. She had been hanging out with the right people to learn how to sucker a guy who thought girls ought to be easy prey. I said, I guess we can thank some god for that small favor. You can thank Arcana for not putting up with their shit. That's my delicate flower. Soon after sunrise, Shukrat spotted seven or eight protean black dots bobbing in the air far behind us. They're chasing us, Pop. I checked. We climb up a little higher, we'll be able to stay far enough ahead. The girls agreed, but Arcana added, There weren't that many of the family at Ruknavar. They must have sent for help from Yunkla de Sag or Drazivrad. There aren't but fifteen or sixteen of the family left alive. I said, Just in case they do start pressing us, do either of you have an objection to more of them getting hurt? Arcana gave me an unhappy look. Despite our hours aloft, she was not yet fully clad in apparel taken from one of the boy sentries at the gate. Getting dressed is hard to do when you are riding one of those posts and staying out of sight by skimming the treetops. Not to mention that before she started changing, she had to convince the clothing that it now belonged to her, not the boy from the shadow gate. How do you expect to manage that, Pop? She sounded suspicious, and rightly so. Same way I got Kina, but you'll have to name me names. I had the first father's book with me. I had taught myself enough of the Varoshk language to use the codes to blow those guys out of the sky. If I knew who I was turning into a cloud of dust. Don't do that, not if you don't have to. I gave it a moment, then, if you can forgive them, then I can. They never really did anything to me. They would have, but I did not belabor the point. Both of these kids were too forgiving and too understanding for their own good. Those guys back there would have done a whole lot of ugly to both of them, given the chance. I know those kind of guys. I have been those kind of guys. Just for my own pleasure, privately, when the girls were not paying attention, I tripped the codes that would kill Arcana's post— we were too far from Ruknava for me to tell if it worked. I hoped not, now, because after I did it, I remembered the sleepy little girl in the hallway. She would haunt me for a while. It was closer than it really needed to be, us getting through the shadow gate ahead of trouble. The key gave me some grief, probably because I was in too much of a hurry. Now what? Shukrat asked once we were safe from the men and naked boys cursing us from the other side of the barrier. I said, I guess you two can go back to the army. I'm going to stay here, on the plane, with Shivetya. There's a job I've got to do, a promise I have to keep. Nobody spoke again until we were close to the fortress with no name. Then Shukrat asked, What about Lady? If she's in good enough health, you can bring her down here to me, and I'll do what I can to help her. If she's not, leave her the fuck alone. Her main problem is that she's got to heal herself. Both girls looked at me like I was some really stinky monster that had just popped up in the middle of a bunny farm, ripping the fur out of cute and tender throats. 
Look, I love my wife just one whole hell of a lot. There isn't any way I can explain it to you. But the fact is, love her is about all I can do. She's insane, by any standard but her own, and there's nothing I can do to change that. If you were familiar with the annals, you would know that. Arcana sneered. You don't ever give up, do you? She caught me off balance that time. Actually, no, I wasn't thinking about finding somebody to keep the annals. I was trying to clarify my relationship with my wife. But did I know what that was myself, even after all these years? Possibly more important, did she have any idea? All that seemed to matter less and less as we drew closer to the fortress with no name. Chapter 147 Fortress with No Name Putting the Pen Down I stood before the golem Shivetya, basking in his mild impatience. I was impatient myself, but the distractions of the world still had their hold on me. That part of Guni philosophy is solidly founded. Before you can achieve more than the lowest possible order of spiritual focus, you have to learn to put all worldly distractions aside. All of them. Right now. Never mind what. Otherwise, there will always be that one more critical thing that just absolutely has to be handled before you can move forward. My one more thing was Lady, my wife, who continued to wobble on the brink of the abyss without ever quite slipping over. To me, it was evident that the missing medicine now was any will to battle on, and the white crow agreed with me. Let me work on her, the bird told me. Ten minutes and I'll have her so pissed off she'll melt mountains trying to get close enough to spank me. No doubt, but I like things the way they are, except for how long it's taking. Sovereign seemed to be taking forever making any headway coming south, though he was covering ground much faster than we had headed north. Nobody was trying to slow him down. I wiled my time exploring the expansive wonders of Shivetya's memories, but avoiding those including Katovar. Katovar was a dessert I meant to save until there were no distractions at all. Katovar was a special treat for a time when every flavor could be savored. Eventually, I yielded to the inevitable and sent the girls to bring Lady to me. Maybe my big pal on the wooden throne could give me a hint or two how to goose her into getting going again. The Neff appeared almost as soon as the girls popped out of the hole in the roof. They were in a black humor, eager for a fight, and because I could not communicate with them, my mood soon turned just as dark. I hunted up One-Eye's spear. If it could handle a goddess, it ought to be able to polish off three obnoxious, nagging spooks. Shivetya stopped me. He could communicate with the Neff. He indicated that he would calm them down with an explanation of what we were doing here. His liberation would not sentence them to extinction. In fact, they were about to enter a new phase of existence. They were going to get work maintaining the glittering plane. There were scores of odd jobs and cleanups that needed special attention. Shivetya and I were now so connected I could see the plane in my mind almost at will, and the rest of the world through his eyes with only a little more effort. For a while I watched the girls race northward, each occasionally finding a moment to have fun flying. I slept for a few hours, or a week. When I awakened I picked up a lamp and walked over to the throne. I carried one eye's spear under my other arm on the bad hand side. Shivetya and I stared at each other for a while. Is it time? I asked. And, you think we're ready to manage without the daggers now, yeah? Just one more little thing, then. I need to leave a note for my girls. That turned into a letter. Trust the analyst to go on and on. A very clear thought. Have you finished now? Are you certain you are done? It's time. My bridesmaids, the Neff, drifted in out of the darkness. They seemed more substantial than ever before. 
They like me just fine now. I'm putting the pen down. Chapter 148 Glittering Stone and the Daughters of Time We saw lights from way out. What was that? There are no lights on the glittering plain. We climbed a thousand feet. By then the lights were gone, except for what came out of the hole in the dome over the top of the demon's throne room. Before we got there, that went away too. Then we were too busy getting Lady and Tobo through the hole to worry about anything else. Right geisted in our trouble when their riders are not helping. When we got to the floor, we found only one oil lamp burning on that old man's, that scholar from Taglios's, work table. Croker left a note. And that clever old fart, he wrote it in our language. Not very good, but good enough to understand. I guess he did have the gift for tongues, like he always said. Arcana took the lamp and used it to fire up a couple of lanterns. We went off to look for Croker. She said, You know, he was always teasing us, but after a while, I did start feeling almost like he was my dad. We never ever talk about our real fathers. We would never get along. Yeah, he looked out for you. Maybe more than you know. You too. We found Croker sitting beside the wooden throne. Hey, he's still breathing. I don't think. Shit, look. Those knives are all gone from the demon. Actually, they were laying all over the floor. So just then the demon's eyes open, and so do Croker's, and both of them look pretty confused, and it is only then that I really understand what Croker was trying to tell us in his letter. It was not some confused religious goodbye. He just did not have enough of the right words to tell us that he and the demon had it worked out to trade places. So Shivetya got to become mortal for as long as Croker's body would last, and Croker got to be a big old wise sea dragon swimming all around in the ocean of history. So both of them got to go to heaven, and the Neff were happy, and the plane went on, and the white crow kept bitching, riding around on the croaker body's shoulder, and Arcana and I got in a running fight about who was going to go on keeping the annals, because both of us hate to write. So we take turns. When the little tramp will get away from Tobo long enough to pick up a pen and do her part. A point she missed, probably because she is too dim to notice, is that Lady is recovering. A while ago, I saw her spinning tiny fireballs. I think if there was some way she could make love to that big monster over there, she would do it three times a day. Because it is from him that the power flows. It is probably the best and most meaningful gift he has ever given her, and with it she can become anything she wants to be. Maybe even the young and beautiful and romantically sorrowful and remote Lady of Charm again. But then he would have to turn Soul Catcher loose just to give balance to the world. I wonder if he was right when he said, a thousand years from now we might be the gods everyone remembers. And I wonder what he might do about his daughter, his flesh daughter. I think there is no hope for her because she has no hope of her own. And I also think that if there is a hope, Pop will find it. Sovereign is looking impatient. He wants to hitch a ride down to the Sien Shadow Gate. He is not Aridatha Singh, but he may have to do. I guess it is time to go see our new world, the abode of ravens, the land of unknown shadows. Shukrat says the names have a ring, that it sounds like home to her. I think home is what I carry around inside me. I am a snail with the meat on the outside. And it is Shukrat's damn turn to write, the sneaking, slacking little bimbo. Incessant wind sweeps the plain. It murmurs on across grey stone, carrying dust from far climes to nibble eternally at the memorial pillars. There are a few shadows out there, but they are the weak and the timid and the hopelessly lost. It is immortality of a sort. Memory is immortality of a sort. In the night, 
when the wind dies and silence rules the place of glittering stone, I remember, and they all live again. Soldiers live and wonder why. This has been an Audible Frontiers production. Executive producer, Steve Feldberg. Producer, Mike Charsik. Production coordinator, Kat Lambrix. Music by Michael Whalen. Copyright 2000 by Glenn Cook. Audio recording copyright 2010 by Audible Inc. If you enjoyed this audiobook, the rest of Glenn Cook's Black Company series is available today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.